Section Zero of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Geneva Conventions of 12 August 1949. Preliminary Remarks. Provisions Common to the Four Conventions the international committee of the red cross has from the outset been the sponsor of the geneva convention for the protection of wounded military personnel and of the humanitarian conventions which supplement it each of these fundamental international agreements is inspired by respect for human personality and dignity together they establish the principle of disinterested aid to all victims of war without discrimination to all those who whether through wounds capture or shipwreck are no longer enemies but merely suffering and defenseless human beings throughout the years the international committee has labored unremittingly for the greater protection in international law of the individual against the hardships of war it successively elaborated the humanitarian conventions and adapted them to current needs or instituted new ones in the period between the two world wars the committee's main achievement lay in the establishment of a number of draft conventions chief among which was the convention on the treatment of prisoners of war this was signed in the summer of nineteen twenty nine and during the last conflict protected millions of captives other new or revised draft conventions were to have been submitted to a diplomatic conference which the swiss federal council planned to convene early in nineteen forty hostilities unfortunately intervened the year nineteen forty five marked the close of a war waged on an unprecedented scale the task had to be faced of developing and adapting the humanitarian elements of international law in the light of the experience gained the international committee's proposals met with the early approval of governments and national red cross societies and it immediately set to work three former conventions had to be revised the geneva convention of nineteen twenty nine for the relief of the wounded and sick in armies in the field the tenth hague convention of nineteen hundred seven for the adaptation to maritime warfare of the principles of the geneva convention and the nineteen twenty nine convention on the treatment of prisoners of war furthermore there was urgent need for a convention for the protection of civilians the absence of which had during the world conflict led to such grievous consequences the international committee worked on the lines it had followed after the nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen war first it collected the fullest possible preliminary information on those aspects of international law that required confirmation enlargement or amendment then with the help of experts from various countries it prepared the revised and new drafts which were submitted first to an international red cross conference and then to a diplomatic conference empowered to give these treaties final validity the first meeting of experts was held in october nineteen forty five and comprised the neutral members of the mixed medical commissions which during the conflict had visited wounded or sick prisoners of war to decide about their repatriation the second meeting was the preliminary conference of national red cross societies for the study of the conventions and of various problems relative to the red cross which the international committee convened at geneva in july and august nineteen forty six and before which the first drafts were laid having gathered the suggestions of red cross agencies on points which were within their particular fields the committee made a close study during the months that followed and collected very full data on all matters dealt with in the proposed conventions consultations included one in march nineteen forty seven with representatives of the religious and secular bodies 
which had collaborated with the committee in giving spiritual and intellectual aid to victims of the war from april fourteen to twenty six nineteen forty seven the conference of government experts for the study of conventions for the protection of war victims was held in geneva this was attended by seventy representatives of fifteen governments which had held large numbers of prisoners and civilian internees during the war and were therefore particularly experienced in the matters under discussion combining the committee's proposals the suggestions made by the red cross societies and drafts prepared by several governments the conference agreed to the new texts proposed and to the first draft of a convention for the protection of civilian persons in time of war the international committee also sought the advice of several governments which were not represented at the april conference some sent experts to geneva in june nineteen forty seven the drafts and preparation were also submitted by the committee to a special commission of national red cross societies which met at geneva in september of the same year after careful editing early in the year the draft conventions were sent by the committee in may nineteen thirty eight to all governments and national red cross societies in preparation for the seventeenth international red cross conference this conference set in stockholm from august twentieth to thirty first nineteen forty eight the representatives of fifty governments and fifty two national red cross societies were present with some amendments the drafts were adopted after passing through the many preparatory stages briefly described these texts were eventually taken as the sole working documents of the diplomatic conference of geneva out of these grew the nineteen forty nine geneva conventions the diplomatic conference for the establishment of international conventions for the protection of victims of war convened by the swiss federal council as trustee of the geneva conventions was held in geneva from april twenty first to august twelfth nineteen forty nine of the sixty-three governments represented at the conference fifty-nine had sent plenipotentiaries four sent observers only representatives of the international committee were invited to participate in the capacity of experts after four months of continuous debate the conference established the following four conventions which are given below one geneva convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field of august twelfth nineteen forty nine two geneva convention for the amelioration of the condition of wounded sick and shipwrecked members of armed forces at sea of august twelfth nineteen forty nine three geneva convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war of august twelfth nineteen forty nine four geneva convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war of august twelfth nineteen forty nine the conference at once divided into four committees the first for the revision of conventions one and two the second for the revision of convention three prisoners of war the third to establish the new convention relative to the protection of civilian persons and lastly the joint committee to deal with provisions common to the four conventions coordination and drafting committee met towards the end of the conference to harmonize the four texts when necessary the committees formed working parties at the closing meeting delegations of the following states signed the final act afghanistan albania argentina australia austria belgium brazil bulgaria burma canada chile china colombia costa rica cuba czechoslovakia Denmark, Ecuador, Egypt, Ethiopia, Finland, France, Greece, Guatemala, the Holy See, Hungary, India, Iran, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Yugoslavia, Lebanon, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Mexico, Monaco, Netherlands, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Norway, Pakistan, Peru, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Siam, Soviet Socialist Republic, of Bielorussia, 
Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine, Spain, Sweden, Syria, Turkey, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, United Kingdom, United States of America, Uruguay, Switzerland. Seventeen delegations also signed the four conventions. Forty-four other states had signed when the agreed six months period expired on February 12, 1950. According to their provisions, the new Geneva Conventions come into force six months after the deposit of at least two instruments of ratification. Thereafter, they come into force for each contracting party six months after it ratifies. Provisions common to the four conventions. The Geneva Diplomatic Conference made an innovation in grouping together and amplifying the common provisions, up to then dispersed and rudimentary. Now practically identical in the four conventions, they may be considered under three headings. General provisions. The general provisions are given in a dozen articles of great importance at the beginning of each convention, laying down the mode of application. They deal with respect for the conventions and their application in international conflict, enemy occupation or civil war. They are followed by provisions about the duration of application, special agreements which contracting parties may conclude, the inalienability of the right of protected persons, the duties of protecting powers or their substitutes, the activities of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and conciliation procedure between the contracting parties. Repression of Breaches of the Conventions Articles 49 to 52 of the First Convention, 50 to 53 of the Second, 129 to 131 of the Third, and 146 to 149 of the Fourth. The Stockholm Conference has expressed the view that the provisions it had approved were still inadequate, and had requested the International Committee to continue its study of this important question. After consulting lawyers of international repute, the Committee prepared suggestions which appeared in the volume Remarks and Proposals, submitted for consideration. The Conference used these suggestions as a basis for its deliberations. The first of the articles imposes penal sanctions for breaches of the convention in particular for grave breaches as defined in the succeeding article these texts will doubtless be an important contribution towards defining war crimes in international law the term is frequently used and seen in print but still awaits an acceptable legal definition final provisions the final provisions appear at the end of each convention and define the procedure for the signature ratification and entry into force of the conventions and for accession to them end of section zero section one of geneva conventions august nineteen forty nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Betty B. First Geneva Convention, Wounded and Sick The traditional Geneva Convention, brought into being by the newly created International Committee of the Red Cross in 1864, is the source of the Geneva Conventions, which are now universally accepted. The original convention gave the impetus to the Red Cross movement throughout the world. It likewise inspired the impulsion in international law, towards an increasing regulation and eventually the restriction and final prohibition of war itself this first international treaty the fundamental principles of which have remained unshaken was nevertheless marked by omissions and imperfections and as early as four years after signature a conference was convened to discuss its revision on october twentieth eighteen sixty eight the conference proposed a number of additional articles providing in particular for the extension of the convention to maritime warfare but they were never ratified a recommendation by the first hague conference in eighteen ninety nine raised the question of revision again the nineteen hundred six diplomatic conference established a revised text 
which recast and considerably developed the eighteen sixty four text after the first world war it was clear that the geneva conventions needed adapting to the conditions of modern warfare during the nineteen twenty nine diplomatic conference at geneva the text was once more revised although to a lesser extent than on the first occasion in nineteen thirty seven after renewed discussion by a commission of international experts called by the international committee another revised text was established the draft after submission to the sixteenth international red cross conference london nineteen thirty eight was placed on the agenda of the diplomatic conference planned for nineteen forty but postponed by the second world war we have shown how the nineteen thirty seven draft was shaped by the experience of the six momentous war years the help of the national red cross societies closely involved historically in the application and development of the convention was particularly valuable the text of the first convention as revised by the nineteen forty nine conference follows traditional lines and the fundamental principles that governed former versions wounded or sick and therefore defenseless combatants shall be respected and cared for whatever their nationality personnel attending them the buildings in which they shelter and the equipment used for their benefit shall be protected a red cross on a white ground shall be the emblem of this immunity as will be seen later the greatest divergence arises from the very conditions of modern warfare which made it necessary to restrict the privileges of medical personnel and equipment in enemy hands on the other hand almost all articles have been made more precise the general provisions are followed by chapter two dealing with the wounded and sick article thirteen drawn from the nineteen twenty nine prisoners of war convention enumerates the categories of persons put on the same footing as members of the armed forces and hence entitled to protection under the convention whereas the nineteen forty nine text demanded respect and protection only for the wounded article twelve which is new gives a list of prohibited acts attempts upon life torture willful abandonment and so on the information is to be given about wounded captives and the duties to the dead have been defined article sixteen and seventeen a new provision article eighteen guarantees to the inhabitants and to relief societies the right of assisting the wounded and sick chapter three medical units and establishments has not undergone alteration except for the introduction of article twenty three creation of safety zones and localities chapter four medical personnel and chaplains has been greatly modified hitherto such personnel falling into enemy hands had to be immediately repatriated the nineteen forty nine convention provides that they may in certain circumstances be retained to care for prisoners of war their special status and the conditions for the repatriation of those not required article thirty to thirty two have been carefully defined article twenty eight thus filling a serious gap chapter five medical equipment has been substantially altered to take changes regarding personnel into account equipment need no longer be handed back to the belligerent to whom it belongs in chapter six similar provision is made for transport vehicles article thirty five it should be noted that medical aircraft are now authorized in certain circumstances to fly over neutral countries article thirty seven chapter seven distinctive emblem marks no change in principle nevertheless article forty four the wording of which left so much to be desired in the nineteen twenty nine text is now stated in logical and balanced terms while the protective emblem is subject to strict safeguards the purely indicatory emblem may be widely used by red cross societies chapter eight application of the convention calls for no comments reference has already been made to chapter nine repression of abuses and infractions and to the final provisions article fifty three which is peculiar to the first convention is intended to prevent abuse of the distinctive emblem 
End of section one. Section two of Geneva Conventions, August nineteen forty nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Convention Header, Chapter 1, 2, General Provisions, Wounded and Sick. Geneva Convention, for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field, of 12 August 1949. The undersigned plenipotentiaries of the governments represented at the diplomatic conference held at Geneva from April 21 to August 12, 1949, for the purpose of revising the Geneva Convention for the Relief of the Wounded and Sick in Armies in the Field of July 27, 1929, have agreed as follows. Chapter 1. General Provisions. Article 1. Respect for the Convention. The high contracting parties undertake to respect and to ensure respect for the present convention in all circumstances. Article 2. Application of the Convention. In addition to the provisions which shall be implemented in peacetime, the present convention shall apply to all cases of declared war or of any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties, even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. The Convention shall also apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party, even if the said occupation meets with no armed resistance. Although one of the powers in conflict may not be a party to the present Convention, the powers who are parties thereto shall remain bound by it in their mutual relations. They shall furthermore be bound by the convention in relation to the said power, if the latter accepts and applies the provisions thereof. Article 3. Conflicts not of an international character. In the case of armed conflict not of an international character, occurring in the territory of one of the high contracting parties, each party to the conflict shall be bound to apply, as a minimum, the following provisions. 1. Persons taking no active part in the hostilities, including members of armed forces who have laid down their arms, and those placed hors de combat by sickness, wounds, detention, or any other cause, shall in all circumstances be treated humanely, without any adverse distinction founded on race, color, religion or faith, sex, birth or wealth, or any other similar criteria. To this end, the following acts are and shall remain prohibited at any time and in any place whatsoever with respect to the above-mentioned persons. a. Violence to life and person, in particular murder of all kinds, mutilation, cruel treatment, and torture. b. Taking of hostages. c. Outrages upon personal dignity, in particular humiliating and degrading treatment d the passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court affording all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples two the wounded and sick shall be collected and cared for an impartial humanitarian body such as the international committee of the red cross may offer its services to the parties of the conflict the parties to the conflict should further endeavor to bring into force, by means of special agreements, all or part of the other provisions of the present convention. The application of the preceding provisions shall not affect the legal status of the parties to the conflict. Article 4. Application by Neutral Powers. Neutral powers shall apply by analogy the provisions of the present convention to the wounded and sick, and to members of the medical personnel, and to chaplains of the armed forces of the parties to the conflict, received or interned in their territory, as well as to dead persons found. Article 5. Duration of Application. For the protected persons who have fallen into the hands of the enemy, the present convention shall apply until their final repatriation. Article 6. Special Agreements. 
in addition to the agreements expressly provided for in articles 10, 15, 23, 28, 31, 36, 37, and 52, the high contracting parties may conclude other special agreements for all matters concerning which they may deem it suitable to make separate provision. No special agreement shall adversely affect the situation of the wounded and sick, of members of the medical personnel, or of chaplains, as defined by the present convention, nor restrict the rights which it confers upon them. Wounded and sick, as well as medical personnel and chaplains, shall continue to have the benefit of such agreements as long as the convention is applicable to them, except where express provisions to the contrary are contained in the aforesaid or in subsequent agreements, or where more favorable measures have been taken with regard to them by one or other of the parties of the conflict. Article 7. Non-Renunciation of Rights. Wounded and sick, as well as members of the medical personnel and chaplains, may in no circumstances renounce in part or in entirety the rights secured to them by the present convention, and by the special agreements referred to in the foregoing article, if such there be. Article 8. Protecting Powers. The present convention shall be applied with the cooperation and under the scrutiny of the protecting powers, whose duty it is to safeguard the interests of the parties to the conflict. For this purpose, the protecting powers may appoint, apart from their diplomatic or consular staff, delegates from amongst their own nationals or the nationals of other neutral powers. The said delegates shall be subject to the approval of the power with which they are to carry out their duties. The parties to the conflict shall facilitate, to the greatest extent possible, the task of the representatives or delegates of the protecting powers. The representatives or delegates of the protecting powers shall not in any case exceed their mission under the present convention. They shall, in particular, take account of the imperative necessities of security of the state wherein they carry out their duties. Their activities shall only be restricted, as an exceptional and temporary measure, when this is rendered necessary by imperative military necessities. Article 9. Activities of the International Committee of the Red Cross. The provisions of the present convention constitute no obstacle to the humanitarian activities which the International Committee of the Red Cross, or any other impartial humanitarian organization, may, subject to the consent of the parties to the conflict concerned, undertake for the protection of wounded and sick, medical personnel and chaplains, and for their relief. Article 10. Substitutes for Protecting Powers. The high contracting parties may at any time agree to entrust to an organization which offers all guarantees of impartiality and efficacy the duties incumbent on the protecting powers by virtue of the present convention. When wounded and sick, or medical personnel and chaplains, do not benefit or cease to benefit, no matter for what reason, by the activities of a protecting power or of an organization provided for in the first paragraph above, the detaining power shall request a neutral state, or such an organization, to undertake the functions performed under the present convention by a protecting power designated by the parties to a conflict. If protection cannot be arranged accordingly, the detaining power shall request or shall accept, subject to the provisions of this article, the offer of the services of a humanitarian organization, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, to assume the humanitarian functions performed by protecting powers under the present convention. Any neutral power, or any organization invited by the power concerned, or offering itself for these purposes, shall be required to act with a sense of responsibility towards the party to the conflict on which persons protected by the present convention depend, and shall be required to furnish sufficient assurances that it is in a position to undertake the appropriate functions and to discharge them impartially. No derogation from the preceding provisions shall be made by special agreements between powers, one of which is restricted, even temporarily, in its freedom to negotiate with the other power or its allies, by reason of military events, 
more particularly where the whole or a substantial part of the territory of the said power is occupied. Whenever in the present convention mention is made of a protecting power, such mention also applies to substitute organizations in the sense of the present article. Article 11. Conciliation Procedure. In cases where they deem it advisable in the interest of protected persons, particularly in cases of disagreement between the parties to the conflict as to the application or interpretation of the provisions of the present convention, the protecting powers shall lend their good offices with a view to settling the disagreement. For this purpose, each of the protecting powers may, either at the invitation of one party or on its own initiative, propose to the parties to the conflict a meeting of their representatives, in particular of the authorities responsible for the wounded and sick, members of medical personnel and chaplains, possibly a neutral territory suitably chosen. The parties to the conflict shall be bound to give effect to the proposals made to them for this purpose. The protecting powers may, if necessary, propose for approval by the parties to the conflict a person belonging to a neutral power or delegated by the International Committee of the Red Cross who shall be invited to take part in such a meeting. Chapter 2. Wounded and Sick. Article 12. Protection and Care. Members of the armed forces and other persons mentioned in the following article, who are wounded or sick, shall be respected and protected in all circumstances. They shall be treated humanely, and cared for by the party to the conflict in whose power they may be, without any adverse distinction founded on sex, race, nationality, religion, political opinions, or any similar criteria. Any attempts upon their lives, or violence to their persons, shall be strictly prohibited. In particular, they shall not be murdered or exterminated, subjected to torture or to biological experiments. They shall not willfully be left without medical assistance and care, nor shall conditions exposing them to contagion or infection be created. Only urgent medical reasons will authorize priority in the order of treatment to be administered. Women shall be treated with all consideration due their sex. The party to the conflict which is compelled to abandon wounded or sick to the enemy shall, as far as military considerations permit, leave with them a part of its medical personnel and material to assist in their care. Article 13. Protected Persons. The present convention shall apply to the wounded and sick belonging to the following categories. 1. Members of the armed forces of a party to the conflict, as well as members of militia or volunteer corps, forming part of such armed forces. 2. Members of other militias and members of other volunteer corps, including those of organized resistance movements, belonging to a party to the conflict and operating in or outside their own territory, even if this territory is occupied, provided that such militias or volunteer corps, including such organized resistance movements, fulfill the following conditions. a. That of being commanded by a person responsible for his subordinates. b. That of having a fixed distinctive sign recognizable at a distance. c. That of carrying arms openly. d. That of conducting their operations in accordance with the laws and customs of war. 3. Members of regular armed forces who profess allegiance to a government or an authority not recognized by the detaining power. 4. Persons who accompany the armed forces without actually being members thereof, such as civilian members of military aircraft crews, war correspondents, supply contractors, members of labor units or of services responsible for the welfare of the armed forces, provided that they have received authorization from the armed forces which they accompany. 5. Members of crews including masters, pilots, and apprentices of the merchant marine, and the crews of civil aircraft of the parties to the conflict, who do not benefit by more favorable treatment under any other provisions in international law. 6. 
inhabitants of a non-occupied territory who on the approach of the enemy spontaneously take up arms to resist the invading forces without having had time to form themselves into regular armed units provided they carry arms openly and respect the laws and customs of war article fourteen status subject to the provisions of article twelve the wounded and sick of a belligerent who fall into enemy hands shall be prisoners of war and the provisions of international law concerning prisoners of war shall apply to them article fifteen search for casualties evacuation at all times and particularly after an engagement parties to the conflict shall without delay take all possible measures to search for and collect the wounded and sick to protect them against pillage and ill-treatment to ensure their adequate care and to search for the dead and prevent their being despoiled whenever circumstances permit an armistice or a suspension of fire shall be arranged or local arrangements made to permit the removal exchange and transport of the wounded left on the battlefield likewise local arrangements may be concluded between parties to the conflict for the removal or exchange of wounded and sick from a besieged or encircled area and for the passage of medical and religious personnel and equipment on their way to that area article sixteen recording and forwarding of information parties to the conflict shall record as soon as possible in respect of each wounded sick or dead person of the adverse party falling into their hands any particulars which may assist in his identification these records should if possible include a designation of the power on which he depends b army regimental personal or serial number c surname d first name or names e date of birth f any other particulars shown on his identity card or disc g date and place of capture or death h particulars concerning wounds or illness or cause of death as soon as possible the above-mentioned information shall be forwarded to the information bureau described in article one twenty two of the geneva convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war of august twelfth nineteen forty nine which shall transmit this information to the power on which these persons depend through the intermediary of the protecting power and of the central prisoners of war agency parties to the conflict shall prepare and forward to each other through the same bureau certificates of death or duly authenticated lists of the dead they shall likewise collect and forward through the same bureau one half of a double identity disc last wills or other documents of importance to the next of kin money and in general all articles of an intrinsic or sentimental value which are found on the dead these articles together with unidentified articles shall be sent in sealed packets accompanied by statements giving all particulars necessary for the identification of the deceased owners as well as by a complete list of the contents of the parcel article seventeen prescriptions regarding the dead graves registration service parties to the conflict shall ensure that burial or cremation of the dead carried out individually as far as circumstances permit is preceded by a careful examination if possible by a medical examination of the bodies with a view to confirming death establishing identity and enabling a report to be made one half of the double identity disc or the identity disc itself if it is a single disc should remain on the body bodies shall not be cremated except for imperative reasons of hygiene or of motives based on the religion of the deceased in case of cremation the circumstances and reasons for cremation shall be stated in detail in the death certificate or on the authenticated list of the dead they shall further ensure that the dead are honorably interred if possible according to the rites of the religion to which they belonged that their graves are respected grouped if possible according to the nationality of the deceased 
properly maintained and marked so that they may always be found. For this purpose, they shall organize at the commencement of hostilities an official graves registration service, to allow subsequent exhumations and to ensure the identification of bodies, whatever the site of the graves, and the possible transportation to the home country. These provisions shall likewise apply to the ashes, which shall be kept by the graves registration service until proper disposal thereof in accordance with the wishes of the home country. As soon as circumstances permit, and at latest at the end of the hostilities, these services shall exchange, through the Information Bureau mentioned in the second paragraph of Article 16, lists showing the exact location and markings of the graves, together with particulars of the dead interred therein. Article 18. Role of the Population. The military authorities may appeal to the charity of the inhabitants voluntarily to collect and care for, under their direction, the wounded and sick, granting persons who have responded to this appeal the necessary protection and facilities. Should the adverse party take or retake control of the area, it shall likewise grant these persons the same protection and the same facilities. The military authorities shall permit the inhabitants and relief societies, even in invaded or occupied areas, spontaneously to collect and care for wounded or sick of whatever nationality. The civilian population shall respect these wounded and sick, and in particular abstain from offering them violence. No one may ever be molested or convicted for having nursed the wounded or sick. The provisions of the present article do not relieve the occupying power of its obligation to give both physical and moral care to the wounded and sick. End of section 2 Section 3 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Medical Units and Establishments, Personnel, Buildings and Material, Medical Transports, The Distinctive Emblem, The Execution of the Convention. Chapter 3. Medical Units and Establishments. Article 19. Protection. Fixed establishments and mobile medical units of the medical service may in no circumstances be attacked, but shall at all times be respected and protected by the parties to the conflict. Should they fall into the hands of the adverse party, their personnel shall be free to pursue their duties as long as the capturing power has not itself ensured the necessary care of the wounded and sick found in such establishments and units. The responsible authorities shall ensure that the said medical establishments and units are, as far as possible, situated in such a manner that attacks against military objectives cannot imperil their safety. Article 20. Protection of Hospital Ships. Hospital ships, entitled to the protection of the Geneva Convention for the Amelioration of the Condition of Wounded, Sick, and Shipwrecked Members of Armed Forces at Sea, of August 12, 1949, shall not be attacked from the land. Article 21. Discontinuance of Protection of Medical Establishments and Units. The protection to which fixed establishments and mobile medical units of the medical service are entitled shall not cease until they are used to commit, outside their humanitarian duties, acts harmful to the enemy. Protection may, however, cease only after a due warning has been given, naming, in all appropriate cases, a reasonable time limit, and after such warning has remained unheeded. Article 22. Conditions Not Depriving Medical Units and Establishments of Protection. The following conditions shall not be considered as depriving a medical unit or establishment of the protection guaranteed by Article 19. 1. That the personnel of the unit or establishment are armed, 
and that they use the arms in their own defense, or in that of the wounded and sick in their charge. 2. That in the absence of armed orderlies, the unit or establishment is protected by a picket, or by sentries, or by an escort. 3. That small arms and ammunition taken from the wounded and sick, and not yet handed to the proper service, are found in the unit or establishment. 4. That personnel and material of the veterinary service are found in the unit or establishment without forming an integral part thereof. 5. That the humanitarian activities of medical units and establishments, or of their personnel, extend to the care of civilian wounded or sick. Article 23. Hospital Zones and Localities. In time of peace, the high contracting parties, and, after the outbreak of hostilities, the parties to the conflict, may establish in their own territory, and, if the need arises, in occupied areas, hospital zones and localities so organized as to protect the wounded and sick from the effects of war, as well as the personnel entrusted with the organization and administration of these zones and localities, and with the care of the persons therein assembled. Upon the outbreak and during the course of hostilities, the parties concerned may conclude agreements on mutual recognition of the hospital zones and localities they have created. They may for this purpose implement the provisions of the draft agreement annexed to the present convention, with such amendments as they may consider necessary. The protecting powers and the International Committee of the Red Cross are invited to lend their good offices in order to facilitate the institution and recognition of these hospital zones and localities. Chapter 4. Personnel. Article 24. Protection of Permanent Personnel. Medical personnel exclusively engaged in the search for, or the collection, transport, or treatment of the wounded or sick, or in the prevention of disease, staff exclusively engaged in the administration of medical units and establishments, as well as chaplains attached to the armed forces, shall be respected and protected in all circumstances. Article 25. Protection of Auxiliary Personnel. Members of the armed forces specially trained for employment, should the need arise, as hospital orderlies, nurses, or auxiliary stretcher bearers, in the search for or the collection, transport, or treatment of the wounded and sick, shall likewise be respected and protected if they are carrying out these duties at the time when they come into contact with the enemy or fall into his hands. Article 26. Personnel of Aid Societies. The staff of National Red Cross Societies, and that of other voluntary aid societies, duly recognized and authorized by their governments, who may be employed on the same duties as the personnel named in Article 24, are placed on the same footing as the personnel named in the said article, provided that the staff of such societies are subject to military laws and regulations. Each high contracting party shall notify to the other, either in time of peace, or at the commencement of, or during hostilities, but in any case before actually employing them, the names of the societies which it has authorized, under its responsibility, to render assistance to the regular medical service of its armed forces. Article 27. Societies of Neutral Countries. A recognized society of a neutral country can only lend the assistance of its medical personnel and units to a party to the conflict with the previous consent of its own government and the authorization of the party to the conflict concerned. That personnel and those units shall be placed under the control of that party to the conflict. The neutral government shall notify this consent to the adversary of the state which accepts such assistance. The party to the conflict who accepts such assistance is bound to notify the adverse party thereof before making any use of it. In no circumstances shall this assistance be considered as interference in the conflict. The members of the personnel named in the first paragraph shall be duly furnished with the identity cards provided for in Article 40, 
before leaving the neutral country to which they belong. Article 28. Retained Personnel. Personnel designated in Articles 24 and 26, who fall into the hands of the adverse party, shall be retained only in so far as the state of health, the spiritual needs, and the number of prisoners of war require. Personnel thus retained shall not be deemed prisoners of war. Nevertheless, they shall at least benefit by all the provisions of the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war of August 12, 1949. Within the framework of the military laws and regulations of the detaining power, and under the authority of its competent service, they shall continue to carry out, in accordance with their professional ethics, their medical and spiritual duties on behalf of prisoners of war, preferably those of the armed forces to which they themselves belong. They shall further enjoy the following facilities for carrying out their medical or spiritual duties. a. They shall be authorized to visit periodically the prisoners of war in labor units or hospitals outside the camp. The detaining power shall put at their disposal the means of transport required b in each camp the senior medical officer of the highest rank shall be responsible to the military authorities of the camp for the professional activity of the retained medical personnel for this purpose from the outbreak of hostilities the parties to the conflict shall agree regarding the corresponding seniority of the ranks of their medical personnel including those of the societies designated in article twenty six in all questions arising out of their duties, this medical officer and the chaplains shall have direct access to the military and medical authorities of the camp, who shall grant them the facilities they may require for correspondence relating to these questions. c. Although retained personnel in a camp shall be subject to its internal discipline, they shall not, however, be required to perform any work outside their medical or religious duties. During hostilities, the parties to the conflict shall make arrangements for relieving where possible retained personnel, and shall settle the procedure of such relief. None of the preceding provisions shall relieve the detaining power of the obligations imposed upon it with regard to the medical and spiritual welfare of the prisoners of war. Article 29. Status of Auxiliary Personnel. Members of the personnel designated in Article 25, who have fallen into the hands of the enemy, shall be prisoners of war, but shall be employed on their medical duties in so far as the need arises. Article 30. Return of Medical and Religious Personnel. Personnel whose retention is not indispensable by virtue of the provisions of Article 28 shall be returned to the party to the conflict to whom they belong, as soon as a road is open for their return and military requirements permit. Pending their return, they shall not be deemed prisoners of war. Nevertheless, they shall at least benefit by all the provisions of the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war of August 12, 1949. They shall continue to fulfill their duties under the orders of the adverse party, and shall preferably be engaged in the care of the wounded and sick of the party to the conflict to which they themselves belong. On their departure, they shall take with them the effects, personal belongings, valuables, and instruments belonging to them. Article 31. Selection of Personnel for Return The selection of personnel for return under Article 30 shall be made irrespective of any consideration of race, religion, or political opinion, but preferably according to the chronological order of their capture and their state of health. As from the outbreak of hostilities, parties to the conflict may determine by special agreement the percentage of personnel to be retained in proportion to the number of prisoners and the distribution of the said personnel in the camps. Article 32. Return of Personnel Belonging to Neutral Countries Persons designated in Article 27, who have fallen into the hands of the adverse party, may not be detained. Unless otherwise agreed, 
they shall have permission to return to their country, or, if this is not possible, to the territory of the party to the conflict in whose service they were, as soon as a route for their return is open and military considerations permit. Pending their release, they shall continue their work under the direction of the adverse party. They shall preferably be engaged in the care of the wounded and sick of the party to the conflict in whose service they were. On their departure, they shall take with them their effects, personal articles, and valuables, and the instruments, arms, and if possible, the means of transport belonging to them. The parties to the conflict shall secure to this personnel, while in their power, the same food, lodging, allowances, and pay as are granted to the corresponding personnel of their armed forces. The food shall in any case be sufficient as regards quantity, quality, and variety to keep the said personnel in a normal state of health. Chapter 5. Buildings and Material Article 33. Buildings and Stores The material of mobile medical units of the armed forces, which fall into the hands of the enemy, shall be reserved for the care of wounded and sick. The buildings, material, and stores of fixed medical establishments of the armed forces shall remain subject to the laws of war, but may not be diverted from that purpose as long as they are required for the care of wounded and sick. Nevertheless, the commanders of forces in the field may make use of them, in case of urgent military necessity, provided that they make previous arrangements for the welfare of the wounded and sick who are nursed in them. The material and stores defined in the present article shall not be intentionally destroyed. Article 34. Property of Aid Societies. The real and personal property of aid societies, which are admitted to the privileges of the Convention, shall be regarded as private property. The right of requisition recognized for belligerents by the laws and customs of war shall not be exercised except in case of urgent necessity, and only after the welfare of the wounded and sick have been ensured. Chapter 6. Medical Transports. Article 35. Protection. Transports of wounded and sick or of medical equipment shall be respected and protected in the same way as mobile medical units. Should such transports or vehicles fall into the hands of the adverse party, they shall be subject to the laws of war on condition that the party to the conflict who captures them shall in all cases ensure the care of the wounded and sick they contain. The civilian personnel, and all means of transport obtained by requisition, shall be subject to the general rules of international law. Article 36. Medical Aircraft. Medical aircraft, that is to say, aircraft exclusively employed for the removal of wounded and sick, and for the transport of medical personnel and equipment, shall not be attacked, but shall be respected by the belligerents while flying at heights, times, and on routes specifically agreed upon between the belligerents concerned. They shall bear, clearly marked, the distinctive emblem prescribed in Article 38, together with their national colors, on their lower, upper, and lateral surfaces. They shall be provided with any other markings or means of identification that may be agreed upon between the belligerents upon the outbreak or during the course of hostilities. Unless agreed otherwise, flights over enemy or enemy-occupied territory are prohibited. Medical aircraft shall obey every summons to land. In the event of a landing thus imposed, the aircraft with its occupants may continue its flight after examination, if any. In the event of an involuntary landing in enemy or enemy-occupied territory, the wounded and sick, as well as the crew of the aircraft, shall be prisoners of war. The medical personnel shall be treated according to Article 24 and the articles following. Article 37. Flight over neutral countries. Landing of wounded. Subject to the provisions of the second paragraph, Medical aircraft of parties to the conflict may fly over the territory of neutral powers, land on it in case of necessity, or use it as a port of call. 
they shall give the neutral powers previous notice of their passage over the said territory and obey all summons to alight on land or water they will be immune from attack only when flying on routes at heights and at times specifically agreed upon between the parties to the conflict and the neutral power concerned the neutral powers may however place conditions or restrictions on the passage or landing of medical aircraft on their territory such possible conditions or restrictions shall be applied equally to all parties to the conflict unless agreed otherwise between the neutral power and the parties to the conflict the wounded and sick who are disembarked with the consent of the local authorities on neutral territory by medical aircraft shall be detained by the neutral power where so required by international law in such a manner that they cannot again take part in operations of war the cost of their accommodation and internment shall be borne by the power on which they depend chapter seven the distinctive emblem article thirty eight emblem of the convention as a complement to switzerland the heraldic emblem of the red cross on a white ground formed by reversing the federal colors is retained as the emblem and distinctive sign of the medical service of armed forces nevertheless in the case of countries which already use as emblem in place of the red cross the red crescent or the red lion and sun on a white ground those emblems are also recognized by the terms of the present convention footnote the government of iran the only country using the red lion and sun emblem on a white ground advised switzerland depositary state of the geneva conventions on four september nineteen eighty of the adoption of the red crescent in lieu and place of its former emblem this was duly communicated by the depositary on twenty october nineteen eighty to the states party to the geneva conventions and footnote article thirty nine use of the emblem under the direction of the competent military authority the emblem shall be displayed on the flags armlets and on all equipment employed in the medical service article forty identification of medical and religious personnel the personnel designated in article twenty four and in articles twenty six and twenty seven shall wear affixed to the left arm a water resistant armlet bearing the distinctive emblem issued and stamped by the military authority such personnel in addition to wearing the identity disc mentioned in article sixteen shall also carry a special identity card bearing the distinctive emblem this card shall be water resistant and of such size that it can be carried in the pocket it shall be worded in the national language shall mention at least the surname and first names the date of birth the rank and the service number of the bearer and shall state in what capacity he is entitled to the protection of the present convention the card shall bear the photograph of the owner and also either his signature or his fingerprints or both it shall be embossed with the stamp of the military authority the identity card shall be uniform throughout the same armed forces and as far as possible of a similar type in the armed forces of the high contracting parties the parties to the conflict may be guided by the model which is annexed by way of example to the present convention they shall inform each other at the outbreak of hostilities of the model they are using identity cards should be made out if possible at least in duplicate one copy being kept by the home country in no circumstances may the said personnel be deprived of their insignia or identity cards nor of the right to wear the armlet in case of loss they shall be entitled to receive duplicates of the cards and to have the insignia replaced article forty one identification of auxiliary personnel the personnel designated in article twenty five shall wear but only while carrying out medical duties a white armlet bearing in its centre the distinctive sign in miniature the armlet shall be issued and stamped by the military authority 
military identity documents to be carried by this type of personnel, shall specify what special training they have received, the temporary character of the duties they are engaged upon, and their authority for wearing the armlet. Article 42. Marking of Medical Units and Establishments. The distinctive flag of the convention shall be hoisted only over such medical units and establishments as are entitled to be respected under the convention, and only with the consent of the military authorities. In mobile units, as in fixed establishments, it may be accompanied by the national flag of the party to the conflict to which the unit or establishment belongs. Nevertheless, medical units which have fallen into the hands of the enemy shall not fly any flag other than that of the convention. Parties to the conflict shall take the necessary steps, in so far as military considerations permit, to make the distinctive emblems indicating medical units and establishments clearly visible to the enemy land, air, or naval forces in order to obviate the possibility of any hostile action. Article 43. Marking of Units of Neutral Countries. The medical units belonging to neutral countries, which may have been authorized to lend their services to a belligerent under the conditions laid down in Article 27, shall fly, along with the flag of the convention, the national flag of that belligerent, wherever the latter makes use of the faculty conferred on him by Article 42. Subject to orders to the contrary by the responsible military authorities, they may, on all occasions, fly their national flag, even if they fall into the hands of the adverse party. Article 44. Restrictions in the Use of the Emblem exceptions. With the exception of the cases mentioned in the following paragraphs of the present article, the emblem of the Red Cross on a white ground, and the words Red Cross or Geneva Cross, may not be employed either in time of peace or in time of war, except to indicate or to protect the medical units and establishments, the personnel and material protected by the present convention, and other conventions dealing with similar matters. The same shall apply to the emblems mentioned in Article 38, second paragraph, in respect of the countries which use them. The National Red Cross Societies, and other societies designated in Article 26, shall have the right to use the distinctive emblem conferring the protection of the convention only within the framework of the present paragraph. Furthermore, National Red Cross, Red Crescent, Red Lion and Sun, societies, may, in time of peace, in accordance with their national legislation, make use of the name and emblem of the Red Cross for their other activities, which are in conformity with the principles laid down by the International Red Cross Conferences. When those activities are carried out in time of war, the conditions for the use of the emblem shall be such that it cannot be considered as conferring the protection of the convention. The emblem shall be comparatively small in size, and may not be placed on armlets or on the roofs of buildings. The International Red Cross organizations, and their duly authorized personnel, shall be permitted to make use, at all times, of the emblem of the Red Cross on a white ground. As an exceptional measure, in conformity with national legislation and with the express permission of one of the National Red Cross, Red Crescent, Red Lion and Sun societies, the emblem of the convention may be employed in time of peace to identify vehicles used as ambulances and to mark the position of aid stations exclusively assigned to the purpose of giving free treatment to the wounded or sick. Chapter 8. Execution of the Convention. Article 45. Detailed Execution. Unforeseen Cases. Each party to the conflict, acting through its commanders-in-chief, shall ensure the detailed execution of the preceding articles, and provide for unforeseen cases in conformity with the general principles of the present convention. Article 46. Prohibition of Reprisals. Reprisals against the wounded, sick, personnel, buildings, or equipment protected by the convention are prohibited. Article 47. 
Dissemination of the Convention. The high contracting parties undertake, in time of peace as in time of war, to disseminate the text of the present convention as widely as possible in their respective countries, and in particular to include the study thereof in their programs of military, and if possible, civil instruction, so that the principles thereof may become known to the entire population, in particular to the armed fighting forces, the medical personnel, and the chaplains. Article 48. Translations. Rules of Application. The high contracting parties shall communicate to one another through the Swiss Federal Council, and, during hostilities, through the protecting powers, the official translations of the present convention, as well as the laws and regulations which they may adopt to ensure the application thereof. End of section 3「Section 4 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9. Repression of Abuses and Infractions. Final Provisions. Denunciation. Annex 1. Article 49. Penal Sanctions, Item 1. General Observations. The high contracting parties undertake to enact any legislation necessary to provide effective penal sanctions for persons committing or ordering to be committed any of the grave breaches of the present convention defined in the following article. Each high contracting party shall be under the obligation to search for persons alleged to have committed or to have ordered to be committed such grave breaches, and shall bring such persons, regardless of their nationality, before its own courts. It may also, if it prefers, and in accordance with the provisions of its own legislation, hand such persons over for trial to another high contracting party concerned, provided such high contracting party has made out a prima facie case. Each high contracting party shall take measures necessary for the suppression of all acts contrary to the provisions of the present convention other than the grave breaches defined in the following article. In all circumstances, the accused persons shall benefit by safeguards of proper trial and defense, which shall not be less favorable than those provided by Article 105 and those following of the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war of August 12, 1949. Article 50. Item 2. Grave Breaches. Grave breaches, to which the preceding article relates, shall be those involving any of the following acts, if committed against persons or property protected by the Convention. Willful killing, torture or inhumane treatment, including biological experiments, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, and extensive destruction and appropriation of property, not justified by military necessity, and carried out unlawfully and wantonly. Article 51. Item 3. Responsibilities of the Contracting Parties. No high contracting party shall be allowed to absolve itself or any other high contracting party, of any liability incurred by itself or by another high contracting party in respect of breaches referred to in the preceding article. Article 52. Inquiry Procedure. At the request of a party to the conflict, an inquiry shall be instituted in a manner to be decided between the interested parties concerning any alleged violations of the Convention. If agreement has not been reached concerning the procedure for the inquiry, the parties should agree on the choice of an umpire who will decide upon the procedure to be followed. Once the violation has been established, the parties to the conflict shall put an end to it and shall repress it with the least possible delay. 
Article 53. Misuse of the Emblem. The use by individuals, societies, firms, or companies, either public or private, other than those entitled thereto under the present convention, of the emblem or the designation Red Cross or Geneva Cross, or any sign or designation constituting an imitation thereof, whatever the object of such use, and irrespective of the date of its adoption, shall be prohibited at all times. By reason of the tribute paid to Switzerland by the adoption of the reversed federal colors, and of the confusion which may arise between the arms of Switzerland and the distinctive emblem of the convention, the use by private individuals, societies, or firms of the arms of the Swiss Confederation, or the marks constituting an imitation thereof, whether as trademarks or commercial marks, or as parts of such marks, or for a purpose contrary to commercial honesty, or in circumstances capable of wounding Swiss national sentiment, shall be prohibited at all times. Nevertheless, such high contracting parties as were not party to the Geneva Convention of July 27, 1929, may grant to prior users of the emblems, designations, signs, or marks designated in the first paragraph, a time limit not to exceed three years from the coming into force of the present convention to discontinue such use, provided that the said use shall not be such as would appear in time of war to confer the protection of the convention. The prohibition laid down in the first paragraph of the present article shall also apply, without effect, on any rights acquired through prior use to the emblems and marks mentioned in the second paragraph of Article 38. Article 54. Prevention of Misuse. The high contracting parties shall, if their legislation is not already adequate, take measures necessary for the prevention and repression at all times of the abuses referred to under Article 53. Final Provisions. Article 55 languages. The present convention is established in English and in French. Both texts are equally authentic. The Swiss Federal Council shall arrange for official translations of the convention to be made in the Russian and Spanish languages. Article 56. Signature. The present convention, which bears the date of this day, is open to signature until February 12, 1950, in the name of the powers represented at the conference, which opened at Geneva on April 21, 1949. Furthermore, by powers not represented at the conference, but which are parties to the Geneva Conventions of 1864, 1906, or 1929, for the relief of the wounded and sick and armies in the field. Article 57. Ratification. The present convention shall be ratified as soon as possible, and the ratifications shall be deposited at Bern. A record shall be drawn up of the deposit of each instrument of ratification, and certified copies of this record shall be transmitted by the Swiss Federal Council to all the powers in whose name the convention has been signed, or whose accession has been notified. Article 58. Coming into Force. The present convention shall come into force six months after not less than two instruments of ratification have been deposited. Thereafter, it shall come into force for each high contracting party six months after the deposit of the instrument of ratification. Article 59. Relation to Previous Conventions. The present convention replaces the conventions of August 22, 1864, July 6, 1906, and July 27, 1929, in relations between the high contracting parties. Article 60. Accession. From the date of its coming into force, it shall be open to any power in whose name the present convention has not been signed to accede to this convention.
Article 61. Notification of Accessions. Accessions shall be notified in writing to the Swiss Federal Council and shall take effect six months after the date on which they are received. The Swiss Federal Council shall communicate the accessions to all the powers in whose name the convention has been signed, or whose accession has been notified. Article 62. Immediate Effect. The situations provided for in Articles 2 and 3 shall give immediate effect to ratifications deposited and accessions notified by the parties to the conflict before or after the beginning of hostilities or occupation. The Swiss Federal Council shall communicate by the quickest method any ratifications or accessions received from parties to the conflict. Article 63. Denunciation. Each of the high contracting parties shall be at liberty to denounce the present convention. The denunciation shall be notified in writing to the Swiss Federal Council, which shall transmit it to the governments of all the high contracting parties. The denunciation shall take effect one year after the notification thereof has been made to the Swiss Federal Council. However, a denunciation of which notification has been made at a time when the denouncing power is involved in a conflict shall not take effect until peace has been concluded and until after operations connected with the release and repatriation of the persons protected by the present convention have been terminated. The denunciation shall have effect only in respect of the denouncing power it shall in no way impair the obligations which the parties to the conflict shall remain bound to fulfill by virtue of the principles of the law of nations as they result from the usages established among civilized peoples, from the laws of humanity and the dictates of the public conscience. Article 64. Registration with the United Nations. The Swiss Federal Council shall register the present convention with the Secretariat of the United Nations. The Swiss Federal Council shall also inform the Secretariat of the United Nations of all ratifications, accessions, and denunciations received by it with respect to the present convention. In witness whereof, the undersigned, having deposited their respective full powers, have signed the present convention. Done at Geneva this twelfth day of August, 1949, in the English and French languages. The original shall be deposited in the archives of the Swiss Confederation. The Swiss Federal Council shall transmit certified copies thereof to each of the signatory and acceding states. Annex 1. Draft Agreement Relating to Hospital Zones and Localities. Article 1. Hospital zones shall be strictly reserved for the persons named in Article 23 of the Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in the armed forces in the field of August 12, 1949, and for the personnel entrusted with the organization and administration of these zones and localities, and with the care of the persons therein assembled. Nevertheless, persons whose permanent residence is within such zones shall have the right to stay there. Article 2. No persons residing in whatever capacity in a hospital zone shall perform any work, either within or without the zone, directly connected with military operations or the production of war material. Article 3. The power establishing a hospital zone shall take all necessary measures to prohibit access to all persons who have no right of residence or entry therein. Article 4. Hospital zones shall fulfill the following conditions. a. They shall comprise only a small part of the territory governed by the power which has established them. b. They shall be thinly populated in relation to the possibilities of accommodation. c. They shall be far removed and free from all military objectives or large industrial or administrative establishments. D. 
they shall not be situated in areas which, according to every probability, may become important for the conduct of the war. Article 5. Hospital zones shall be subject to the following obligations. A. The lines of communication and means of transport which they possess shall not be used for the transport of military personnel or material, even in transit. B. They shall in no case be defended by military means. Article 6. Hospital zones shall be marked by means of red crosses, red crescents, red lions, and suns, on a white background placed on the outer precincts and on the buildings. They may be similarly marked at night by means of appropriate illumination. Article 7. The powers shall communicate to all the high contracting parties in peacetime or on the outbreak of hostilities a list of the hospital zones in the territories governed by them. They shall also give notice of any new zones set up during hostilities. As soon as the adverse party has received the above-mentioned notification, the zone shall be regularly constituted. If, however, the adverse party considers that the conditions of the present agreement have not been fulfilled, it may refuse to recognize the zone by giving immediate notice thereof to the party responsible for the said zone, or may make its recognition of such zone dependent upon the institution of the control provided for in Article 8. Article 8. Any power having recognized one or several hospital zones instituted by the adverse party shall be entitled to demand control by one or more special commissions for the purpose of ascertaining if the zones fulfill the conditions and obligations stipulated in the present agreement. For this purpose, the members of the special commissions shall at all times have free access to the various zones and may even reside there permanently. They shall be given all facilities for their duties of inspection. Article 9. Should the special commissions note any facts which they consider contrary to the stipulations of the present agreement, they shall at once draw the attention of the power governing the said zone to these facts and shall fix a time limit of five days within which the matter should be rectified. They shall duly notify the power who has recognized the zone. If, when the time limit has expired, the power governing the zone has not complied with the warning, the adverse party may declare that it is no longer bound by the present agreement in respect of the said zone. Article 10. Any power setting up one or more hospital zones and localities, and the adverse parties to whom their existence has been notified, shall nominate or have nominated by neutral powers the persons who shall be members of the special commissions mentioned in Articles 8 and 9. Article 11. In no circumstances may hospital zones be the object of attack. They shall be protected and respected at all times by the parties to the conflict. Article 12. In the case of occupation of a territory, the hospital zones therein shall continue to be respected and utilized as such. Their purpose may, however, be modified by the occupying power on condition that all measures are taken to ensure the safety of the persons accommodated. Article 13. The present agreement shall also apply to localities which the powers may utilize for the same purposes as hospital zones. End of section 4. Section 5 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. Introductory Notes Geneva Convention 2 Reference has already been made to Chapter 9, Repression of Abuses and Infractions, 
and to the final provisions. Article 53, which is peculiar to the first convention, is intended to prevent abuse of the distinctive emblem. Second Geneva Convention, Maritime. The 1868 Diplomatic Conference at Geneva formulated the first provisions for the adaptation to maritime warfare of the principles of the Geneva Convention. This draft was not ratified, but later became the Hague Convention of 1899 and afterwards the Tenth Hague Convention of 1907, which was ratified by 47 states and still remains in force. Nevertheless, evolution in the methods of warfare and the fact that the first Geneva Convention was revised in 1929 made a recasting of the Tenth Hague Convention essential. After preliminary study, the International Committee, with the help of a conference of naval experts, drafted in 1937 a revised convention, which was placed on the agenda of the diplomatic conference scheduled for 1940. This draft, extended after 1945 in the light of war experience, was used as a basis by the diplomatic conference in 1949. The Maritime Convention, as it is called, is an extension of the first convention, wounded and sick, the terms of which it applies to maritime warfare. It is therefore natural that it should be included among the Geneva Conventions, out of which it originally developed. As the general plan of this second Geneva Convention covers the same field and protects the same categories of persons as the first, no comment is necessary on its basic principles. It contains, however, no less than 63 articles, whereas the 1907 version had only 28. This is because the 1949 text, similar to the 1937 draft, adapts the provision of the Land Convention and closely follows them. It has thus become a complete and independent convention, whereas the 1907 Hague text was chiefly concerned to adapt humanitarian provisions to naval warfare. Following the general provisions common to the four conventions, Chapter 2 protects the shipwrecked in addition to the wounded and sick. Members of the Merchant Navy are protected under the terms of Article 13 insofar as they are not entitled to more favorable treatment under other provisions in international law. The qualification, new in treaty law, is in conformity with ordinary practice. Chapter 3, obviously applicable only to maritime warfare, deals with hospital ships and other relief craft. Chapter 4, at sea, medical personnel, on account of prevailing conditions, are given wider protection than on land. In particular, the medical personnel and crew, vital to the hospital ships as such, may not be captured or retained. The personnel of other ships, while they may in some cases be retained, must be put ashore as soon as possible and will then come under the first convention. Chapter 5, Medical Transports, has its parallel in the first convention, but the Maritime Convention makes no special provision for the equipment which is, in a sense, part and parcel of the vessel itself. There were no fighting aircraft in 1907, hence the addition, in Chapter 6, Distinctive Emblem, of provisions for the more efficient marking of hospital ships as a safeguard against air attack. Chapters 7, Execution of the Convention, and 8, Repression of Abuses and Infractions, as well as the final provisions, call for no special comment. End of section 5. Section 6 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. Convention Header, Chapters 1, 
and two. General provisions, wounded, sick, and shipwrecked. Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the condition of wounded, sick, and shipwrecked members of armed forces at sea of 12 August 1949. The undersigned plenipotentiaries of the governments represented at the diplomatic conference held at Geneva from April 21st to August 12th, 1949, for the purpose of revising the 10th Hague Convention of October 18th, 1907, for the adaptation to maritime warfare of the principles of the Geneva Convention of 1906, have agreed as follows. Chapter 1. General Provisions. Article 1. Respect for the Convention. The high contracting parties undertake to respect and to ensure respect for the present convention in all circumstances. Article 2. Application of the Convention. In addition to the provisions which shall be implemented in peacetime, the present Convention shall apply to all cases of declared war or of any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties, even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. The Convention shall also apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party, even if the said occupation meets with no armed resistance. Although one of the powers in conflict may not be a party to the present convention, the powers who are parties thereto shall remain bound by it in their mutual relations. They shall furthermore be bound by the convention in relation to the said power, if the latter accepts and applies the provisions thereof. Article 3. Conflicts Not of an International Character In the case of armed conflict not of an international character, occurring in the territory of one of the high contracting parties, each party to the conflict shall be bound to apply, as a minimum, the following provisions. Item 1. Persons taking no active part in the hostilities, including members of armed forces who have laid down their arms, and those placed hors de combat, by sickness, wounds, detention, or any other cause, shall in all circumstances be treated humanely, without any adverse distinction founded on race, color, religion or faith, sex, birth or wealth, or any other similar criteria. To this end, the following acts are and shall remain prohibited at any time and in any place whatsoever with respect to the above-mentioned persons. a. Violence to life and person, in particular murder of all kinds, mutilation, cruel treatment, and torture. b. Taking of hostages. c. Outrages upon personal dignity, in particular, humiliating and degrading treatment. d. The passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court, affording all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples. Item 2. The wounded, sick, and shipwrecked shall be collected and cared for. An impartial humanitarian body, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, may offer its services to the parties to the conflict. The parties to the conflict should further endeavor to bring into force, by means of special agreements, all or part of the other provisions of the present convention. The application of the preceding provisions shall not affect the legal status of the parties to the conflict. Article 4. Field of Application In case of hostilities between land and naval forces of parties to the conflict, the provisions of the present convention shall apply only to forces on board ship. Forces put ashore shall immediately become subject to the provisions of the Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field of August 12, 1949. Article 5. Application by Neutral Powers. 
neutral powers shall apply by analogy the provisions of the present convention to the wounded sick and shipwrecked and to members of the medical personnel and to chaplains of the armed forces of the parties to the conflict received or interned in their territory as well as to dead persons found article six special agreements in addition to the agreements expressly provided for in articles ten eighteen thirty one thirty eight thirty nine forty forty three and fifty three the high contracting parties may conclude other special agreements for all matters concerning which they may deem it suitable to make separate provision no special agreement shall adversely affect the situation of wounded sick and shipwrecked persons of members of the medical personnel or of chaplains as defined by the present convention nor restrict the rights which it confers upon them wounded sick and shipwrecked persons as well as medical personnel and chaplains shall continue to have the benefit of such agreements as long as the convention is applicable to them except where express provisions to the contrary are contained in the aforesaid or in subsequent agreements or where more favorable measures have been taken with regard to them by one or other of the parties to the conflict article seven non-renunciation of rights wounded sick and shipwrecked persons as well as members of the medical personnel and chaplains may in no circumstances renounce in part or in entirety the rights secured to them by the present convention and by the special agreements referred to in the foregoing article if such there be article eight protecting powers the present convention shall be applied with the cooperation and under the scrutiny of the protecting powers whose duty it is to safeguard the interests of the parties to the conflict for this purpose the protecting powers may appoint apart from their diplomatic or consular staff delegates from amongst their own nationals or the nationals of other neutral powers the said delegates shall be subject to the approval of the power with which they are to carry out their duties the parties to the conflict shall facilitate to the greatest extent possible the task of the representatives or delegates of the protecting powers the representatives or delegates of the protecting powers shall not in any case exceed their mission under the present convention they shall in particular take account of the imperative necessities of security of the state wherein they carry out their duties their activities shall only be restricted as an exceptional and temporary measure when this is rendered necessary by imperative military necessities article nine activities of the international committee of the red cross the provisions of the present convention constitute no obstacle to the humanitarian activities which the international committee of the red cross or any other impartial humanitarian organization may subject to the consent of the parties to the conflict concerned undertake for the protection of the wounded sick and shipwrecked persons medical personnel and chaplains and for their relief article ten substitutes for protecting powers the high contracting parties may at any time agree to entrust to an organization which offers all guarantees of impartiality and efficacy the duties incumbent on the protecting powers by virtue of the present convention when wounded sick and shipwrecked or medical personnel and chaplains do not benefit or cease to benefit no matter for what reason by the activities of a protecting power or of an organization provided for in the first paragraph above the detaining power shall request a neutral state or such an organization to undertake the functions performed under the present convention by a protecting power designated by the parties to the conflict if protection cannot be arranged accordingly the detaining power shall request or shall accept subject to the provisions of this article 
the offer of the services of a humanitarian organization such as the International Committee of the Red Cross to assume the humanitarian functions performed by protecting powers under the present convention. Any neutral power or any organization invited by the power concerned or offering itself for these purposes shall be required to act with a sense of responsibility towards the party to the conflict on which persons protected by the present convention depend, and shall be required to furnish sufficient assurances that it is in a position to undertake the appropriate functions and to discharge them impartially. No derogation from the preceding provisions shall be made by special agreements between powers, one of which is restricted, even temporarily, in its freedom to negotiate with the other power or its allies by reason of military events, more particularly where the whole or a substantial part of the territory of the said power is occupied. Whenever, in the present convention, mention is made of a protecting power, such mention also applies to substitute organizations in the sense of the present article. Article 11. Conciliation Procedure. In cases where they deem it advisable in the interest of protected persons, particularly in cases of disagreement between the parties to the conflict, as to the application or interpretation of the provisions of the present convention, the protecting powers shall lend their good offices with a view to settling the disagreement. For this purpose, each of the protecting powers may, either at the invitation of one party or on its own initiative, propose to the parties to the conflict a meeting of their representatives, in particular of the authorities responsible for the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked, medical personnel and chaplains, possibly on neutral territory suitably chosen. The parties to the conflict shall be bound to give effect to the proposals made to them for this purpose. The protecting powers may, if necessary, propose for approval by the parties to the conflict a person belonging to a neutral power or delegated by the International Committee of the Red Cross who shall be invited to take part in such a meeting. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2. Wounded, Sick, and Shipwrecked. Article 12. Protection and Care. Members of the armed forces and other persons mentioned in the following article, who are at sea and who are wounded, sick, or shipwrecked, shall be respected and protected in all circumstances. It being understood that the term shipwreck means shipwreck from any cause and includes forced landings at sea, by or from aircraft. Such persons shall be treated humanely and cared for by the parties to the conflict in whose power they may be, without any adverse distinction founded on sex, race, nationality, religion, political opinions, or any other similar criteria. Any attempts upon their lives or violence to their persons shall be strictly prohibited. In particular, they shall not be murdered or exterminated, subjected to torture or to biological experiments, they shall not willfully be left without medical assistance and care, nor shall conditions exposing them to contagion or infection be created. Only urgent medical reasons will authorize priority in the order of treatment to be administered. Women shall be treated with all consideration due to their sex. Article 13. Protected Persons. The present convention shall apply to the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked at sea belonging to the following categories. Item 1. Members of the armed forces of a party to the conflict, as well as members of militias or volunteer corps forming part of such armed forces. Item 2. Members of other militias and members of other volunteer corps including those of organized resistance movements belonging to a party to the conflict and operating in or outside their own territory, even if their territory is occupied, provided that such militias or volunteer corps, 
including such organized resistance movements, fulfill the following conditions. A. That of being commanded by a person responsible for his subordinates. B. That of having a fixed distinctive sign recognizable at a distance. C. That of carrying arms openly. D. That of conducting their operations in accordance with the laws and customs of war. Item 3. Members of regular armed forces who profess allegiance to a government or an authority not recognized by the detaining power. Item 4. Persons who accompany the armed forces without actually being members thereof, such as civilian members of military aircraft crews, war correspondents, supply contractors, members of labor units or of services responsible for the welfare of the armed forces, provided that they have received authorization from the armed forces which they accompany. Item 5. Members of crews, including masters, pilots, and apprentices of the merchant marine and the crews of civil aircraft of the parties to the conflict, who do not benefit by more favorable treatment under any provisions of international law. Item 6. Inhabitants of a non-occupied territory who, on the approach of the enemy, spontaneously take up arms to resist the invading forces without having had time to form themselves into regular armed units, provided they carry arms openly and respect the laws and customs of war. Article 14. Handing over to a belligerent. All warships of a belligerent party shall have the right to demand that the wounded, sick, or shipwrecked on board military hospital ships and hospital ships belonging to relief societies or to private individuals, as well as merchant vessels, yachts, and other craft, shall be surrendered, whatever their nationality, provided that the wounded and sick are in a fit state to be moved and that the warship can provide adequate facilities for necessary medical treatment. Article 15. Wounded taken on board a neutral warship. If wounded, sick, or shipwrecked persons are taken on board a neutral warship or a neutral military aircraft, it shall be ensured, where so required by international law, that they can take no further part in operations of war. Article 16. Wounded Falling Into Enemy Hands Subject to the provisions of Article 12, the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked of a belligerent who fall into enemy hands shall be prisoners of war, and the provisions of international law concerning prisoners of war shall apply to them. The captor may decide, according to circumstances, whether it is expedient to hold them or to convey them to a port in the captor's own country, to a neutral port, or even to a port in enemy territory. In the last case, prisoners of war, thus returned to their home country, may not serve for the duration of the war. Article 17. Wounded Landed in a Neutral Port Wounded sick or shipwrecked persons who are landed in neutral ports with the consent of the local authorities, shall, failing arrangements to the contrary between the neutral and belligerent powers, be so guarded by the neutral power, where so required by international law, that the persons cannot again take part in operations of war. The costs of hospital accommodation and internment shall be borne by the power on whom the wounded, sick, or shipwrecked persons depend. Article 18. Search for Casualties After an Engagement After an engagement, parties to the conflict shall, without delay, take all possible measures to search for and collect the shipwrecked, wounded, and sick, to protect them against pillage and ill treatment, to ensure their adequate care, and to search for the dead and prevent their being despoiled. Whenever circumstances permit, the parties to the conflict shall conclude local arrangements for the removal of the wounded and sick by sea from a besieged or encircled area and for the passage of medical and religious personnel 
and equipment on their way to that area. Article 19. Recording and Forwarding of Information The parties to the conflict shall record as soon as possible, in respect of each shipwrecked, wounded, sick, or dead person of the adverse party falling into their hands, any particulars which may assist in his identification. These records should, if possible, include a. Designation of the power on which he depends, b. Army, regimental, personal, or serial number, c. Surname, d. First name or names, e. Date of birth, f. Any other particulars shown on his identity card or disc. G. Date and place of capture or death. H. Particulars concerning wounds or illness or cause of death. As soon as possible, the above mentioned information shall be forwarded to the Information Bureau, described in Article 122 of the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war of August 12, 1949, which shall transmit this information to the power on which these persons depend through the intermediary of the protecting power and of the Central Prisoners of War Agency. Parties to the conflict shall prepare and forward to each other, through the same Bureau, certificates of death or duly authenticated lists of the dead. They shall likewise collect and forward, through the same bureau, one half of the double identity disc, or the identity disc itself if it is a single disc, last wills or other documents of importance to the next of kin, money, and in general all articles of an intrinsic or sentimental value which are found on the dead. These articles, together with unidentified articles, shall be sent in sealed packets, accompanied by statements giving all particulars necessary for the identification of the deceased owners, as well as by a complete list of the contents of the parcel. Article 20. Prescriptions Regarding the Dead Parties to the conflict shall ensure that burial at sea of the dead, carried out individually as far as circumstances permit, is preceded by a careful examination, if possible by a medical examination, of the bodies with a view to confirming death, establishing identity, and enabling a report to be made. Where a double identity disc is used, one half of the disc should remain on the body. If dead persons are landed, the provisions of the Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick and armed forces in the field of August 12, 1949, shall be applicable. Article 21. Appeals to Neutral Vessels. The parties to the conflict may appeal to the charity of commanders of neutral merchant vessels, yachts, or other craft, to take on board and care for wounded, sick, or shipwrecked persons, and to collect the dead. Vessels of any kind responding to this appeal, and those having of their own accord collected wounded, sick, or shipwrecked persons, shall enjoy special protection and facilities to carry out such assistance. They may, in no case, be captured on account of any such transport, but, in the absence of any promise to the contrary, they shall remain liable to capture for any violations of neutrality they may have committed. End of chapter 2. End of section 6. Section 7 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. Chapters 3, 4, and 5. Hospital Ships, Personnel, and Medical Transports. Chapter 3. Hospital Ships. Article 22. Notification and Protection of Military Hospital Ships. Military hospital ships, that is to say, ships built or equipped, 
by the powers specially and solely with a view to assisting the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked, to treating them and to transporting them, may in no circumstances be attacked or captured, but shall at all times be respected and protected, on condition that their names and descriptions have been notified to the parties to the conflict ten days before the ships are employed. The characteristics which must appear in the notification shall include registered gross tonnage, the length from stem to stern, and the number of masts and funnels. Article 23. Protection of Medical Establishments Ashore. Establishments ashore entitled to the protection of the Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field of August 12, 1949, shall be protected from bombardment or attack from the sea. Article 24. Hospital ships utilized by relief societies and private individuals of 1. Parties to the conflict. Hospital ships utilized by National Red Cross societies, by officially recognized relief societies, or by private persons, shall have the same protection as military hospital ships, and shall be exempt from capture, if the party to the conflict on which they depend has given them an official commission, and in so far as the provisions of Article 22 concerning notification have been complied with. These ships must be provided with certificates from the responsible authorities stating that the vessels have been under their control while fitting out and on departure. Article 25. Neutral Countries Hospital ships utilized by National Red Cross Societies, officially recognized relief societies, or private persons of neutral countries shall have the same protection as military hospital ships and shall be exempt from capture on the condition that they have placed themselves under the control of one of the parties to the conflict with the previous consent of their governments and with the authorization of the party to the conflict concerned insofar as the provisions of Article 22 concerning notification have been complied with. Article 26. Tonnage. The protection mentioned in Articles 22, 24, and 25 shall apply to hospital ships of any tonnage and to their lifeboats, whenever they are operating. Nevertheless, to ensure the maximum comfort and security, the parties to the conflict shall endeavor to utilize, for the transport of wounded, sick, and shipwrecked, over long distances and on the high seas, only hospital ships of over 2,000 tons gross. Article 27. Coastal Rescue Craft. Under the same conditions as those provided for in Articles 22 and 24, small craft employed by the state or by the officially recognized lifeboat institutions for coastal rescue operations shall also be respected and protected so far as operational requirements permit. The same shall apply, so far as possible, to fixed coastal installations used exclusively by these craft for their humanitarian missions. Article 28. Protection of Sick Bays. Should fighting occur on board a warship, the sick bays shall be respected and spared as far as possible. Sick bays and their equipment shall remain subject to the laws of warfare, but may not be diverted from their purpose so long as they are required for the wounded and sick. Nevertheless, the commander into whose power they have fallen may, after ensuring the proper care of the wounded and sick who are accommodated therein, apply them to other purposes in case of urgent military necessity. Article 29 hospital ships in occupied ports. Any hospital ship in a port which falls into the hands of the enemy shall be authorized to leave the said port. Article 30. Employment of hospital ships and small craft. The vessels described in Articles 22, 24, 25, and 27 
shall afford relief and assistance to the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked, without distinction of nationality. The high contracting parties undertake not to use these vessels for any military purpose. Such vessels shall in no wise hamper the movements of the combatants. During and after an engagement, they will act at their own risk. Article 31. Right of Control and Search. The parties to the conflict shall have the right to control and search the vessels mentioned in Articles 22, 24, 25, and 27. They can refuse assistance from these vessels, order them off, make them take a certain course, control the use of their wireless and other means of communication, and even detain them for a period not exceeding seven days from the time of interception, if the gravity of the circumstances so requires. They may put a commissioner temporarily on board, whose sole task shall be to see that orders given in virtue of the provisions of the preceding paragraph are carried out. As far as possible, the parties to the conflict shall enter the log of the hospital ship in a language he can understand the orders they have given the captain of the vessel. Parties to the conflict may either unilaterally or by particular agreements put on board these ships neutral observers who shall verify the strict observation of the provisions contained in the present convention. Article 32. Stay in a Neutral Port. Vessels described in Articles 22, 24, 25, and 27 are not classed as warships as regards their stay in a neutral port. Article 33. Converted Merchant Vessels. Merchant vessels, which have been transformed into hospital ships, cannot be put to any other use throughout the duration of hostilities. Article 34. Discontinuance of Protection. The protection to which hospital ships and sick bays are entitled shall not cease unless they are used to commit, outside their humanitarian duties, acts harmful to the enemy. Protection may, however, cease only after due warning has been given, naming in all appropriate cases a reasonable time limit, and after such warning has remained unheeded. In particular, hospital ships may not possess or use a secret code for their wireless or other means of communication. Article 35. Conditions Not Depriving Hospital Ships of Protection The following conditions shall not be considered as depriving hospital ships or sick bays of vessels of the protection due to them. 1. The fact that the crews of ships or sick bays are armed for the maintenance of order, for their own defense, or that of the sick and wounded. 2. The presence on board of apparatus exclusively intended to facilitate navigation or communication. 3. The discovery on board hospital ships, or in sick bays, of portable arms and ammunition, taken from the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked, and not yet handed to the proper service. 4. The fact that the humanitarian activities of hospital ships and sick bays of vessels or of the crews extend to the care of wounded, sick, or shipwrecked civilians. 5. The transport of equipment and of personnel intended exclusively for medical duties over and above the normal requirements. End of Chapter 3 Chapter 4. Personnel Article 36. Protection of the Personnel of Hospital Ships The religious, medical, and hospital personnel of hospital ships and their crews shall be respected and protected. They may not be captured during the time they are in the service of the hospital ship, whether or not there are wounded and sick on board. Article 37. Medical and Religious Personnel of Other Ships the religious medical and hospital personnel assigned to the medical or spiritual care of the persons designated in Articles 12 and 13 shall, 
if they fall into the hands of the enemy, be respected and protected. They may continue to carry out their duties as long as this is necessary for the care of the wounded and sick. They shall afterwards be sent back as soon as the commander-in-chief, under whose authority they are, considers it practicable. They may take with them, on leaving the ship, their personal property. If, however, it proves necessary to retain some of this personnel owing to the medical or spiritual needs of prisoners of war, everything possible shall be done for their earliest possible landing. Retained personnel shall be subject on landing to the provisions of the Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field of August 12, 1949. End of chapter 4. Chapter 5. Medical Transports. Article 38. Ships used for the conveyance of medical equipment. Ships chartered for that purpose shall be authorized to transport equipment exclusively intended for the treatment of wounded and sick members of the armed forces or for the prevention of disease, provided that the particulars regarding their voyage have been notified to the adverse power and approved by the latter. The adverse power shall preserve the right to board the carrier ships, but not to capture them or to seize the equipment carried. By agreement among the parties to the conflict, neutral observers may be placed on board such ships to verify the equipment carried. For this purpose, free access to the equipment shall be given. Article 39. Medical Aircraft. Medical aircraft, that is to say, aircraft exclusively employed for the removal of wounded, sick, and shipwrecked, and for the transport of medical personnel and equipment, may not be the object of attack, but shall be respected by the parties to the conflict, while flying at heights, at times, and on routes specifically agreed upon between the parties to the conflict concerned. They shall be clearly marked with the distinctive emblem prescribed in Article 41, together with their national colors on their lower, upper, and lateral surfaces. They shall be provided with any other markings or means of identification which may be agreed upon between the parties to the conflict upon the outbreak or during the course of hostilities. Unless agreed otherwise, flights over enemy or enemy-occupied territory are prohibited. Medical aircraft shall obey every summons to alight on land or water. In the event of having thus to alight, the aircraft with its occupants may continue its flight after examination, if any. In the event of alighting involuntarily on land or water in enemy or enemy-occupied territory, the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked, as well as the crew of the aircraft, shall be prisoners of war. The medical personnel shall be treated according to Articles 36 and 37. Article 40. Flight over neutral countries. Landing of wounded. Subject to the provisions of the second paragraph, medical aircraft of parties to the conflict may fly over the territory of neutral powers, land thereon in case of necessity, or use it as a port of call. They shall give neutral powers prior notice of their passage over the said territory and obey every summons to alight on land or water. They will be immune from attack only when flying on routes, at heights, and at times specifically agreed upon between the parties to the conflict and the neutral power concerned. The neutral powers may, however, place conditions or restrictions on the passage or landing of medical aircraft on their territory. Such possible conditions or restrictions shall be applied equally to all parties to the conflict unless otherwise agreed between the neutral powers and the parties to the conflict the wounded sick or shipwrecked who are disembarked with the consent of the local authorities on neutral territory by medical aircraft shall be detained by the neutral power 
where so required by international law, in such a manner that they cannot again take part in operations of war. The cost of their accommodation and internment shall be borne by the power on which they depend. End of chapter 5 End of section 7《セクション8》of《ジュネーヴァ・コンベンション》、August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. Chapters 6, 7, 8, and Final Provisions: The Distinctive Emblem, The Execution of the Convention. Repression of Abuses and Infractions Chapter 6. The Distinctive Emblem Article 41. Use of the Emblem Under the direction of the competent military authority, the emblem of the Red Cross on a white background shall be displayed on the flags, armlets, and on all equipment employed in the medical service. Nevertheless, in the case of countries which already use as emblem, in place of the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, or the Red Lion and Sun on a white ground, these emblems are also recognized by the terms of the present convention. Article 42. Identification of Medical and Religious Personnel. The personnel designated in Articles 36 and 37 shall wear affixed to the left arm a water-resistant armlet bearing the distinctive emblem issued and stamped by the military authority. Such personnel, in addition to wearing the identity disc mentioned in Article 19, shall also carry a special identity card bearing the distinctive emblem. This card shall be water-resistant and of such size that it can be carried in the pocket. It shall be worded in the national language shall mention at least the surname and first names, the date of birth, the rank, and the service number of the bearer, and shall state in what capacity he is entitled to the protection of the present convention. The card shall bear the photograph of the owner, and also either his signature or his fingerprints, or both. It shall be embossed with the stamp of the military authority. The identity card shall be uniform throughout the same armed forces and, as far as possible, of a similar type in the armed forces of the high contracting parties. The parties to the conflict may be guided by the model which is annexed, by way of example, to the present convention. They shall inform each other, at the outbreak of hostilities, of the model they are using. Identity cards should be made out, if possible, at least in duplicate, one copy being kept by the home country. In no circumstances may the said personnel be deprived of their insignia or identity cards, nor of the right to wear the armlet. In cases of loss, they shall be entitled to receive duplicates of the cards and to have the insignia replaced. Article 43. Marking of Hospital Ships and Small Craft. The ships designated in Articles 22, 24, 25, and 27 shall be distinctively marked as follows. A. All exterior surfaces shall be white. B. One or more dark red crosses, as large as possible, shall be painted and displayed on each side of the hull and on the horizontal surfaces, so placed as to afford the greatest possible visibility from the sea and from the air. All hospital ships shall make themselves known by hoisting their national flag and further, if they belong to a neutral state, the flag of the party to the conflict whose direction they have accepted. A white flag with a red cross shall be flown at the mainmast as high as possible. Lifeboats of hospital ships, coastal lifeboats, and all small craft used by the medical service shall be painted white with dark red crosses prominently displayed and shall in general comply with the identification system prescribed above for hospital ships 
The above-mentioned ships and craft, which may wish to ensure by night and in times of reduced visibility the protection to which they are entitled, must, subject to the assent of the party to the conflict under whose power they are, take the necessary measures to render their painting and distinctive emblems sufficiently apparent. Hospital ships, which, in accordance with Article 31, are provisionally detained by the enemy, must haul down the flag of the party to the conflict in whose service they are or whose direction they have accepted. Coastal lifeboats, if they continue to operate with the consent of the occupying power from a base which is occupied, may be allowed, when away from their base, to continue to fly their own national colors along with a flag carrying a red cross on a white ground, subject to prior notification to all the parties to the conflict concerned. All the provisions in this article relating to the Red Cross shall apply equally to other emblems mentioned in Article 41. Parties to the conflict shall at all times endeavor to conclude mutual agreements in order to use the most modern methods available to facilitate the identification of hospital ships. Article 44. Limitation in the Use of Markings The distinguishing signs referred to in Article 43 can only be used, whether in time of peace or war, for indicating or protecting the ships therein mentioned, except as may be provided in any other international convention or by agreement between all the parties to the conflict concerned. Article 45. Prevention of Misuse the high contracting parties shall, if their legislation is not already adequate, take the measures necessary for the prevention and repression at all times of any abuse of the distinctive signs provided for under Article 43. End of Chapter 6 Chapter 7. Execution of the Convention Article 46. Detailed Execution unforeseen cases. Each party to the conflict, acting through its commanders-in-chief, shall ensure the detailed execution of the preceding articles and provide for unforeseen cases in conformity with the general principles of the present convention. Article 47. Prohibition of Reprisals. Reprisals against the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked persons, the personnel, the vessels or the equipment protected by the Convention are prohibited. Article 48. Dissemination of the Convention. The high contracting parties undertake, in time of peace as in time of war, to disseminate the text of the present Convention as widely as possible in their respective countries, and, in particular, to include the study thereof in their programs of military and, if possible, civilian instruction, so that the principles thereof may become known to the entire population, in particular to the armed fighting forces, the medical personnel, and the chaplains. Article 49. Translations. Rules of Application. The high contracting parties shall communicate to one another through the Swiss Federal Council and, during hostilities, through the protecting powers, the official translations of the present convention, as well as the laws and regulations which they may adopt to ensure the application thereof. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 Repression of Abuses and Infractions Article 50 Penal Sanctions Item 1. General Observations. The high contracting parties undertake to enact any legislation necessary to provide effective penal sanctions for persons committing or ordering to be committed any of the grave breaches of the present convention defined in the following article. Each high contracting party shall be under the obligation to search for persons alleged to have committed or to have ordered to be committed such grave breaches, and shall bring such persons, regardless of their nationality, before its courts. 
It may also, if it prefers, and in accordance with the provisions of its own legislation, hand such persons over for trial to another high contracting party concerned, provided such high contracting party has made out a prima facie case. Each high contracting party shall take measures necessary for the suppression of all acts contrary to the provisions of the present convention other than the grave breaches defined in the following article. In all circumstances, the accused persons shall benefit by safeguards of proper trial and defense, which shall not be less favorable than those provided by Article 105 and those following of the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war of August 12, 1949. Article 51. Penal Sanctions, Item 2. Grave Breaches. Grave breaches to which the preceding article relates shall be those involving any of the following acts if committed against persons or property protected by the Convention. Willful killing, torture or inhuman treatment, including biological experiments, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, and extensive destruction and appropriation of property, not justified by military necessity and carried out lawfully and wantonly. Article 52. Penal Sanctions. Item 3. Responsibilities of the Contracting Parties. No high contracting party shall be allowed to absolve itself or any other high contracting party of any liability incurred by itself or by another high contracting party, in respect of breaches referred to in the preceding article. Article 53. Inquiry Procedure. At the request of a party to the conflict, an inquiry shall be instituted in a manner to be decided between the interested parties concerning any alleged violation of the Convention. If agreement has not been reached concerning the procedure for inquiry, the parties should agree on the choice of an umpire who will decide upon the procedure to be followed. Once the violation has been established, the parties to the conflict shall put an end to it and shall repress it with the least possible delay. End of chapter 8. Final Provisions. Article 54. Languages. The present convention is established in English and in French. Both texts are equally authentic. The Swiss Federal Council shall arrange for official translations of the Convention to be made in the Russian and Spanish languages. Article 55. Signature. The present Convention, which bears the date of this day, is open to signature until February 12, 1950, in the name of the powers represented at the Conference which opened at Geneva on April 21, 1949. Furthermore, by powers not represented at that conference, but which are parties to the 10th Hague Convention of October 18, 1907, for the adaptation to maritime warfare of the principles of the Geneva Convention of 1906, or to the Geneva Conventions of 1864, 1906, or 1929, for the relief of the wounded and sick in armies in the field. Article 56. Ratification. The present convention shall be ratified as soon as possible, and the ratifications shall be deposited at Bern. A record shall be drawn up of the deposit of each instrument of ratification, and certified copies of this record shall be transmitted by the Swiss Federal Council to all the powers in whose name the convention has been signed, or whose accession has been notified. Article 57. Coming into Force. The present convention shall come into force six months after not less than two instruments of ratification have been deposited. Thereafter, it shall come into force for each high contracting party six months after the deposit of the instruments of ratification. Article 58. Relation to the 1907 Convention. 
The present convention replaces the 10th Hague Convention of October 18, 1907, for the adaptation to maritime warfare of the principles of the Geneva Convention of 1906 in relations between the high contracting parties. Article 59. Accession. From the date of its coming into force, it shall be open to any power, in whose name the present convention has not been signed, to accede to this convention. Article 60. Notification of Accessions. Accession shall be notified in writing to the Swiss Federal Council, and shall take effect six months after the date on which they are received. The Swiss Federal Council shall communicate the accessions to all the powers in whose name the convention has been signed, or whose accession has been notified. Article 61. Immediate Effect. The situations provided for in Articles 2 and 3 shall give immediate effect to the ratifications deposited and accessions notified by the parties to the conflict before or after the beginning of hostilities or occupation. The Swiss Federal Council shall communicate by the quickest method any ratifications or accessions received from parties to the conflict. Article 62. Denunciation. Each of the high contracting parties shall be at liberty to denounce the present convention. The denunciation shall be notified in writing to the Swiss Federal Council, which shall transmit it to the governments of all the high contracting parties. The denunciation shall take effect one year after the notification thereof has been made to the Swiss Federal Council. However, a denunciation of which notification has been made at a time when the denouncing power is involved in a conflict shall not take effect until peace has been concluded and until after operations connected with the release and repatriation of the persons protected by the present convention have been terminated. The denunciation shall have effect only in respect of the denouncing power it shall in no way impair the obligations which the parties to the conflict shall remain bound to fulfill by virtue of the principles of the law of nations, as they result from the usages established among civilized peoples, from the laws of humanity and the dictates of the public conscience. Article 63. Registration with the United Nations. The Swiss Federal Council shall register the present convention with the Secretariat of the United Nations. The Swiss Federal Council shall also inform the Secretariat of the United Nations of all ratifications, accessions, and denunciations received by it with respect to the present convention. In witness whereof the undersigned, having deposited their respective full powers, have signed the present convention. Done at Geneva, this twelfth day of August, 1949, in the English and French languages. The original shall be deposited in the archives of the Swiss Confederation. The Swiss Federal Council shall transmit certified copies thereof to each of the signatory and exceeding states. End of Final Provisions End of Section 8《Section 9 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.》Introductory Notes, Geneva Convention 3. Prisoners of War The Third Convention contains 143 articles, besides the annexes. The corresponding 1929 Convention had 97 articles, and the chapter on prisoners of war in the Hague Convention, only 17. This extension is no doubt due in part to the fact that, in modern warfare, prisoners are held in very large numbers, but it also interprets the desire of the 1949 Conference, representing all nations, to submit all aspects of captivity to humane regulation by international law. 
The aspiration is not new. The 19th century saw new concepts of natural law and the new humanitarian movement, in particular the ideas of Henry Dunant, who applied himself to the prisoner of war problem after the wounded and sick had been provided for. The civilized world finally accepted the principle that the prisoner of war is not a criminal, but merely an enemy, no longer able to bear arms, who should be liberated at the close of hostilities, and be respected and humanely treated while in captivity. Far-seeing and broad-minded legal and diplomatic action has since translated concept into practice through a series of codifications accepted as binding by states, and successively extended or amplified when experience showed them to be inadequate. The Brussels Draft of 1874, the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, the special agreements made between belligerents in Bern in 1917 and 1918, and the Geneva Conventions of 1929, which devote all or part of their clauses to prisoners of war, represent the principal stages of this evolution. Wherever it was applied, the 1929 Prisoners of War Convention effectively helped to protect the millions of men who relied upon it during the last conflict. Nevertheless, it was quite evident, both to those who benefited and those by whom it was applied, that the Convention required revision on many points. There have been changes in the methods and the consequences of war, and even in the living conditions of peoples. It was necessary to broaden the categories of persons entitled to prisoner of war status, so that such status is in fact granted to members of forces which capitulate, and that prisoners may not be arbitrarily deprived of it at any time. A more precise definition of the conditions of captivity was also required, which would take into account the importance assumed by a prisoner of war labor, the relief they receive, and the judicial proceedings instituted against them. The principle of the immediate liberation of prisoners on the close of hostilities had to be reaffirmed. Finally, it was essential that the agencies appointed to look after prisoners' interests and ensure that regulations concerning them are applied in full should be as independent as possible of the political relations existing between the belligerents. These were the most urgent, only, of the problems that the war revealed. Thus, before hostilities had ceased, and concurrently with the even more urgent task of preparing a civilian convention, the International Committee began to work upon the revision of the 1929 Prisoners of War Convention. As already pointed out, the 1939 Convention is far longer than the agreement it replaces but whilst many of its provisions represent a logical development of the 1929 Convention, experience has shown that the daily lives of prisoners may depend on the interpretation given to a general rule. An attempt has therefore been made to give certain regulations an explicit form, precluding the misinterpretation to which they were formerly open. Moreover, principles which was felt would have greater force for being tersely worded e.g. Article 2 of the 1929 text, had been so seriously violated that the conference had recast them in terms comprehensive and clear enough to make any future infringement immediately apparent. Another group of provisions is designed to provide a satisfactory solution for the numerous problems outlined above. This task was more difficult. In many instances, the conference had to devise entirely new regulations, as in the section dealing with the financial resources of prisoners of war, or deliberately to break with certain rules which, in 1929, had been transferred more or less bodily from the Hague regulations. One instance is the rule concerning the liberation of prisoners at the close of hostilities. Some of the details may seem superfluous. Repetition and lack of harmony between certain provisions may also cause surprise. It should, however, be remembered that, whilst throughout concerned with the Convention as an instrument of international law, the Conference had constantly in mind a special use to which it was to be put, 
regulations to be posted in prisoner of war camps and comprehensible not only to the authorities but to the ordinary reader furthermore the conference did not hesitate to sacrifice neatness in the interests of unanimous agreement these are reasons which with the difficulty of establishing official legal texts simultaneously in two languages may account for and even justify most of the textual imperfections to be found in the prisoners of war convention the table which appears at the end of the volume and the marginal notes to each article make it easy to grasp the general plan which is as far as possible similar to that of the nineteen twenty nine convention the general outline is as follows amongst the general provisions article one to two which have already been dealt with article four defining the categories of persons entitled to prisoner of war treatment is a vital element of the convention part two general protection of prisoners of war article twelve to sixteen contains the essential principles which shall at all times and in all places govern the treatment of prisoners part three article seventeen two hundred and eight deals with the conditions of captivity and is divided into six sections the first article seventeen to twenty covers events immediately after capture and deals with such matters as interrogation of prisoners disposal of their personal effects and their evacuation the second comprising eight chapters article twenty one to forty eight regulates living conditions for prisoners in camp or during transfer and deals with the places and methods of internment accommodation food and clothing hygiene and medical attention medical and religious personnel retained for the care of prisoners a new chapter which partly reproduces the provisions of the first convention religious needs intellectual and physical activities discipline prisoner of war ranks and transfer after arrival in a camp prisoners labor is dealt with in the third section article forty nine to fifty seven and the fourth section article fifty eight to sixty eight is new and concerns the financial resources of prisoners the fifth section article sixty nine to seventy seven covers everything concerned with correspondence and relief shipments the sixth and last section article seventy eight to hundred eight which is in three chapters covers the relations between prisoners of war and the detaining authorities complaints regarding captivity prisoners representatives and penal and disciplinary sanctions this last chapter article eighty two to hundred and eight constitutes in itself a brief code of penal and disciplinary procedure the various measures for the termination of captivity are contained in part four article hundred nine to hundred twenty one which is divided into three sections the first article hundred and nine to hundred and seventeen refers to repatriation and accommodation of prisoners in neutral countries during hostilities the second article hundred eighteen and hundred and nineteen to repatriation at the close of hostilities and the third article hundred twenty and hundred and twenty one to the death of prisoners of war part five article hundred twenty two to hundred twenty five contains provisions about prisoners of war information bureau and all organizations formed to assist prisoners part six execution of the convention article hundred and twenty six to hundred and forty three contains in the first section article hundred twenty six to hundred thirty two a variety of most important stipulations requiring belligerents inter alia to give neutral organizations free access to prisoner of war camps for inspection purposes and to disseminate the text of the convention as widely as possible articles hundred twenty nine to hundred thirty one further contain the provisions common to the four conventions for the repression of breaches five annexes are closely connected to the convention annex one model agreement concerning direct repatriation and accommodation in neutral countries of wounded and sick prisoners of war annex three regulations concerning collective relief and annex five 
model regulations concerning payments sent by prisoners to their own country, are intended to substitute in the absence of specific agreement on these questions between the belligerents concerned. Annex 2, Regulations Concerning Mixed Medical Commissions, is prescriptive. Annex 4 proposes standard model documents, such as identity or capture cards, correspondence cards, death notifications, etc. End of section 9. Section 10 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. Convention Header Part 1. General Provisions. Part 2. General Protection of Prisoners of War. Geneva Convention. Relative to the Treatment of Prisoners of War of 12th of August, 1949. The undersigned plenipotentiaries of the governments represented at the diplomatic conference held at Geneva from April 21 to August 12, 1949, for the purpose of revising the convention concluded at Geneva on July 27, 1929, relative to the treatment of prisoners of war, have agreed as follows. Part 1. General Provisions Article 1. Respect for the Convention The marginal notes or titles of articles have been drafted by the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. The high contracting parties undertake to respect and to ensure respect for the present Convention in all circumstances. Article 2. Application of the Convention in addition to the provisions which shall be implemented in peacetime, the present convention shall apply to all cases of declared war or any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties, even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. The convention shall also apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party, even if the said occupation meets with no armed resistance. Although one of the powers in conflict may not be a party to the present convention, the powers who are parties thereto shall remain bound by it in their mutual relations. They shall furthermore be bound by the convention in relation to the said power, if the latter accepts and applies the provisions thereof. Article 3. Conflicts not of an international character. In the case of armed conflict not of an international character occurring in the territory of one of the high contracting parties, each party to the conflict shall be bound to apply as a minimum the following provisions. 1. Persons taking no active part in the hostilities, including members of armed forces who have laid down their arms and those placed hors de combat by sickness, wounds, detention, or any other cause, shall in all circumstances be treated humanely, without any adverse distinction founded on race, color, religion, or faith, sex, birth, or wealth, or any other similar criteria. To this end, the following acts are and shall remain prohibited at any time and in any place whatsoever with respect to the above-mentioned persons. a. Violence to life and person, in particular murder of all kinds, mutilation, cruel treatment, and torture b. Taking of hostages. 3. Outrages upon personal dignity, in particular humiliating and degrading treatment. d. The passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court, affording all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples. 2. The wounded and sick shall be collected and cared for. An impartial humanitarian body, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, may offer its services to the parties to the conflict. The parties to the conflict should further endeavor to bring into force, by means of special agreements, all or parts of the other provisions of the present Convention. The application of the preceding provisions shall not affect the legal status of the parties to the conflict. Article 4. 
Prisoners of War. A. Prisoners of war in the sense of the present convention are persons belonging to one of the following categories who have fallen into the power of the enemy. 1. Members of the armed forces of a party to the conflict as well as members of militias or volunteer corps forming part of such armed forces. 2. Members of other militias and members of other volunteer corps, including those of organized resistance movements, belonging to a party to the conflict and operating in or outside their own territory, even if this territory is occupied, provided that such militias or volunteer corps, including such organized resistance movements, fulfill the following conditions. a. That of being commanded by a person responsible for his subordinates. b that of having a fixed, distinctive sign recognizable at a distance. c. That of carrying arms openly. d. That of conducting their operations in accordance with the laws and customs of war. 3. Members of regular armed forces who profess allegiance to the government or an authority not recognized by the detaining power. 4. Persons who accompany the armed forces without actually being members thereof, such as civilian members of military aircraft crews, war correspondents, supply contractors, members of labor units or of services responsible for the welfare of the armed forces, provided that they have received authorization from the armed forces which they accompany, who shall provide them for that purpose with an identity card, similar to the annexed model. 5. Members of crews including masters, pilots, and apprentices of the merchant marine and the crews of civil aircraft of the parties to the conflict, who do not benefit by more favorable treatment under any other provisions of international law. 6. Inhabitants of a non-occupied territory who, on the approach of the enemy, spontaneously take up arms to resist the invading forces, without having had time to form themselves into regular armed units, provided they carry arms openly and respect the laws and customs of war. b. The following shall likewise be treated as prisoners of war under the present convention. 1. Persons belonging or having belonged to the armed forces of the occupied country, if the occupying power considers it necessary by reason of such allegiance to intern them, even though it has originally liberated them while hostilities were going on outside the territory it occupies, in particular where such persons have made an unsuccessful attempt to rejoin the armed forces to which they belong and which are engaged in combat, or where they fail to comply with a summons made to them with a view to internment. 2. The persons belonging to one of the categories enumerated in the present article, who have been received by neutral or non-belligerent powers on their territory, and whom these powers are required to intern under international law, without prejudice to any more favorable treatment which these powers may choose to give, and with the exception of Articles 8, 10, 15, 30, 5th paragraph, 58 through 67, 92, 126, and where diplomatic relations exist between the parties to the conflict and the neutral or non-belligerent power concerned, those articles concerning the protecting power. Where such diplomatic relations exist, the parties to a conflict on whom these persons depend shall be allowed to perform towards them the functions of a protecting power as provided in the present convention without prejudice to the functions which these parties normally exercise in conformity with diplomatic and consular usage and treaties. c. This article shall in no way affect the status of medical personnel and chaplains as provided for in Article 33 of the present Convention. Article 5. Beginning and End of Application the present convention shall apply to the persons referred to in Article 4 for the time they fall into the power of the enemy and until their final release and repatriation. Should any doubt arise as to whether persons having committed a belligerent act and having fallen into the hands of the enemy belong to any of the categories enumerated in Article 4, such persons shall enjoy the protection of the present convention until such time as their status has been determined by a competent tribunal. Article 6. Special Agreements. 
in addition to the agreements expressly provided for in Articles 10, 23, 28, 33, 60, 65, 66, 67, 72, 73, 75, 109, 110, 118, 119, 122, and 132, the high contracting parties may conclude other special agreements for all matters concerning which they may deem it suitable to make separate provision. No special agreement shall adversely affect the situation of prisoners of war, as defined by the present convention, nor restrict the rights which it confers upon them. Prisoners of war shall continue to have the benefit of such agreements as long as the convention is applicable to them, except where express provisions to the contrary are contained in the aforesaid or in subsequent agreements, or where more favorable measures have been taken with regard to them by one or more of the parties to the conflict. Article 7. Non-Renunciation of Rights. Prisoners of war may in no circumstances renounce in part or in entirety the rights secured to them by the present convention, and by the special agreements referred to in the foregoing article, if such there be. Article 8. Protecting Powers. The present convention shall be applied with the cooperation and under the scrutiny of the protecting powers whose duty it is to safeguard the interests of the parties to the conflict. For this purpose, the protecting powers may appoint, apart from their diplomatic or consular staff, delegates from amongst their own nationals or the nationals of other neutral powers. The said delegates shall be subject to the approval of the power with which they are to carry out their duties. The parties to the conflict shall facilitate to the greatest extent possible the task of the representatives or delegates of the protecting powers. The representatives or delegates of the protecting powers shall not in any case exceed their mission under the present convention. They shall, in particular, take account of the imperative necessities of security of the state wherein they carry out their duties. Article 9. Activities of the International Committee of the Red Cross. The provisions of the present convention constitute no obstacle to the humanitarian activities which the International Committee of the Red Cross or any other impartial humanitarian organization may, subject to the consent of the parties to the conflict concerned, undertake for the protection of prisoners of war and for their relief. Article 10. Substitutes for Protecting Powers. The high contracting parties may at any time agree to entrust to an organization which offers all guarantees of impartiality and efficacy the duties incumbent on the protecting powers by virtue of the present convention. When prisoners of war do not benefit or cease to benefit, no matter for what reason, by the activities of a protecting power or of an organization provided for in the first paragraph above, the detaining power shall request a neutral state or such an organization, to undertake the functions performed under the present convention by a protecting power designated by the parties to a conflict. If protection cannot be arranged accordingly, the detaining power shall request or shall accept, subject to the provisions of this article, the offer of the services of a humanitarian organization, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, to assume the humanitarian functions performed by protecting powers under the present convention. Any neutral power or any organization invited by the power concerned or offering itself for these purposes shall be required to act with a sense of responsibility towards the party to the conflict on which persons protected by the present conventions depend, and shall be required to furnish sufficient assurances that it is in a position to undertake the appropriate functions and to discharge them impartially. No derogation from the preceding provisions shall be made by special agreements between powers one of which is restricted, even temporarily, in its freedom to negotiate with the other power or its allies by reason of military events, more particularly where the whole, or a substantial part, of the territory of the said power is occupied. Whenever in the present convention mention is made of a protecting power, such mention applies to substitute organizations in the sense of the present article. Article 11. Conciliation Procedure. 
In cases where they deem it advisable in the interest of protected persons, particularly in cases of disagreement between the parties to the conflict as to the application or interpretation of the provisions of the present convention, the protecting powers shall lend their good offices with a view to settling the disagreement. For this purpose, each of the protecting powers may, either at the invitation of one party, or on its own initiative, propose to the parties to the conflict a meeting of their representatives, and in particular of the authorities responsible for prisoners of war, possibly on neutral territory suitably chosen. The parties to the conflict shall be bound to give effect to the proposals made to them for this purpose. The protecting powers may, if necessary, propose for approval by the parties to a conflict a person belonging to neutral power, or delegated by the International Committee of the Red Cross, who shall be invited to take part in such a meeting. Part 2. General Protection of Prisoners of War Article 12. Responsibility for the Treatment of Prisoners Prisoners of war are in the hands of the enemy power, but not of the individuals or military units who have captured them. Irrespective of the individual responsibilities that may exist, the detaining power is responsible for the treatment given them. Prisoners of war may only be transferred by the detaining power to a power which is a party to the convention, and after the detaining power has satisfied itself of the willingness and ability of such transferee power to apply the convention. When prisoners of war are transferred under such circumstances, responsibility for the application of the convention rests on the power accepting them while they are in its custody. Nevertheless, if that power fails to carry out the provisions of the convention in any important respect, the power by whom the prisoners of war were transferred shall, upon being notified by the protecting power, take effective measures to correct the situation, or shall request the return of the prisoners of war. Such requests must be complied with. Article 13. Humane Treatment of Prisoners Prisoners of war must at all times be humanely treated. Any unlawful act or omission by the detaining power causing death or seriously endangering the health of a prisoner of war in its custody is prohibited and will be regarded as a serious breach of the present convention. In particular, no prisoner of war may be subjected to physical mutilation or to medical or scientific experiments of any kind which are not justified by the medical, dental or hospital treatment of the prisoner concerned and carried out in his interest. Likewise, prisoners of war must at all times be protected, particularly against acts of violence or intimidation, and against insults and public curiosity. Measures of reprisal against prisoners of war are prohibited. Article 14. Respect for the person of prisoners. Prisoners of war are entitled in all circumstances to respect for their persons and their honor. Women shall be treated with all the regard due to their sex and shall in all cases benefit by treatment as favorable as that granted to men. Prisoners of war shall retain the full civil capacity which they enjoyed at the time of their capture. The detaining power may not restrict the exercise, either within or without its own territory, of the rights such capacity confers, except in so far as the captivity requires. Article 15. Maintenance of Prisoners the power detaining prisoners of war shall be bound to provide free of charge for their maintenance and for the medical attention required by their state of health. Article 16. Equality of Treatment Taking into consideration the provisions of the present convention relating to rank and sex, and subject to any privileged treatment which may be accorded to them by reason of their state of health, age, or professional qualifications, all prisoners of war shall be treated alike by the detaining power, without any adverse distinction based on race, nationality, religious belief, or political opinions, or any other distinction founded on similar criteria. End of section 10.
Section 11 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. Part 3. Captivity. Section 1. Beginning of Captivity. Article 17. Questioning of Prisoners. Every prisoner of war, when questioned on the subject, is bound to give only his surname, first names, and rank, date of birth and army, regimental, personal, or serial number, or failing this equivalent information. If he willfully infringes this rule, he may render himself liable to a restriction of the privileges accorded to his rank or status. Each party to a conflict is required to furnish the persons under its jurisdiction who are liable to become prisoners of war, with an identity card showing the owner's surname, first names, rank, army, regimental, personal or serial number, or equivalent information and date of birth. The identity card may furthermore bear the signature or the fingerprints or both of the owner, and may bear as well any other information the party to the conflict may wish to add concerning persons belonging to its armed forces. As far as possible, the card shall measure 6.5 times 10 centimeters, and shall be issued in duplicate. The identity card shall be shown by the prisoner of war upon demand, but may in no case be taken away from him. No physical or mental torture nor any other form of coercion, may be inflicted on prisoners of war to secure from them information of any kind whatever. Prisoners of war who refuse to answer may not be threatened, insulted, or exposed to any unpleasant or disadvantageous treatment of any kind. Prisoners of war who, owing to their physical or mental condition, are unable to state their identity, shall be handed over to medical service. The identity of such prisoners shall be established by all possible means, subject to the provisions of the preceding paragraph. The questioning of prisoners of war shall be carried out in a language which they understand. Article 18. Property of Prisoners. All effects and articles of personal use, except arms, horses, military equipment, and military documents, shall remain in the possession of prisoners of war. Likewise, their metal helmets and gas masks, and like articles issued for personal protection. Effects and articles used for their clothing or feeding shall likewise remain in their possession, even if such effects and articles belong to their regulation military equipment. At no time should prisoners of war be without identity documents. The detaining power shall supply such documents to prisoners of war who possess none. Badges of rank and nationality, decorations and articles having above all a personal or sentimental value, may not be taken away from prisoners of war. Sums of money carried by prisoners of war may not be taken away from them except by order of an officer, and after the amount and particulars of the owner have been recorded in a special register and an itemized receipt has been given, legibly inscribed with the name, rank and unit of the person issuing the said receipt. Sums in the currency of the detaining power, or which are changed into such currency at the prisoner's request, shall be placed to the credit of the prisoner's account as provided in Article 64. The detaining power may withdraw articles of value from prisoners of war only for reasons of security. When such articles are withdrawn, the procedure laid down for sums of money shall apply. Such objects, likewise the sums taken away in any currency other than that of the detaining power, and the conversion of which has not been asked for by the owners, shall be kept in the custody of the detaining power, and shall be returned in their initial shape to the prisoners of war at the end of their captivity. Article 19. Evacuation of Prisoners Prisoners of war shall be evacuated as soon as possible after their capture to camps situated in an area far enough from the combat zone for them to be out of danger. Only those prisoners of war who, owing to wounds or sickness, would run greater risks by being evacuated than by remaining where they are, may be temporarily kept back in a danger zone. Prisoners of war shall not be unnecessarily exposed to danger while awaiting evacuation from a fighting zone. 
Article 20. Conditions of Evacuation. The evacuation of prisoners of war shall always be effected humanely and in conditions similar to those for the forces of the detaining power in their changes of station. The detaining power shall supply prisoners of war who are being evacuated with sufficient food and potable water and with the necessary clothing and medical attention. The detaining power shall take all suitable precautions to ensure their safety during evacuation and shall establish as soon as possible a list of the prisoners of war who are evacuated. If prisoners of war must, during evacuation, pass through transit camps, their stay in such camps shall be as brief as possible. End of section 11《Section 12 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 3. Captivity. Section 2. Internment of Prisoners of War. Chapter 1. General Observations. Article 21. Restriction of Liberty of Movement. The detaining power may subject prisoners of war to internment. It may impose on them the obligation of not leaving, beyond certain limits, the camp where they are interned, or if the said camp is fenced in, of not going outside its perimeter. Subject to the provisions of the present convention relative to penal and disciplinary sanctions, prisoners of war may not be held in close confinement except where necessary to safeguard their health, and then only during the continuation of the circumstances which make such confinement necessary. Prisoners of war may be partially or wholly released on parole or promise, in so far as is allowed by the laws of the power on which they depend. Such measures shall be taken particularly in cases where this may contribute to the improvement of their state of health. No prisoner of war shall be compelled to accept liberty on parole or promise. Upon the outbreak of hostilities, each party to the conflict shall notify the adverse party of the laws and regulations allowing or forbidding its own nationals to accept liberty on parole or promise. Prisoners of war who are paroled or have given their promise in conformity with the laws and regulations so notified are bound on their personal honor scrupulously to fulfill, both towards the power on which they depend and towards the power which has captured them, the engagements of their paroles or promises. In such cases, the power on which they depend is bound neither to require nor to accept from them any service incompatible with the parole or promise given. Article 22. Places and Conditions of Internment. Prisoners of war may be interned only in premises located on land and affording every guarantee of hygiene and healthfulness, except in particular cases which are justified by the interest of the prisoners themselves, they shall not be interned in penitentiaries. Prisoners of war interned in unhealthy areas, or where the climate is injurious for them, shall be removed as soon as possible to a more favorable climate. The detaining power shall assemble prisoners of war in camps or camp compounds, according to their nationality, language and customs, provided that such prisoners shall not be separated from prisoners of war belonging to the armed forces with which they were serving at the time of their capture, except by their consent. Article 23. Security of Prisoners. No prisoner of war may at any time be sent to or detained in areas where he may be exposed to the fire of the combat zone, nor may his presence be used to render certain points or areas immune from military operations. Prisoners of war shall have shelters against air bombardment and other hazards of war, to the same extent as the local civilian population with the exception of those engaged in the protection of their quarters against the aforesaid hazards, they may enter such shelters as soon as possible after the giving of the alarm. Any other protective measure taken in favor of the population shall also apply to them. Detaining powers shall give the powers concerned, through the intermediary of the protecting powers, all useful information regarding the geographical location of prisoners of war camps. 
whenever military considerations permit, prisoner of war camps shall be indicated in the daytime by the letters PW or PG, placed so as to be clearly visible from the air. The powers concerned may, however, agree upon any other system of marking. Only prisoner of war camps shall be marked as such. Article 24. Permanent Transit Camps. Transit or screening camps of a permanent kind shall be fitted out under conditions similar to those described in the present section, and the prisoners therein shall have the same treatment as in other camps. Chapter 2. Quarters, Food and Clothing of Prisoners of War. Article 25. Quarters. Prisoners of war shall be quartered under conditions as favorable as those for the forces of the detaining power who are billeted in the same area. The said conditions shall make allowance for the habits and customs of the prisoners, and shall in no case be prejudicial to their health. The foregoing provisions shall apply in particular to the dormitories of prisoners of war, as regards both total surface and minimum cubic space, and the general installations, bedding, and blankets. The premises provided for the use of prisoners of war individually or collectively shall be entirely protected from dampness and adequately heated and lighted, in particular between dusk and lights out. All precautions must be taken against the danger of fire. In any camps in which women prisoners of war as well as men are accommodated, separate dormitories shall be provided for them. Article 26. Food. The basic daily food rations shall be sufficient in quantity, quality, and variety to keep prisoners of war in good health and to prevent loss of weight or the development of nutritional deficiencies. Account shall also be taken of the habitual diet of the prisoners. The detaining power shall supply prisoners of war who work with such additional rations as are necessary for the labor on which they are employed. Sufficient drinking water shall be supplied to prisoners of war. The use of tobacco shall be permitted. Prisoners of war shall, as far as possible, be associated with the preparation of their meals. They may be employed for that purpose in the kitchens. Furthermore, they shall be given the means of preparing, themselves, the additional food in their possession. Adequate premises shall be provided for messing. Collective disciplinary measures affecting food are prohibited. Article 27. Clothing. Clothing, underwear and footwear shall be supplied to prisoners of war in sufficient quantities by the detaining power, which shall make allowance for the climate of the region where the prisoners are detained. Uniforms of enemy armed forces captured by the detaining power should, if suitable for the climate, be made available to clothe prisoners of war. The regular replacement and repair of the above articles shall be assured by the detaining power. In addition, prisoners of war who work shall receive appropriate clothing wherever the nature of the work demands. Article 28. Canteens. Canteens shall be installed in all camps where prisoners of war may procure foodstuffs, soap, and tobacco, and ordinary articles in daily use. The tariff shall never be in excess of local market prices. The profits made by camp canteens shall be used for the benefit of the prisoners. A special fund shall be created for this purpose. The prisoner's representative shall have the right to collaborate in the management of the canteen and of this fund. When a camp is closed down, the credit balance of the special fund shall be handed to an international welfare organization to be employed for the benefit of prisoners of war of the same nationality as those who have contributed to the fund. In case of a general repatriation, such profits shall be kept by the detaining power subject to any agreement to the contrary between the powers concerned. Chapter 3. Hygiene and Medical Attention Article 29. Hygiene The detaining power shall be bound to take all sanitary measures necessary to ensure the cleanliness and healthfulness of camps and to prevent epidemics. 
prisoners of war shall have for their use, day and night, conveniences which conform to the rules of hygiene and are maintained in a constant state of cleanliness. In any camps in which women prisoners of war are accommodated, separate conveniences shall be provided for them. Also, apart from the baths and showers with which the camps shall be furnished, prisoners of war shall be provided with sufficient water and soap for their personal toilet and for washing their personal laundry. The necessary installations, facilities and time shall be granted them for that purpose. Article 30. Medical Attention. Every camp shall have an adequate infirmary where prisoners of war may have the attention they require, as well as appropriate diet. Isolation wards shall, if necessary, be set aside for cases of contagious or mental disease. Prisoners of war suffering from serious disease or whose condition necessitates special treatment, a surgical operation or hospital care, must be admitted to any military or civilian medical unit where such treatment can be given, even if their repatriation is contemplated in the near future. Special facilities shall be afforded for the care to be given to the disabled, in particular to the blind, and for their rehabilitation pending repatriation. Prisoners of war shall have the attention, preferably, of medical personnel of the power on which they depend, and, if possible, of their nationality. Prisoners of war may not be prevented from presenting themselves to the medical authorities for examination. The detaining authorities shall, upon request, issue to every prisoner who has undergone treatment an official certificate indicating the nature of his illness or injury and the duration and kind of treatment received. A duplicate of this certificate shall be forwarded to the Central Prisoners of War Agency. The costs of treatment, including those of any apparatus necessary for the maintenance of prisoners of war in good health, particularly dentures and other artificial appliances and spectacles, shall be borne by the detaining power. Article 31. Medical Inspections. Medical inspections of prisoners of war shall be held at least once a month. They shall include the checking and the recording of the weight of each prisoner of war. Their purpose shall be in particular to supervise the general state of health, nutrition and cleanliness of prisoners, and to detect contagious diseases, especially tuberculosis, malaria and venereal disease. For this purpose the most efficient methods available shall be employed, e.g. periodic mass miniature radiography for the early detection of tuberculosis. Article 32 Prisoners Engaged on Medical Duties Prisoners of war who, though not attached to the medical service of their armed forces, are physicians, surgeons, dentists, nurses or medical orderlies, may be required by the detaining power to exercise their medical functions in the interests of prisoners of war dependent on the same power. In that case they shall continue to be prisoners of war, but shall receive the same treatment as corresponding medical personnel retained by the detaining power. They shall be exempted from any other work under Article 49. Chapter 4. Medical Personnel and Chaplains Retained to Assist Prisoners of War. Article 33. Rights and Privileges of Detained Personnel. Members of the medical personnel and chaplains, while retained by the detaining power with a view of assisting prisoners of war, shall not be considered as prisoners of war. They shall, however, receive as a minimum the benefits and protection of the present convention, and shall also be granted all facilities necessary to provide for the medical care of and religious ministration to prisoners of war. They shall continue to exercise their medical and spiritual functions for the benefit of prisoners of war, preferably those belonging to the armed forces upon which they depend, within the scope of the military laws and regulations of the detaining power, and under the control of its competent services, in accordance with their professional etiquette. They shall also benefit by the following facilities in the exercise of their medical or spiritual functions. A they shall be authorized to visit periodically prisoners of war situated in working detachments or in hospitals outside the camp. 
For this purpose, the detaining power shall place at their disposal the necessary means of transport. B. The senior medical officer in each camp shall be responsible to the camp military authorities for everything connected with the activities of retained medical personnel. For this purpose, parties to the conflict shall agree at the outbreak of hostilities on the subject of the corresponding ranks of the medical personnel, including that of societies mentioned in Article 26 of the Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field of August 12, 1949. This senior medical officer, as well as chaplains, shall have the right to deal with the competent authorities of the camp on all questions relating to their duties. Such authorities shall afford them all necessary facilities for correspondence relating to these questions. C. Although they shall be subject to the internal discipline of the camp in which they are retained, such personnel may not be compelled to carry out any work other than that concerned with their medical or religious duties. During hostilities, the parties to the conflict shall agree concerning the possible relief of retained personnel, and shall settle the procedure to be followed. None of the preceding provisions shall relieve the detaining power of its obligations with regard to prisoners of war from the medical or spiritual point of view. Chapter 5. Religious, Intellectual, and Physical Activities Article 34. Religious Duties Prisoners of war shall enjoy complete latitude in the exercise of their religious duties, including attendance at the service of their faith, on condition that they comply with the disciplinary routine prescribed by the military authorities. Adequate premises shall be provided where religious services may be held. Article 35. Retained Chaplains. Chaplains who fall into the hands of the enemy power, and who remain or are retained with a view to assisting prisoners of war, shall be allowed to minister to them, and to exercise freely their ministry amongst prisoners of war of the same religion, in accordance with their religious conscience. They shall be allocated among the various camps and labor detachments containing prisoners of war belonging to the same forces, speaking the same language, or practicing the same religion. They shall enjoy the necessary facilities, including the means of transport provided for in Article 33, for visiting the prisoners of war outside their camp. They shall be free to correspond, subject to censorship, on matters concerning their religious duties with the ecclesiastical authorities in the country of detention and with international religious organizations. Letters and cards which they may send for this purpose shall be in addition to the quota provided for in Article 71. Article 36. Prisoners who are ministers of religion. Prisoners of war who are ministers of religion, without having officiated as chaplains to their own forces, shall be at liberty, whatever their denomination, to minister freely to the members of their community. For this purpose, they shall receive the same treatment as the chaplains retained by the detaining power. They shall not be obliged to do any other work. Article 37. Prisoners without the minister of their religion. When prisoners of war have not the assistance of a retained chaplain or of a prisoner of war minister of their faith, a minister belonging to the prisoners or a similar denomination, or in his absence a qualified layman, if such a course is feasible from a confessional point of view, shall be appointed, at the request of the prisoners concerned, to fill this office. This appointment, subject to the approval of the detaining power, shall take place with the agreement of the community of prisoners concerned, and, wherever necessary, with the approval of the local religious authorities of the same faith. The person thus appointed shall comply with all regulations established by the detaining power in the interests of discipline and military security. Article 38 recreation, study, sports, and games. While respecting the individual preferences of every prisoner, the detaining power shall encourage the practice of intellectual, educational, and recreational pursuits, sports, and games amongst prisoners, 
and shall take the measures necessary to ensure the exercise thereof by providing them with adequate premises and necessary equipment. Prisoners shall have opportunities for taking physical exercise, including sports and games, and for being out of doors. Sufficient open spaces shall be provided for this purpose in all camps. Chapter 6. Discipline. Article 39. Administration. Saluting. Every prisoner of war camp shall be put under the immediate authority of a responsible commissioned officer belonging to the regular armed forces of the detaining power. Such officer shall have in his possession a copy of the present convention. He shall ensure that its provisions are known to the camp staff and the guard, and shall be responsible, under the direction of his government, for its application. Prisoners of war, with the exception of officers, must salute and show to all officers of the detaining power the external marks of respect provided for by the regulations applying in their own forces. Officer prisoners of war are bound to salute only officers of a higher rank of the detaining power. They must, however, salute the camp commander, regardless of his rank. Article 40. Badges and Decorations. The wearing of badges of rank and nationality, as well as of decorations, shall be permitted. Article 41. Posting of the Convention and of Regulations and Orders Concerning Prisoners. In every camp, the text of the present Convention and its annexes and the contents of any special agreement provided for in Article 6 shall be posted, in the prisoner's own language, at places where all may read them. Copies shall be supplied on request to the prisoners who cannot have access to the copy which has been posted. Regulations, orders, notices, and publications of every kind relating to the conduct of prisoners of war shall be issued to them in a language which they understand. Such regulations, orders, and publications shall be posted in the manner described above, and copies shall be handed to the prisoner's representative. Every order and command addressed to prisoners of war individually must likewise be given in a language which they understand. Article 42. Use of Weapons. The use of weapons against prisoners of war, especially against those who are escaping or attempting to escape, shall constitute an extreme measure which shall always be preceded by warnings appropriate to the circumstances. Chapter 7. Rank of Prisoners of War. Article 43. Notification of Ranks. Upon the outbreak of hostilities, the parties to the conflict shall communicate to one another the titles and ranks of all the persons mentioned in Article 4 of the present Convention, in order to ensure equality of treatment between prisoners of equivalent rank. Titles and ranks which are subsequently created shall form the subject of similar communications. The detaining power shall recognize promotions in rank which have been accorded to prisoners of war, and which have been duly notified by the power on which these prisoners depend. Article 40. Treatment of Officers. Officers and prisoners of equivalent status shall be treated with the regard due to their rank and age. In order to ensure service in officers' camps, other ranks of the same armed forces who, as far as possible, speak the same language, shall be assigned in sufficient numbers, account being taken of the rank of officers and prisoners of equivalent status. Such orderlies shall not be required to perform any other work. Supervision of the mess by the officers themselves shall be facilitated in every way. Article 45 Treatment of other prisoners. Prisoners of war other than officers and prisoners of equivalent status shall be treated with regard due to their rank and age. Supervision of the mess by the prisoners themselves shall be facilitated in every way. Chapter 8. Transfer of prisoners of war after their arrival in camp. Article 46. Conditions. 
The detaining power, when deciding upon the transfer of prisoners of war, shall take into account the interests of the prisoners themselves, more especially so as not to increase the difficulty of their repatriation. The transfer of prisoners of war shall always be effected humanely, and in conditions not less favorable than those under which the forces of the detaining power are transferred. Account shall always be taken of the climatic conditions to which the prisoners of war are accustomed, and the conditions of transfer shall in no case be prejudicial to their health. The detaining power shall supply prisoners of war during transfer with sufficient food and drinking water to keep them in good health, likewise with the necessary clothing, shelter, and medical attention. The detaining power shall take adequate precautions, especially in case of transport by sea or by air, to ensure their safety during transfer, and shall draw up a complete list of all transferred prisoners before their departure. Article 47. Circumstances Precluding Transfer Sick or wounded prisoners of war shall not be transferred as long as their recovery may be endangered by the journey, unless their safety imperatively demands it. If the combat zone draws closer to a camp, the prisoners of war in the said camp shall not be transferred unless their transfer can be carried out in adequate conditions of safety, or if they are exposed to greater risks by remaining on the spot than by being transferred. Article 48. Procedure for Transfer. In the event of transfer, prisoners of war shall be officially advised of their departure and of their new postal address. Such notifications shall be given in time for them to pack their luggage and inform their next of kin. They shall be allowed to take with them their personal effects and the correspondence and parcels which have arrived for them. The weight of such baggage may be limited, if the conditions of transfer so require, to what each prisoner can reasonably carry, which shall in no case be more than 25 kilograms per head. Mail and parcels addressed to their former camp shall be forwarded to them without delay. The camp commander shall take in agreement with the prisoner's representative, any measures needed to ensure the transport of the prisoner's community property and of the luggage they are unable to take with them in consequence of restrictions imposed by virtue of the second paragraph of this article. The costs of transfer shall be borne by the detaining power. End of section 12《Geneva Conventions》August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Will Thompson, Franklin, Pennsylvania. Part 3 Captivity. Section 3 Labor of Prisoners of War. Article 49. The detaining power may utilize the labor of prisoners of war who are physically fit, taking into account their age, sex, rank, and physical aptitude, and with a view particularly to maintaining them in a good state of physical and mental health. Non-commissioned officers who are prisoners of war shall only be required to do supervisory work. Those not so required may ask for other suitable work which shall, so far as possible, be found for them. If officers or persons of equivalent status ask for suitable work, it shall be found for them, so far as possible, but they may in no circumstances be compelled to work. Article 50. Besides work connected with camp administration, installation, or maintenance, Prisoners of war may be compelled to do only such work as is included in the following classes. A. Agriculture. B. Industries connected with the production or extraction of raw materials, and manufacturing industries, with the exception of metallurgical, machinery, and chemical industries, public works and building operations which have no military character or purpose. C. Transport and handling of stores which are not military in character or purpose. D. Commercial business and arts and crafts. E. Domestic service. F. 
public utility services having no military character or purpose. Should the above provisions be infringed, prisoners of war shall be allowed to exercise their right of complaint in conformity with Article 78. Article 51. Prisoners of war must be granted suitable working conditions, especially as regards accommodation, food, clothing, and equipment. Such conditions shall not be inferior to those enjoyed by nationals of the detaining power employed in similar work. Account shall also be taken of climatic conditions. The detaining power, in utilizing the labor of prisoners of war, shall ensure that in areas in which prisoners are employed, the national legislation concerning the protection of labor and, more particularly, the regulations for the safety of workers are duly applied. Prisoners of war shall receive training and be provided with the means of protection suitable to the work they will have to do and similar to those accorded to the nationals of the detaining power. Subject to the provisions of Article 52, prisoners may be submitted to the normal risks run by these civilian workers. Conditions of labor shall in no case be rendered more arduous by disciplinary measures. Article 52. Unless he be a volunteer, no prisoner of war may be employed on labor which is of an unhealthy or dangerous nature. No prisoner of war shall be assigned to labor which would be looked upon as humiliating for a member of the detaining power's own forces. The removal of mines or similar devices shall be considered as dangerous labor. Article 53. The duration of the daily labor of prisoners of war, including the time of the journey to and from, shall not be excessive, and must in no case exceed that permitted for civilian workers in the district, who are nationals of the detaining power and employed on the same work. Prisoners of war must be allowed, in the middle of the day's work, a rest of not less than one hour. This rest will be the same as that to which workers of the detaining power are entitled, if the latter is of longer duration. They shall be allowed, in addition, a rest of 24 consecutive hours every week, preferably on Sunday, or the day of rest in their country of origin. Furthermore, every prisoner who has worked for one year shall be granted a rest of eight consecutive days, during which his working pay shall be paid him. If methods of labor such as piecework are employed, the length of the working period shall not be rendered excessive thereby. Article 54. The working pay due to prisoners of war shall be fixed in accordance with the provisions of Article 62 of the present Convention. Prisoners of war who sustain accidents in connection with work, or who contract a disease in the course or in consequence of their work, shall receive all the care their condition may require. The detaining power shall furthermore deliver to such prisoners of war a medical certificate enabling them to submit their claims to the power on which they depend and shall send a duplicate to the Central Prisoners of War Agency provided for in Article 123. Article 55. The fitness of prisoners of war for work shall be periodically verified by medical examinations at least once a month. The examinations shall have particular regard to the nature of the work which prisoners of war are required to do. If any prisoner of war considers himself incapable of working, he shall be permitted to appear before the medical authorities of his camp. Physicians or surgeons may recommend that the prisoners who are, in their opinion, unfit for work, be exempted therefrom. Article 56. The organization and administration of labor detachments shall be similar to those of prisoner of war camps, and administratively part of a prisoner of war camp. The military authorities and the commander of the said camp shall be responsible under the direction of their government, for the observance of the provisions of the present convention in labor detachments. The camp commander shall keep an up-to-date record of the labor detachments dependent on his camp, and shall communicate it to the delegates of the protecting power, of the International Committee of the Red Cross, or of the other agencies giving relief to prisoners of war who may visit the camp. Article 57. The treatment of prisoners of war who work for private persons even if the latter are responsible for guarding and protecting them, shall not be inferior to that which is provided for by the present convention. The detaining power, the military authorities, and the commander of the camp to which such prisoners belong shall be entirely responsible for the maintenance, care, treatment, and payment of the working pay of such prisoners of war.
Such prisoners of war shall have the right to remain in communication with the prisoner's representative in the camps on which they depend. Section 4. Financial Resources of Prisoners of War Article 58. Upon the outbreak of hostilities, and pending an arrangement on this matter with the protecting power, the detaining power may determine the maximum amount of money in cash or in any similar form that prisoners may have in their possession. Any amount in excess, which was properly in their possession and which has been taken or withheld from them, shall be placed to their account, together with any monies deposited by them, and shall not be converted into any other currency without their consent. If prisoners of war are permitted to purchase services or commodities outside the camp against payment in cash, such payments shall be made by the prisoner himself or by the camp administration who will charge them to the accounts of the prisoners concerned. The detaining power will establish the necessary rules in this respect. Article 59. Cash which was taken from prisoners of war, in accordance with Article 18, at the time of their capture, and which is in the currency of the detaining power, shall be placed on their separate accounts, in accordance with the provisions of Article 64 of the present section. The amounts in the currency of the detaining power, due to the conversion of sums and other currencies that are taken from the prisoners of war at the same time, shall also be credited to their separate accounts. Article 60. The detaining power shall grant all prisoners of war a monthly advance of pay, the amount of which shall be fixed by conversion into the currency of the said power, of the following amounts. Category 1. Prisoners ranking below sergeants, 8 Swiss francs. Category 2. Sergeants and other non-commissioned officers or prisoners of equivalent rank, 12 Swiss francs. Category 3. Warrant officers and commissioned officers below the rank of major or prisoners of equivalent rank, 50 Swiss francs. Category 4. Majors, lieutenant colonels, colonels, or prisoners of equivalent rank. 60 Swiss francs. Category 5. General officers or prisoners of war of equivalent rank. 75 Swiss francs. However, the parties to the conflict concerned may by special agreement modify the amount of advances of pay due to prisoners of the preceding categories. Furthermore, if the amounts indicated in the first paragraph above would be unduly high compared with the pay of the detaining powers armed forces or would, for any reason, seriously embarrass the detaining power. Then, pending the conclusion of a special agreement with the power on which the prisoners depend to vary the amounts indicated above, the detaining power, a, shall continue to credit the accounts of the prisoners with the amounts indicated in the first paragraph above, b, may temporarily limit the amount made available from these advances of pay to prisoners of war for their own use, to sums which are reasonable, but which, for Category 1, shall never be inferior to the amount that the detaining power gives to the members of its own armed forces. The reasons for any limitations will be given without delay to the protecting power. Article 61. The detaining power shall accept for distribution as supplementary pay to prisoners of war sums which the power on which the prisoners depend may forward to them, on condition that the sums to be paid shall be the same for each prisoner of the same category shall be payable to all prisoners of that category depending on that power, and shall be placed in their separate accounts, at the earliest opportunity, in accordance with the provisions of Article 64. Such supplementary pay shall not relieve the detaining power of any obligation under this convention. Article 62. Prisoners of war shall be paid a fair working rate of pay by the detaining authorities direct. The rate shall be fixed by the said authorities, but shall at no time be less than one-fourth of one Swiss franc for a full working day. The detaining power shall inform prisoners of war, as well as the power on which they depend, through the intermediary of the protecting power, of the rate of daily working pay that it has fixed. Working pay shall likewise be paid by the detaining authorities to prisoners of war permanently detailed to duties, or to a skilled or semi-skilled occupation in connection with the administration, installation, or maintenance of camps, and to the prisoners who are required to carry out spiritual or medical duties on behalf of their comrades. The working pay of the prisoner's representative, of his advisers, if any, and of his assistants, 
shall be paid out of the fund maintained by canteen profits. The scale of this working pay shall be fixed by the prisoner's representative and approved by the camp commander. If there is no such fund, the detaining authorities shall pay these prisoners a fair working rate of pay. Article 63. Prisoners of war shall be permitted to receive remittances of money addressed to them individually or collectively. Every prisoner of war shall have at his disposal the credit balance of his account as provided for in the following article, within the limits fixed by the detaining power, which shall make such payments as are requested, subject to financial or monetary restrictions which the detaining power regards as essential. Prisoners of war may also have payments made abroad. In this case, payments addressed by prisoners of war to dependents shall be given priority. In any event, and subject to the consent of the power on which they depend, prisoners may have payments made in their own country as follows. The detaining power shall send to the aforesaid power, through the protecting power, a notification giving all the necessary particulars concerning the prisoners of war, the beneficiaries of the payments, and the amount of the sums to be paid expressed in the detaining power's currency. The said notification shall be signed by the prisoners and countersigned by the camp commander. The detaining power shall debit the prisoner's account by a corresponding amount. The sums thus debited shall be placed by it to the credit of the power on which the prisoners depend. To apply the foregoing provisions, the detaining power may usefully consult the model regulations in Annex 5 of the present convention. Article 64. The detaining power shall hold an account for each prisoner of war, showing at least the following. 1. The amounts due to the prisoner or received by him as advances of pay, as working pay, or derived from any other source, the sums in the currency of the detaining power which were taken from him, the sums taken from him and converted at his request into the currency of the said power. 2. The payments made to the prisoner in cash or in any other similar form. The payments made on his behalf and at his request. The sums transferred under Article 63, third paragraph. Article 65. Every item entered in the account of a prisoner of war shall be countersigned or initialed by him or by the prisoner's representative acting on his behalf. Prisoners of war shall at all times be afforded reasonable facilities for consulting and obtaining copies of their accounts, which may likewise be inspected by the representatives of the protecting powers at the time of visits to the camp. When prisoners of war are transferred from one camp to another, their personal accounts will follow them. In case of transfer from one detaining power to another, the monies which are their property and which are not in the currency of the detaining power will follow them. They shall be given certificates for any other monies standing to the credit of their accounts. The parties to the conflict concerned may agree to notify to each other at specific intervals through the protecting power the amount of the accounts of the prisoners of war. Article 66. On the termination of captivity, through the release of a prisoner of war or his repatriation, the detaining power shall give him a statement, signed by an authorized officer of that power, showing the credit balance then due to him. The detaining power shall also send through the protecting power to the government upon which the prisoner of war depends, lists giving all appropriate particulars of all prisoners of war whose captivity has been terminated by repatriation, release, escape, death, or any other means, and showing the amount of their credit balances. Such lists shall be certified on each sheet by an authorized representative of the detaining power. Any of the above provisions of this article may be varied by mutual agreement between any two parties to the conflict. The power on which the prisoner of war depends shall be responsible for settling with him any credit balance due to him from the detaining power on the termination of his captivity. Article 67. Advances of pay, issued to prisoners of war in conformity with Article 60, shall be considered as made on behalf of the power on which they depend. Such advances of pay, as well as all payments made by the said power under Article 63, third paragraph, and Article 68, shall form the subject of arrangements between the two powers concerned at the close of hostilities. Article 68. Any claim by a prisoner of war for compensation in respect of any injury or other disability arising out of work shall be referred to the power on which he depends, through the protecting power. 
In accordance with Article 54, the detaining power will, in all cases, provide the prisoner of war concerned with a statement showing the nature of the injury or disability, the circumstances in which it arose, and particulars of medical or hospital treatment given for it. This statement will be signed by a responsible officer of the detaining power, and the medical particulars certified by a medical officer. Any claim by a prisoner of war for compensation in respect of personal effects, monies, or valuables impounded by the detaining power under Article 18, and not forthcoming on his repatriation, or in respect of loss alleged to be due to the fault of the detaining power or any of its servants, shall likewise be referred to the power on which he depends. Nevertheless, any such personal effects required for use by the prisoners of war whilst in captivity shall be replaced at the expense of the detaining power. The detaining power will, in all cases, provide the prisoner of war with a statement, signed by a responsible officer, showing all available information regarding the reasons why such effects, monies, or valuables have not been restored to him. A copy of this statement will be forwarded to the power on which he depends through the Central Prisoners of War Agency provided for in Article 123. End of Section 13section 14 of geneva conventions august 1949 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by will thompson franklin pennsylvania part 3 captivity section 5 Relations of Prisoners of War with the Exterior Article 69 Immediately upon prisoners of war falling into its power, the detaining power shall inform them and the powers on which they depend, through the protecting power, of the measures taken to carry out the provisions of the present section. They shall likewise inform the parties concerned of any subsequent modifications of such measures. Article 70 Immediately upon capture, or not more than one week after arrival at a camp, even if it is a transit camp, likewise in case of sickness or transfer to hospital or another camp, every prisoner of war shall be enabled to write direct to his family, on the one hand, and to the Central Prisoners of War Agency provided for in Article 123, on the other hand, a card similar, if possible, to the model annexed to the present convention, informing his relatives of his capture, address, and state of health. The said cards shall be forwarded as rapidly as possible and may not be delayed in any manner. Article 71. Prisoners of war shall be allowed to send and receive letters and cards. If the detaining power deems it necessary to limit the number of letters and cards sent by each prisoner of war, the said number shall not be less than two letters and four cards monthly exclusive of the capture cards provided for in Article 70, and conforming as closely as possible to the models annexed to the present convention. Further limitations may be imposed only if the protecting power is satisfied that it would be in the interests of the prisoners of war concerned to do so, owing to difficulties of translation caused by the detaining power's inability to find sufficient qualified linguists to carry out the necessary censorship. If limitations must be placed on the correspondence addressed to prisoners of war, they may be ordered only by the power on which the prisoners depend, possibly at the request of the detaining power. Such letters and cards must be conveyed by the most rapid method at the disposal of the detaining power. They may not be delayed or retained for disciplinary reasons. Prisoners of war who have been without news for a long period or who are unable to receive news from their next of kin, or to give them news by the ordinary postal route, as well as those who are at a great distance from their homes, shall be permitted to send telegrams, the fees being charged against the prisoners of war's accounts with the detaining power, or paid in the currency at their disposal. They shall likewise benefit by this measure in cases of urgency. As a general rule, the correspondence of prisoners of war shall be written in their native language. The parties to the conflict may allow correspondence in other languages. Sacks containing prisoner of war mail must be securely sealed and labeled so as clearly to indicate their contents, and must be addressed to offices of destination. 
Article 72. Prisoners of war shall be allowed to receive by post or by any other means individual parcels or collective shipments containing, in particular, foodstuffs, clothing, medical supplies, and articles of a religious, educational, or recreational character which may meet their needs, including books, devotional articles, scientific equipment, examination papers, musical instruments, sports outfits, and materials allowing prisoners of war to pursue their studies or their cultural activities. Such shipments shall in no way free the detaining power from the obligations imposed on it by virtue of the present convention. The only limits which may be placed on these shipments shall be those proposed by the protecting power in the interest of the prisoners themselves, or by the International Committee of the Red Cross or any other organization giving assistance to the prisoners in respect of their own shipments only on account of exceptional strain on transport or communications. The conditions for the sending of individual parcels and collective relief shall, if necessary, be the subject of special agreements between the powers concerned, which may in no case delay the receipt by the prisoners of relief supplies. Books may not be included in parcels of clothing and foodstuffs. Medical supplies shall, as a rule, be sent in collective parcels. Article 73. In the absence of special agreements between the powers concerned on the conditions for the receipt and distribution of collective relief shipments, the rules and regulations concerning collective shipments, which are annexed to the present convention, shall be applied. The special agreements referred to above shall in no case restrict the right of prisoners' representatives to take possession of collective relief shipments intended for prisoners of war, to proceed to their distribution, or to dispose of them in the interest of the prisoners nor shall such agreements restrict the right of representatives of the protecting power, the International Committee of the Red Cross, or any other organization giving assistance to prisoners of war and responsible for the forwarding of collective shipments to supervise their distribution to the recipients. Article 74. All relief shipments for prisoners of war shall be exempt from import, customs, and other dues. Correspondence, relief shipments, and authorized remittances of money addressed to prisoners of war or dispatched by them through the post office, either direct or through the information bureau provided for in Article 122 and the Central Prisoners of War Agency provided for in Article 123, shall be exempt from any postal dues, both in the countries of origin and destination, and in intermediate countries. If relief shipments intended for prisoners of war cannot be sent through the post office by reason of weight or for any other cause, the cost of transportation shall be borne by the detaining power in all the territories under its control. The other powers party to the convention shall bear the cost of transport in their respective territories. In the absence of special agreements between the parties concerned, the costs connected with transport of such shipments, other than costs covered by the above exemption, shall be charged to the senders. The high contracting parties shall endeavor to reduce, so far as possible, the rates charged for telegrams sent by prisoners of war or addressed to them. Article 75. Should military operations prevent the powers concerned from fulfilling their obligation to assure the transport of the shipments referred to in Articles 70, 71, 72, and 77, the protecting powers concerned, the International Committee of the Red Cross, or any other organization duly approved by the parties to the conflict, may undertake to ensure the conveyance of such shipments by suitable means, railway wagons, motor vehicles, vessels or aircraft, etc. For this purpose, the high contracting parties shall endeavor to supply them with such transport, and to allow its circulation, especially by granting the necessary safe conducts. Such transport may also be used to convey a. Correspondence, lists, and reports exchanged between the Central Information Agency referred to in Article 123 and the National Bureau referred to in Article 122. b. Correspondence and reports relating to prisoners of war which the protecting power, the International Committee of the Red Cross, or any other body assisting the prisoners, exchange either with their own delegates or with the parties to the conflict. These provisions in no way detract from the right of any party to the conflict to arrange other means of transport, if it should so prefer, 
nor preclude the granting of safe conducts under mutually agreed conditions to such means of transport. In the absence of special agreements, the costs occasioned by the use of such means of transport shall be borne proportionally by the parties to the conflict whose nationals are benefited thereby. Article 76. The censoring of correspondence addressed to prisoners of war or dispatched by them shall be done as quickly as possible. Mail shall be censored only by the dispatching state and the receiving state, and once only by each. The examination of consignments intended for prisoners of war shall not be carried out under conditions that will expose the goods contained in them to deterioration, except in the case of written or printed matter. It shall be done in the presence of the addressee, or of a fellow prisoner duly delegated by him. The delivery to prisoners of individual or collective consignments shall not be delayed under the pretext of difficulties of censorship. Any prohibition of correspondence ordered by parties to the conflict, either for military or political reasons, shall be only temporary, and its duration shall be as short as possible. Article 77. The detaining power shall provide all facilities for the transmission, through the protecting power or the central prisoners of war agency provided for in Article 123, of instruments, papers, or documents, intended for prisoners of war or dispatched by them, especially powers of attorney and wills. In all cases, they shall facilitate the preparation and execution of such documents on behalf of prisoners of war. In particular, they shall allow them to consult a lawyer and shall take what measures are necessary for the authentication of their signatures. End of section 14. Section 15 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Will Thompson, Franklin, Pennsylvania. Part 3. Captivity. Section 6. Relations between prisoners of war and the authorities. Chapter 1. Complaints of prisoners of war, respecting the conditions of captivity. Article 78. Prisoners of war shall have the right to make known to the military authorities in whose power they are, their requests regarding the conditions of captivity to which they are subjected. They shall also have the unrestricted right to apply to the representatives of the protecting powers either through their prisoner's representative or, if they consider it necessary, direct, in order to draw their attention to any points on which they may have complaints to make regarding their conditions of captivity. These requests and complaints shall not be limited nor considered to be a part of the correspondence quota referred to in Article 71. They must be transmitted immediately. Even if they are recognized to be unfounded, they may not give rise to any punishment. Prisoners' representatives may send periodic reports on the situation in the camps and the needs of the prisoners of war to the representatives of the protecting powers. Chapter 2 Prisoner of War Representatives Article 79 In all places where there are prisoners of war, except in those where there are officers, the prisoners shall freely elect by secret ballot every six months, and also in case of vacancies, prisoners' representatives entrusted with representing them before the military authorities, the protecting powers, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and any other organization which may assist them. These prisoners' representatives shall be eligible for re-election. In camps for officers and persons of equivalent status, or in mixed camps, the senior officer among the prisoners of war shall be recognized as the camp prisoner's representative. In camps for officers, he shall be assisted by one or more advisers chosen by the officers. In mixed camps, his assistance shall be chosen from among the prisoners of war who are not officers and shall be elected by them. Officer prisoners of war of the same nationality shall be stationed in labor camps for prisoners of war for the purpose of carrying out the camp administration duties for which the prisoners of war are responsible. These officers may be elected as prisoners' representatives under the first paragraph of this article. 
In such a case, the assistants to the prisoners' representatives shall be chosen from among those prisoners of war who are not officers. Every representative elected must be approved by the detaining power before he has the right to commence his duties. Where the detaining power refuses to approve a prisoner of war elected by his fellow prisoners of war, it must inform the protecting power of the reason for such refusal. In all cases, the prisoner's representative must have the same nationality, language, and customs as the prisoners of war whom he represents. Thus, prisoners of war distributed in different sections of a camp, according to their nationality, language, or customs, shall have for each section their own prisoner's representative, in accordance with the foregoing paragraphs. Article 80. Prisoner's representatives shall further the physical, spiritual, and intellectual well-being of prisoners of war. In particular, where the prisoners decide to organize amongst themselves a system of mutual assistance, this organization will be within the province of the prisoner's representative, in addition to the special duties entrusted to him by other provisions of the present convention. Prisoners' representatives shall not be held responsible, simply by reason of their duties, for any offenses committed by prisoners of war. Article 81. Prisoners' representatives shall not be required to perform any other work if the accomplishment of their duties is thereby made more difficult. Prisoners' representatives may appoint from amongst the prisoners such assistance as they require. All material facilities shall be granted them, particularly a certain freedom of movement necessary for the accomplishment of their duties, inspection of labor detachments, receipt of supplies, etc., Prisoners' representatives shall be permitted to visit premises where prisoners of war are detained, and every prisoner of war shall have the right to consult freely his prisoner's representative. All facilities shall likewise be accorded to the prisoner's representatives for communication by post and telegraph with the detaining authorities, the protecting powers, the International Committee of the Red Cross and their delegates, the mixed medical commissions, and with the bodies which give assistance to prisoners of war. Prisoners' representatives of labor detachments shall enjoy the same facilities for communication with the prisoners' representatives of the principal camp. Such communications shall not be restricted, nor considered as forming a part of the quota mentioned in Article 71. Prisoners' representatives who are transferred shall be allowed a reasonable time to acquaint their successors with current affairs. In case of dismissal, the reasons therefore shall be communicated to the protecting power. Chapter 3. Penal and Disciplinary Sanctions 1. General Provisions Article 82. A prisoner of war shall be subject to the laws, regulations, and orders in force in the armed forces of the detaining power. The detaining power shall be justified in taking judicial or disciplinary measures in respect of any offense committed by a prisoner of war against such laws, regulations, or orders. However, no proceedings or punishments contrary to the provisions of this chapter shall be allowed. If any law, regulation, or order of the detaining power shall declare acts committed by a prisoner of war to be punishable, whereas the same acts would not be punishable if committed by a member of the forces of the detaining power, such acts shall entail disciplinary punishments only. Article 83 in deciding whether proceedings in respect of an offense alleged to have been committed by a prisoner of war shall be judicial or disciplinary, the detaining power shall ensure that the competent authorities exercise the greatest leniency and adopt, wherever possible, disciplinary rather than judicial measures. Article 84. A prisoner of war shall be tried only by a military court unless the existing laws of the detaining power expressly permit the civil courts to try a member of the armed forces of the detaining power in respect of the particular offense alleged to have been committed by the prisoner of war. In no circumstances whatever shall a prisoner of war be tried by a court of any kind which does not offer the essential guarantees of independence and impartiality as generally recognized and, in particular, the procedure of which does not afford the accused the rights and means of defense provided for in Article 105. Article 85. Prisoners of war prosecuted under the laws of the detaining power for acts committed prior to capture shall retain, even if convicted, 
The Benefits of the Present Convention Article 86 No prisoner of war may be punished more than once for the same act, or on the same charge. Article 87 Prisoners of war may not be sentenced by the military authorities and courts of the detaining power to any penalties except those provided for in respect of members of the armed forces of the said power who have committed the same acts. When fixing the penalty, the courts or authorities of the detaining power shall take into consideration, to the widest extent possible, the fact that the accused, not being a national of the detaining power, is not bound to it by any duty of allegiance, and that he is in its power as the result of circumstances independent of his own will. The said courts or authorities shall be at liberty to reduce the penalty provided for the violation of which the prisoner of war is accused, and shall therefore not be bound to apply the minimum penalty prescribed. Collective punishment for individual acts, corporal punishment, imprisonment in premises without daylight, and, in general, any form of torture or cruelty, are forbidden. No prisoner of war may be deprived of his rank by the detaining power, or prevented from wearing his badges. Article 88. Officers, non-commissioned officers, and men, who are prisoners of war undergoing a disciplinary or judicial punishment, shall not be subjected to more severe treatment than that applied in respect of the same punishment to members of the armed forces of the detaining power of equivalent rank. A woman prisoner of war shall not be awarded or sentenced to a punishment more severe than that applied in respect of the same punishment than a woman member of the armed forces of the detaining power dealt with for a similar offense. In no case may a woman prisoner of war be awarded or sentenced to a punishment more severe or treated whilst undergoing punishment more severely than a woman member of the armed forces of the detaining power dealt with for a similar offense. Prisoners of war who have served disciplinary or judicial sentences may not be treated differently from other prisoners of war. 2. Disciplinary Sanctions Article 89 The disciplinary punishments applicable to prisoners of war are the following. 1. A fine which shall not exceed 50% of the advances of pay and working pay which the prisoner of war would otherwise receive under the provisions of Articles 60 and 62 during a period of not more than 30 days. 2. Discontinuance of privileges granted over and above the treatment provided for by the present convention. 3. Fatigue duties not exceeding two hours daily. 4. Confinement. The punishment referred to under 3 shall not be applied to officers. In no case shall disciplinary punishments be inhuman, brutal, or dangerous to the health of prisoners of war. Article 90. The duration of any single punishment shall in no case exceed 30 days. Any period of confinement awaiting the hearing of a disciplinary offense or the award of disciplinary punishment shall be deducted from an award pronounced against a prisoner of war. The maximum of 30 days provided above may not be exceeded, even if the prisoner of war is answerable for several acts at the same time when he is awarded punishment, whether such acts are related or not. The period between the pronouncing of an award of disciplinary punishment and its execution shall not exceed one month. When a prisoner of war is awarded a further disciplinary punishment, a period of at least three days shall elapse between the execution of any two of the punishments, if the duration of one of these is ten days or more. Article 91. The escape of a prisoner of war shall be deemed to have succeeded when 1. He has joined the armed forces of the power on which he depends, or those of an allied power. 2. He has left the territory under the control of the detaining power, or of an ally of the said power. 3. He has joined a ship flying the flag of the power on which he depends, or of an allied power, in the territorial waters of the detaining power the said ship not being under control of the last-named power. Prisoners of war who have made good their escape in the sense of this article and who are recaptured shall not be liable to any punishment in respect of their previous escape. Article 92. A prisoner of war who attempts to escape and is recaptured before having made good his escape in the sense of Article 91 
shall be liable only to a disciplinary punishment in respect of this act, even if it is a repeated offense. A prisoner of war who is recaptured shall be handed over without delay to the competent military authority. Article 88, fourth paragraph notwithstanding, prisoners of war punished as a result of an unsuccessful escape may be subjected to special surveillance. Such surveillance must not affect the state of their health, must be undergone in a prisoner of war camp, and must not entail the suppression of any of the safeguards granted them by the present convention. Article 93. Escape, or attempt to escape, even if it is a repeated offense, shall not be deemed an aggravating circumstance if the prisoner of war is subjected to trial by judicial proceedings in respect of an offense committed during his escape or attempt to escape. In conformity with the principles stated in Article 83, offenses committed by prisoners of war with the sole intention of facilitating their escape and which do not entail any violence against life or limb such as offenses against public property, theft without intention of self-enrichment, the drawing up or use of false papers, the wearing of civilian clothing, shall occasion disciplinary punishments only. Prisoners of war who aid or abet an escape or an attempt to escape shall be liable on this count to disciplinary punishment only. Article 94. If an escaped prisoner of war is recaptured, the power on which he depends shall be notified thereof in the manner defined in Article 122, provided notification of his escape has been made. Article 95. A prisoner of war accused of an offense against discipline shall not be kept in confinement pending the hearing, unless a member of the armed forces of the detaining power would be so kept if he were accused of a similar offense, or if it is essential in the interests of camp order and discipline. Any period spent by a prisoner of war in confinement awaiting the disposal of an offense against discipline shall be reduced to an absolute minimum and shall not exceed 14 days. The provisions of Articles 97 and 98 of this chapter shall apply to prisoners of war who are in confinement awaiting the disposal of offenses against discipline. Article 96. Acts which constitute offenses against discipline shall be investigated immediately without prejudice to the competence of courts and superior military authorities disciplinary punishment may be ordered only by an officer having disciplinary powers in his capacity as camp commander or by a responsible officer who replaces him or to whom he has delegated his disciplinary powers in no case may such powers be delegated to a prisoner of war or be exercised by a prisoner of war before any disciplinary award is pronounced the accused shall be given precise information regarding the offenses of which he is accused, and given an opportunity of explaining his conduct and of defending himself. He shall be permitted, in particular, to call witnesses and to have recourse, if necessary, to the services of a qualified interpreter. The decision shall be announced to the accused prisoner of war and to the prisoner's representative. A record of disciplinary punishments shall be maintained by the camp commander, and shall be open to inspection by representatives of the protecting power. Article 97. Prisoners of war shall not in any case be transferred to penitentiary establishments, prisons, penitentiaries, convict prisons, etc., to undergo disciplinary punishment therein. All premises in which disciplinary punishments are undergone shall conform to the sanitary requirements set forth in Article 25. A prisoner of war undergoing punishment shall be enabled to keep himself in a state of cleanliness, in conformity with Article 29. Officers and persons of equivalent status shall not be lodged in the same quarters as non-commissioned officers or men. Women prisoners of war undergoing disciplinary punishment shall be confined in separate quarters from male prisoners of war and shall be under the immediate supervision of women. Article 98. A prisoner of war undergoing confinement as a disciplinary punishment shall continue to enjoy the benefits of the provisions of this convention, except in so far as these are necessarily rendered inapplicable by the mere fact that he is confined. In no case may he be deprived of the benefits of the provisions of Articles 78 and 126. A prisoner of war awarded disciplinary punishment may not be deprived of the prerogatives attached to his rank. Prisoners of war awarded disciplinary punishment 
shall be allowed to exercise and to stay in the open air at least two hours daily. They shall be allowed, on their request, to be present at the daily medical inspections. They shall receive the attention which their state of health requires and, if necessary, shall be removed to the camp infirmary or to a hospital. They shall have permission to read and write, likewise to send and receive, letters. Parcels and remittances of money, however, may be withheld from them until the completion of the punishment. They shall meanwhile be entrusted to the prisoner's representative, who will hand over to the infirmary the perishable goods contained in such parcels. 3. Judicial Proceedings Article 99. No prisoner of war may be tried or sentenced for an act which is not forbidden by the law of the detaining power or by international law in force at the time the said act was committed. No moral or physical coercion may be exerted on a prisoner of war in order to induce him to admit himself guilty of the act of which he is accused. No prisoner of war may be convicted without having had an opportunity to present his defense and the assistance of a qualified advocate or counsel. Article 100. Prisoners of war and the protecting powers shall be informed as soon as possible of the offenses which are punishable by the death sentence under the laws of the detaining power. Other offenses shall not thereafter be made punishable by the death penalty without the concurrence of the power upon which the prisoners of war depend. The death sentence cannot be pronounced on a prisoner of war unless the attention of the court has, in accordance with Article 87, second paragraph, been particularly called to the fact that since the accused is not a national of the detaining power, he is not bound to it by any duty of allegiance and that he is in its power as the result of circumstances independent of his own will. Article 101. If the death penalty is pronounced on a prisoner of war, the sentence shall not be executed before the expiration of a period of at least six months from the date when the protecting power receives, at an indicated address, the detailed communication provided for in Article 107. Article 102. A prisoner of war can be validly sentenced only if the sentence has been pronounced by the same courts according to the same procedure, as in the case of members of the armed forces of the detaining power, and if, furthermore, the provisions of the present chapter have been observed. Article 103. Judicial investigations relating to a prisoner of war shall be conducted as rapidly as circumstances permit, and so that his trial shall take place as soon as possible. A prisoner of war shall not be confined while awaiting trial unless a member of the armed forces of the detaining power would be so confined if he were accused of a similar offense, or if it is essential to do so in the interests of national security. In no circumstances shall this confinement exceed three months. Any period spent by a prisoner of war in confinement awaiting trial shall be deducted from any sentence of imprisonment passed upon him and taken into account in fixing any penalty. The provisions of Articles 97 and 98 of this chapter shall apply to a prisoner of war whilst in confinement awaiting trial. Article 104. In any case in which the detaining power has decided to institute judicial proceedings against a prisoner of war, it shall notify the protecting power as soon as possible, and at least three weeks before the opening of the trial. This period of three weeks shall run as from the day on which such notification reaches the protecting power at the address previously indicated by the latter to the detaining power. The said notification shall contain the following information. 1. Surname and first names of the prisoner of war, his rank, his army, regimental, personal, or serial number, his date of birth, and his profession or trade, if any. 2. Place of internment or confinement. 3. Specification of the charge or charges on which the prisoner of war is to be arraigned, giving the legal provisions applicable. 4. Designation of the court which will try the case, likewise the date and place fixed for the opening of the trial. The same communication shall be made by the detaining power to the prisoner's representative. If no evidence is submitted, at the opening of a trial, that the notification referred to above was received by the protecting power, by the prisoner of war, and by the prisoner's representative concerned, at least three weeks before the opening of the trial, 
then the latter cannot take place and must be adjourned. Article 105. The prisoner of war shall be entitled to assistance by one of his prisoner comrades, to defense by a qualified advocate or counsel of his own choice, to the calling of witnesses, and, if he deems necessary, to the services of a competent interpreter. He shall be advised of these rights by the detaining power in due time before the trial. Failing a choice by the prisoner of war, the protecting power shall find him an advocate or counsel, and shall have at least one week at its disposal for the purpose. The detaining power shall deliver to the said power, upon request, a list of persons qualified to present the defense. Failing a choice of an advocate or counsel by the prisoner of war or the protecting power, the detaining power shall appoint a competent advocate or counsel to conduct the defense. The advocate or counsel conducting the defense on behalf of the prisoner of war shall have at his disposal a period of two weeks at least before the opening of the trial, as well as the necessary facilities to prepare the defense of the accused. He may, in particular, freely visit the accused and interview him in private. He may also confer with any witnesses for the defense, including prisoners of war. He shall have the benefit of these facilities until the term of appeal or petition has expired. Particulars of the charge or charges on which the prisoner of war is to be arraigned, as well as the documents which are generally communicated to the accused by virtue of the laws in force in the armed forces of the detaining power, shall be communicated to the accused prisoner of war in a language which he understands, and in good time before the opening of the trial. The same communication and the same circumstances shall be made to the advocate or counsel conducting the defense on behalf of the prisoner of war. The representatives of the protecting power shall be entitled to attend the trial of the case, unless, exceptionally, this is held in camera in the interest of state security. In such a case, the detaining power shall advise the protecting power accordingly. Article 106. Every prisoner of war shall have, in the same manner as the members of the armed forces of the detaining power, the right of appeal or petition from any sentence pronounced upon him, with a view to the quashing or revising of the sentence or the reopening of the trial. He shall be fully informed of his right to appeal or petition, and of the time limit within which he may do so. Article 107. Any judgment and sentence pronounced upon a prisoner of war shall be immediately reported to the protecting power in the form of a summary communication, which shall also indicate whether he has the right of appeal with a view to the quashing of the sentence or the reopening of the trial. This communication shall likewise be sent to the prisoner's representative concerned. It shall also be sent to the accused prisoner of war in a language he understands, if the sentence was not pronounced in his presence. The detaining power shall also immediately communicate to the protecting power the decision of the prisoner of war to use or to waive his right of appeal. Furthermore, if a prisoner of war is finally convicted, or if a sentence pronounced on a prisoner of war in the first instance is a death sentence, the detaining power shall as soon as possible address to the protecting power a detailed communication containing 1. The precise wording of the finding and sentence. 2. A summarized report of any preliminary investigation and of the trial, emphasizing in particular the elements of the prosecution and the defense. 3. Notification, where applicable, of the establishment where the sentence will be served. The communications provided for in the foregoing subparagraphs shall be sent to the protecting power at the address previously made known to the detaining power. Article 108. Sentence pronounced on prisoners of war after a conviction has become duly enforceable shall be served in the same establishments and under the same conditions as in the case of members of the armed forces of the detaining power. These conditions shall in all cases conform to the requirements of health and humanity. A woman prisoner of war on whom such a sentence has been pronounced shall be confined in separate quarters and shall be under the supervision of women. In any case, prisoners of war sentenced to a penalty depriving them of their liberty shall retain the benefit of the provisions of Articles 78 and 126 of the present Convention. 
Furthermore, they shall be entitled to receive and dispatch correspondence, to receive at least one relief parcel monthly, to take regular exercise in the open air, to have the medical care required by their state of health, and the spiritual assistance they may desire. Penalties to which they may be subjected shall be in accordance with the provisions of Article 87, third paragraph. End of section 15. Section 16 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. Part 4. Termination of Captivity. Section 1 direct repatriation and accommodation in neutral countries. Article 109. General Observations. Subject to the provisions of the third paragraph of this article, parties to the conflict are bound to send back to their own country, regardless of number or rank, seriously wounded and seriously sick prisoners of war, after having cared for them until they are fit to travel, in accordance with the first paragraph of the following article. Throughout the duration of hostilities, parties to the conflict shall endeavor, with the cooperation of the neutral powers concerned, to make arrangements for the accommodation in neutral countries of the sick and wounded prisoners of war referred to in the second paragraph of the following article. They may, in addition, conclude agreements with a view to the direct repatriation or internment in a neutral country of able-bodied prisoners of war who have undergone a long period of captivity. No sick or injured prisoner of war who is eligible for repatriation under the first paragraph of this article may be repatriated against his will during hostilities. Article 110 Cases of Repatriation and Accommodation The following shall be repatriated direct. 1. Incurably wounded and sick, whose mental or physical fitness seems to have been gravely diminished. 2. Wounded and sick who, according to medical opinion, are not likely to recover within one year, whose condition requires treatment, and whose mental or physical fitness seems to have been gravely diminished. 3. Wounded and sick who have recovered, but whose mental or physical fitness seems to have gravely and permanently diminished. The following may be accommodated in a neutral country. 1. Wounded and sick whose recovery may be expected within one year of the date of the wound or the beginning of the illness, if treatment in a neutral country might increase the prospects of a more certain and speedy recovery. 2. Prisoners of war, whose mental or physical health, according to medical opinion, is seriously threatened by continued captivity, but whose accommodation in a neutral country might remove such a threat. The conditions which prisoners of war accommodated in a neutral country must fulfill in order to permit their repatriation, shall be fixed, as shall likewise their status by agreement between the powers concerned. In general, prisoners of war who have been accommodated in a neutral country and who belong to the following categories should be repatriated. 1. Those whose state of health has deteriorated so as to fulfill the conditions laid down for direct repatriation. 2 those whose mental or physical powers remain, even after treatment, considerably impaired. If no special agreements are concluded between the parties to the conflict concerned, to determine the cases of disablement or sickness entailing direct repatriation or accommodation in a neutral country, such cases shall be settled in accordance with the principles laid down in the model agreement concerning direct repatriation and accommodation in neutral countries of wounded and sick prisoners of war in the regulations concerning mixed medical commissions 
annexed to the present convention. Article 111. Internment in a Neutral Country. The detaining power, the power on which the prisoners of war depend, and a neutral power, agreed upon by these two powers, shall endeavor to conclude agreements which will enable prisoners of war to be interned in the territory of the said neutral power until the close of hostilities. Article 112. Mixed Medical Commissions. Upon the outbreak of hostilities, mixed medical commissions shall be appointed to examine sick and wounded prisoners of war and to make all appropriate decisions regarding them. The appointment, duties, and functioning of these commissions shall be in conformity with the provisions of the regulations annexed to the present convention. However, prisoners of war who, in the opinion of the medical authorities of the detaining power, are manifestly seriously injured or seriously sick, may be repatriated without having to be examined by a mixed medical commission. Article 113. Prisoners Entitled to Examination by Mixed Medical Commissions Besides those who are designated by the medical authorities of the detaining power, wounded or sick prisoners of war belonging to the categories listed below shall be entitled to present themselves for examination by the mixed medical commissions provided for in the foregoing article. 1. Wounded and sick proposed by a physician or surgeon who is of the same nationality or a national of a party to the conflict allied with the power on which the said prisoners depend and who exercises his functions in the camp. 2. Wounded and sick proposed by their prisoner's representative. 3. Wounded and sick proposed by the power on which they depend, or by an organization duly recognized by the said power, and giving assistance to the prisoners. Prisoners of war who do not belong to one of the three foregoing categories may nevertheless present themselves for examination by mixed medical commissions, but shall be examined only after those belonging to the said categories. The physician or surgeon of the same nationality as the prisoners who present themselves for examination by the mixed medical commission, likewise the prisoner's representative of the said prisoners, shall have permission to be present at the examination. Article 114. Prisoners Meeting with Accidents Prisoners of war who meet with accidents shall, unless the injury is self-inflicted, have the benefit of the provisions of this convention as regards repatriation or accommodation in a neutral country. Article 115. Prisoners Serving a Sentence No prisoner of war on whom a disciplinary punishment has been imposed and who is eligible for repatriation or for accommodation in a neutral country, may be kept back on the plea that he has not undergone his punishment. Prisoners of war detained in connection with a judicial prosecution or conviction, and who are designated for repatriation or accommodation in a neutral country, may benefit by such measures before the end of the proceedings or the completion of the punishment if the detaining power consents. Parties to the conflict shall communicate to each other the names of those who will be detained until the end of the proceedings or the completion of the punishment. Article 116. Costs of Repatriation. The costs of repatriating prisoners of war or transporting them to a neutral country shall be borne from the frontiers of the detaining power by the power on which the said prisoners depend. Article 117. Activity after repatriation. No repatriated person may be employed on active military service. Section 2. Release and repatriation of prisoners of war at the close of hostilities. Article 118. Release and repatriation. Prisoners of war shall be released and repatriated without delay after the cessation of active hostilities. 
In the absence of stipulations to the above effect in any agreement concluded between the parties to the conflict with a view to the cessation of hostilities, or failing any such agreement, each of the detaining powers shall itself establish and execute without delay a plan of repatriation in conformity with the principle laid down in the foregoing paragraph. In either case, the measures adopted shall be brought to the knowledge of the prisoners of war. The costs of repatriation of prisoners of war shall in all cases be equitably apportioned between the detaining power and the power on which the prisoners depend. This apportionment shall be carried out on the following basis. A. If the two powers are contiguous, the power on which the prisoners of war depend shall bear the costs of repatriation from the frontiers of the detaining power. B. If the two powers are not contiguous, the detaining power shall bear the costs of transport of the prisoners of war over its own territory as far as its frontier or its port of embarkation nearest to the territory of the power on which the prisoners of war depend. The parties concerned shall agree between themselves as to the equitable apportionment of the remaining costs of the repatriation. The conclusion of this agreement shall in no circumstances justify any delay in the repatriation of the prisoners of war. Article 119. Details of Procedure. Repatriation shall be effected in conditions similar to those laid down in Articles 46 to 48, inclusive of the present Convention for the Transfer of Prisoners of War, having regard to the provisions of Article 118 and to those of the following paragraphs. On repatriation, any articles of value impounded from prisoners of war under Article 18 and any foreign currency which has not been converted into the currency of the detaining power, shall be restored to them. Articles of value and foreign currency which, for any reason whatever, are not restored to prisoners of war on repatriation, shall be dispatched to the Information Bureau set up under Article 122. Prisoners of war shall be allowed to take with them their personal effects, and any correspondence and parcels which have arrived for them. The weight of such baggage may be limited, if the conditions of repatriation so require, to what each prisoner can reasonably carry. Each prisoner shall in all cases be authorized to carry at least 25 kilograms. The other personal effects of the repatriated prisoner shall be left in the charge of the detaining power which shall have them forwarded to him as soon as it has concluded an agreement to this effect, regulating the conditions of transport and the payment of the costs involved, with the power on which the prisoner depends. Prisoners of war against whom criminal proceedings for an indictable offense are pending may be detained until the end of such proceedings and, if necessary, until the completion of the punishment. The same shall apply to prisoners of war already convicted for an indictable offense. Parties to the conflict shall communicate to each other the names of any prisoners of war who are detained until the end of the proceedings or until punishment has been completed. By agreement between the parties to the conflict, commissions shall be established for the purpose of searching for dispersed prisoners of war and of assuring their repatriation with the least possible delay. Section 3. Death of Prisoners of War Article 120. Wills, Death Certificates, Burial, Cremation Wills of prisoners of war shall be drawn up so as to satisfy the conditions of validity required by the legislation of their country of origin which will take steps to inform the detaining power of its requirements in this respect. At the request of the prisoner of war, and, in all cases, after death, the will shall be transmitted without delay to the protecting power. A certified copy shall be sent to the central agency. Death certificates in the form annexed to the present convention, 
or lists certified by a responsible officer of all persons who die as prisoners of war shall be forwarded as rapidly as possible to the Prisoner of War Information Bureau, established in accordance with Article 122. The death certificates or certified lists shall show particulars of identity as set out in the third paragraph of Article 17, and also the date and place of death, the cause of death, the date and place of burial, and all particulars necessary to identify the graves. The burial or cremation of a prisoner of war shall be preceded by a medical examination of the body with a view to confirming death and enabling a report to be made and, where necessary, establishing identity. The detaining authorities shall ensure that prisoners of war who have died in captivity are honorably buried, if possible, according to the rights of the religion to which they belonged, and that their graves are respected, suitably maintained, and marked so as to be found at any time. Wherever possible, deceased prisoners of war who depended on the same power shall be interred in the same place. Deceased prisoners of war shall be buried in individual graves unless unavoidable circumstances require the use of collective graves. Bodies may be cremated only for imperative reasons of hygiene, on account of the religion of the deceased, or in accordance with his express wish to this effect. In case of cremation, the facts shall be stated and the reasons given in the death certificate of the deceased. In order that graves may always be found, all particulars of burials and graves shall be recorded with the Graves Registration Service established by the detaining power. Lists of graves and particulars of the prisoners of war interred in cemeteries and elsewhere shall be transmitted to the power on which such prisoners of war depended. Responsibility for the care of these graves and for records of any subsequent moves of the bodies shall rest on the power controlling the territory, if a party to the present convention. These provisions shall also apply to the ashes, which shall be kept by the Graves Registration Service until proper disposal thereof in accordance with the wishes of the home country. Article 121. Prisoners Killed or Injured in Special Circumstances Every death or serious injury of a prisoner of war, caused or suspected to have been caused by a sentry, another prisoner of war, or any other person, as well as any death, the cause of which is unknown, shall be immediately followed by an official enquiry by the detaining power. A communication on this subject shall be sent immediately to the protecting power. Statements shall be taken from witnesses, especially from those who are prisoners of war, and a report including such statements shall be forwarded to the protecting power. If the inquiry indicates the guilt of one or more persons, the detaining power shall take all measures for the prosecution of the person or persons responsible. End of section 16. Section 17 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. Part 5. Information Bureau and Relief Societies for Prisoners of War. Article 122. National Bureau. Upon the outbreak of a conflict, and in all cases of occupation, each of the parties to the conflict shall institute an official information bureau for prisoners of war who are in its power. Neutral or non-belligerent powers who may have received within their territory persons belonging to one of the categories referred to in Article 4 shall take the same action with respect to such persons. 
The power concerned shall ensure that the Prisoners of War Information Bureau is provided with the necessary accommodation, equipment, and staff to ensure its efficient working. It shall be at liberty to employ prisoners of war in such a bureau under the conditions laid down in the section of the present convention dealing with work by prisoners of war. Within the shortest possible period, each of the parties to the conflict shall give its bureau the information referred to in the fourth, fifth, and sixth paragraphs of this article regarding any enemy person belonging to one of the categories referred to in Article 4 who has fallen into its power. Neutral or non-belligerent powers shall take the same action with regard to persons belonging to such categories whom they have received within their territory. The Bureau shall immediately forward such information by the most rapid means to the powers concerned, through the intermediary of the protecting powers and likewise of the central agency provided for in Article 123. This information shall make it possible quickly to advise the next of kin concerned. Subject to the provisions of Article 17, the information shall include, in so far as available to the Information Bureau, in respect of each prisoner of war, his surname, first names, rank, army, regimental, personal or serial number, place and full date of birth, indication of the power on which he depends, first name of the father and maiden name of the mother, name and address of the person to be informed, and the address to which correspondence for the prisoner may be sent. The Information Bureau shall receive from the various departments concerned information regarding transfers, releases, repatriations, escapes, admissions to hospital, and deaths, and shall transmit such information in the manner described in the third paragraph above. Likewise, information regarding the state of health of prisoners of war who are seriously ill or seriously wounded shall be supplied regularly every week if possible. The Information Bureau shall also be responsible for replying to all enquiries sent to it concerning prisoners of war, including those who have died in captivity. It will make any enquiries necessary to obtain the information which is asked for if this is not in its possession. All written communications made by the Bureau shall be authenticated by a signature or a seal. The Information Bureau shall furthermore be charged with collecting all personal valuables, including sums in currencies other than that of the detaining power, and documents of importance to the next of kin, left by prisoners of war who have been repatriated or released, or who have escaped or died, and shall forward the said valuables to the powers concerned. Such articles shall be sent by the Bureau in sealed packets, which shall be accompanied by statements giving clear and full particulars of the identity of the person to whom the articles belonged, and by a complete list of the contents of the parcel. Other personal effects of such prisoners of war shall be transmitted under arrangements agreed upon between the parties to the conflict concerned. Article 123. Central Agency. A central prisoners of war information agency shall be created in a neutral country. The International Committee of the Red Cross shall, if it deems necessary, propose to the powers concerned the organization of such an agency. The function of the agency shall be to collect all the information it may obtain through official or private channels respecting prisoners of war and to transmit it as rapidly as possible to the country of origin of the prisoners of war or to the power on which they depend. It shall receive from the parties to the conflict all facilities for effecting such transmissions. The high contracting parties, and in particular those whose nationals benefit by the services of the central agency, are requested to give the said agency the financial aid it may require. The foregoing provisions shall in no way be interpreted 
as restricting the humanitarian activities of the International Committee of the Red Cross or of the relief societies provided for in Article 125. Article 124. Exemption from Charges. The National Information Bureau and the Central Information Agency shall enjoy free postage for mail, likewise all the exemptions provided for in Article 74, and further, so far as possible, exemption from telegraphic charges or, at least, greatly reduced rates. Article 125. Relief Societies and Other Organizations. Subject to the measures which the detaining powers may consider essential to ensure their security or to meet any other reasonable need, the representatives of religious organizations, relief societies, or any other organization assisting prisoners of war shall receive from the said powers, for themselves and their duly accredited agents, all necessary facilities for visiting the prisoners, distributing relief supplies and material, from any source intended for religious, educational, or recreative purposes, and for assisting them in organizing their leisure time within the camps. Such societies or organizations may be constituted in the territory of the detaining power or in any other country, or they may have an international character. The detaining power may limit the number of societies and organizations whose delegates are allowed to carry out their activities in its territory and under its supervision, on condition, however, that such limitation shall not hinder the effective operation of adequate relief to all prisoners of war. The special position of the International Committee of the Red Cross in this field shall be recognized and respected at all times. As soon as relief supplies or material intended for the above-mentioned purposes are handed over to the prisoners of war or very shortly afterwards, receipts for each consignment signed by the prisoner's representative shall be forwarded to the relief society or organization making the shipment. At the same time, receipts for these consignments shall be supplied by the administrative authorities responsible for guarding the prisoners. End of section 17. Section 18 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. Part 6. Execution of the Convention. Section 1. General Provisions. Article 126. Supervision. Representatives or delegates of the protecting powers shall have permission to go to all places where prisoners of war may be, particularly to places of internment, imprisonment, and labor, and shall have access to all premises occupied by prisoners of war. They shall also be allowed to go to the places of departure, passage, and arrival of prisoners who are being transferred. They shall be able to interview the prisoners, and in particular the prisoners' representatives, without witnesses, either personally or through an interpreter. Representatives and delegates of the protecting powers shall have full liberty to select the places they wish to visit. The duration and frequency of these visits shall not be restricted. Visits may not be prohibited except for reasons of imperative military necessity and then only as an exceptional and temporary measure. The detaining power and the power on which the said prisoners of war depend may agree, if necessary, that compatriots of these prisoners of war be permitted to participate in the visits. The delegates of the International Committee of the Red Cross shall enjoy the same prerogatives. The appointment of such delegates 
shall be submitted to the approval of the power detaining the prisoners of war to be visited. Article 127. Dissemination of the Convention. The high contracting parties undertake, in time of peace as in time of war, to disseminate the text of the present convention as widely as possible in their respective countries, and, in particular, to include the study thereof in their programs of military and, if possible, civil instruction, so that the principles thereof may become known to all their armed forces and to the entire population. Any military or other authorities who in time of war assume responsibilities in respect of prisoners of war must possess the text of the Convention and be specially instructed as to its provisions. Article 128. Translations. Rules of Application. The high contracting parties shall communicate to one another through the Swiss Federal Council and, during hostilities, through the protecting powers, the official translations of the present convention, as well as the laws and regulations which they may adopt to ensure the application thereof. Article 129. Penal Sanctions. Item 1. General Observations. The high contracting parties undertake to enact any legislation necessary to provide effective penal sanctions for persons committing or ordering to be committed any of the grave breaches of the present convention defined in the following article. Each high contracting party shall be under the obligation to search for persons alleged to have committed or to have ordered to be committed such grave breaches and shall bring such persons regardless of their nationality before its own courts. It may also, if it prefers, and in accordance with the provisions of its own legislation, hand such persons over for trial to another high contracting party concerned, provided such high contracting party has made out a prima facie case. Each high contracting party shall take measures necessary for the suppression of all acts contrary to the provisions of the present convention other than the grave breaches defined in the following article. In all circumstances, the accused persons shall benefit by safeguards of proper trial and defense, which shall not be less favorable than those provided by Article 105 and those following of the present convention. Article 130, Item 2, Grave Breaches. Grave breaches to which the preceding article relates shall be those involving any of the following acts, if committed against persons or property protected by the convention. Willful killing, torture or inhumane treatment, including biological experiments, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, compelling a prisoner of war to serve in the forces of the hostile power, or willfully depriving a prisoner of war of the rights of fair and regular trial prescribed in this convention. Article 131. Item 3 responsibilities of the contracting parties. No high contracting party shall be allowed to absolve itself or any other high contracting party of any liability incurred by itself or by another high contracting party in respect of breaches referred to in the preceding article. Article 132. Enquiry Procedure. At the request of a party to the conflict, an inquiry shall be instituted in a manner to be decided between the interested parties concerning any alleged violation of the convention. If agreement has not been reached concerning the procedure for the inquiry, the parties should agree on the choice of an umpire who will decide upon the procedure to be followed. Once the violation has been established, the parties to the conflict shall put an end to it and shall repress it with the least possible delay. Section 2. Final Provisions. Article 133. Languages. The present convention is established in English and in French. Both texts are equally authentic. 
the Swiss Federal Council shall arrange for official translations of the Convention to be made in the Russian and Spanish languages. Article 134. Relation to the 1929 Convention. The present Convention replaces the Convention of July 27, 1929, in relations between the high contracting parties. Article 135. Relation to the Hague Convention. In the relations between the powers which are bound by the Hague Convention respecting the laws and customs of war on land, whether that of July 29, 1899, or that of October 18, 1907, and which are parties to the present Convention, this last convention shall be complementary to Chapter 2 of the regulations annexed to the above-mentioned Conventions of The Hague. Article 136. Signature. The present convention, which bears the date of this day, is open to signature until February 12, 1950, in the name of the powers represented at the conference which opened at Geneva on April 21, 1949. Furthermore, by powers not represented at that conference, but which are parties to the Convention of July 27, 1929. Article 137. Ratification. The present Convention shall be ratified as soon as possible, and the ratifications shall be deposited at Bern. A record shall be drawn up of the deposit of each instrument of ratification and certified copies of this record shall be transmitted by the Swiss Federal Council to all the powers in whose name the Convention has been signed, or whose accession has been notified. Article 138. Coming into Force. The present Convention shall come into force six months after not less than two instruments of ratification have been deposited. Thereafter, it shall come into force for each high contracting party six months after the deposit of the instrument of ratification. Article 139. Accession. From the date of its coming into force, it shall be open to any power in whose name the present convention has not been signed to accede to this convention. Article 140. Notification of Accessions. Accessions shall be notified in writing to the Swiss Federal Council and shall take effect six months after the date on which they are received. The Swiss Federal Council shall communicate the accessions to all the powers in whose name the Convention has been signed or whose accession has been notified. Article 141. Immediate Effect. The situations provided for in Articles 2 and 3 shall give immediate effect to ratifications deposited and accessions notified by the parties to the conflict before or after the beginning of hostilities or occupation. The Swiss Federal Council shall communicate by the quickest method any ratifications or accessions received from parties to the conflict. Article 142. Denunciation. Each of the high contracting parties shall be at liberty to denounce the present Convention. The denunciation shall be notified in writing to the Swiss Federal Council, which shall transmit it to the governments of all the high contracting parties. The denunciation shall take effect one year after the notification thereof has been made to the Swiss Federal Council. However, a denunciation of which notification has been made at a time when the denouncing power is involved in a conflict, shall not take effect until peace has been concluded, and until after operations connected with the release and repatriation of the persons protected by the present Convention have been terminated. The denunciation shall have effect only in respect of the denouncing power. It shall in no way impair the obligations which the parties to the conflict shall remain bound to fulfill by virtue of the principles of the law of nations, as they result from the usages established among civilized peoples, from the laws of humanity, and the dictates of the public conscience. Article 143. Registration with the United Nations. The Swiss Federal Council 
shall register the present convention with the Secretariat of the United Nations. The Swiss Federal Council shall also inform the Secretariat of the United Nations of all ratifications, accessions, and denunciations received by it with respect to the present convention. In witness whereof, the undersigned, having deposited their respective full powers, have signed the present convention. Done at Geneva, this twelfth day of August, 1949, in the English and French languages. The original shall be deposited in the archives of the Swiss Confederation. The Swiss Federal Council shall transmit certified copies thereof to each of the signatory and acceding states. End of section 18. Section 19 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. Annex 1, 2, 3, and 5. Annex 1. Model Agreement Concerning Direct Repatriation and Accommodation in Neutral Countries of Wounded and Sick Prisoners of War. See Article 110. Part 1. Principles for Direct Repatriation and Accommodation in Neutral Countries. A. Direct Repatriation. The following shall be repatriated direct. 1. All prisoners of war suffering from the following disabilities as the result of trauma, loss of a limb, paralysis, articular or other disabilities, when this disability is at least the loss of a hand or a foot, or the equivalent of the loss of a hand or a foot. Without prejudice, to a more generous interpretation, the following shall be considered as equivalent to the loss of a hand or a foot. A. Loss of a hand or all of the fingers, or of the thumb and forefinger of one hand. Loss of a foot, or of all the toes and metatarsals of one foot. B. Ankylosis, loss of osseous tissue. Cicatricial contracture preventing the functioning of one of the large articulations or all the digital joints of one hand. C. Pseudoarthrosis of the long bones. D. Deformities due to fracture or other injury which seriously interfere with function and weight-bearing power. 2. All wounded prisoners of war whose condition has become chronic to the extent that prognosis appears to exclude recovery, in spite of treatment, within one year from the date of injury, as, for example, in the case of A projectile in the heart, even if the mixed medical commission should fail at the time of their examination to detect any serious disorders, b. metallic splinter in the brain or the lungs, even if the mixed medical commission cannot, at the time of examination, detect any local or general reaction, c. osteomyelitis, when recovery cannot be foreseen in the course of the year following the injury, and which seems likely to result in ankylosis of a joint or other impairments equivalent to the loss of a hand or a foot. D. Perforating and suppurating injury to the large joints. E. Injury to the skull with loss or shifting of bony tissue. F. Injury or burning of the face with loss of tissue and functional lesions. G. Injury to the spinal cord. H. Lesion of the peripheral nerves, the sequelae of which are equivalent to the loss of a hand or foot, and the cure of which requires more than a year from the date of injury, for example, injury to the brachial or lumbosacral plexus, the median or sciatic nerves, likewise combined injury to the radial and cubital nerves, or to the lateral popliteal nerve, and medial popliteal nerve, etc. The separate injury of the radial, 
musculospiral, cubital, lateral, or medial popliteal nerves shall not, however, warrant repatriation, except in case of contractures or of serious neurotrophic disturbance. 3. All sick prisoners of war, whose condition has become chronic to the extent that prognosis seems to exclude recovery, in spite of treatment, within one year from the inception of the disease, as, for example, in the case of a. Progressive tuberculosis of any organ, which, according to medical prognosis, cannot be cured, or at least considerably improved, by treatment in a neutral country. b. Exudate pleurisy. c. Serious diseases of the respiratory organs of non-tubercular etiology, presumed incurable, for example, serious pulmonary emphysema, with or without bronchitis, chronic asthma, chronic bronchitis, lasting more than one year in captivity, bronchiectasis, etc. d. Serious chronic affections of the circulatory system, for example, valvular lesions and myocarditis, which have shown signs of circulatory failure during captivity, even though the mixed medical commission cannot detect any such signs at the time of examination. Affections of the pericardium and the vessels, Berger's disease, aneurysm of the large vessels, etc. E. Serious chronic affections of the digestive organs, for example, gastric or duodenal ulcer, sequelae of gastric operations performed in captivity, chronic gastritis, enteritis, or colitis, having lasted more than one year and seriously affecting the general condition, cirrhosis of the liver, chronic cholecystopathy, etc. F. Serious chronic affections of the genitourinary organs, for example, chronic diseases of the kidney with consequent disorders, nephrectomy because of a tubercular kidney, chronic pyelitis or chronic cystitis, hydronephrosis, or pyronephrosis, chronic grave gynecological conditions, normal pregnancy and obstetrical disorder, where it is impossible to accommodate in a neutral country, etc. G. Serious chronic diseases of the central and peripheral nervous system, for example, all obvious psychoses and psychoneuroses, such as serious hysteria, serious captivity, psychoneurosis, etc., duly verified by a specialist, any epilepsy duly verified by the camp physician, cerebral arteriosclerosis, chronic neuritis lasting more than one year, etc. H. Serious chronic diseases of the neurovegetative system with considerable diminution of mental or physical fitness noticeable loss of weight, and general asthenia. I. Blindness of both eyes, or of one eye when the vision of the other is less than one, in spite of the use of corrective glasses, diminution of visual acuity in cases where it is impossible to restore it by correction to acuity of one over two in at least one eye, other grave ocular affections, for example, glaucoma, iritis, choroiditis, trachoma, etc. K. Auditive disorders, such as total unilateral deafness, if the other ear does not discern the ordinary spoken word at a distance of one meter, etc. L. Serious affections of metabolism, for example, diabetes mellitus, requiring insulin treatment, etc. M. Serious disorders of the endocrine glands, for example, thyrotoxicosis, hypothyrosis, Addison's disease, Simmons cachexia, tetany, etc. N. Grave and chronic disorders of the blood-forming organs. O. Serious case of chronic intoxication, for example, lead poisoning, mercury poisoning, morphinism, 
cocaineism, alcoholism, gas or radiation poisoning, etc. P. Chronic affections of locomotion with obvious functional disorders, for example, arthritis deformans, primary and secondary progressive chronic polyarthritis, rheumatism with serious clinical symptoms, etc. Q. Serious chronic skin diseases not amenable to treatment. R. Any malignant growth. S. Serious chronic infectious diseases persisting for one year after their inception, for example, malaria with decided organic impairment, amoebic or bacillary dysentery with grave disorders, tertiary visceral syphilis resistant to treatment, leprosy, etc. T. Serious avidominosis or serious anition. B. Accommodation in neutral countries. The following shall be eligible for accommodation in a neutral country. 1. All wounded prisoners of war who are not likely to recover in captivity but who might be cured or whose condition might be considerably improved by accommodation in a neutral country. 2. Prisoners of war suffering from any form of tuberculosis of whatever organ and whose treatment in a neutral country would be likely to lead to recovery or at least to considerable improvement, with the exception of primary tuberculosis cured before captivity. 3. Prisoners of war suffering from affections requiring treatment of the respiratory, circulatory, digestive, nervous, sensory, genitourinary, cutaneous, locomotive organs, etc., if such treatment would clearly have better results in a neutral country than in captivity. 4. Prisoners of war who have undergone a nephrectomy in captivity for a non-tubercular renal affection, cases of osteomyelitis on the way to recovery or latent, diabetes mellitus not requiring insulin treatment, etc. 5. Prisoners of war suffering from war or captivity neuroses, cases of captivity neurosis which are not cured after three months of accommodation in a neutral country, or which, after that length of time, are not clearly on the way to complete cure, shall be repatriated. 6. All prisoners of war suffering from chronic intoxication, gases, metals, alkaloids, etc., for whom the prospects of cure in a neutral country are especially favorable. 7. All women prisoners of war who are pregnant or mothers with infants and small children. The following cases shall not be eligible for accommodation in a neutral country. 1. All duly verified chronic psychoses. 2. All organic or functional nervous affections considered to be incurable. 3. All contagious diseases during the period in which they are transmissible, with the exception of tuberculosis. Part 2. General Observations 1. The conditions given shall, in a general way, be interpreted and applied in as broad a spirit as possible. Neuropathic and psychopathic conditions caused by war or captivity as well as cases of tuberculosis in all stages, shall above all benefit by such liberal interpretation. Prisoners of war who have sustained several wounds, none of which, considered by itself, justifies repatriation, shall be examined in the same spirit with due regard for the psychic traumatism due to the number of their wounds. 2. All unquestionable cases giving the right to direct repatriation, amputation, total blindness or deafness, open pulmonary tuberculosis, mental disorder, malignant growth, etc., shall be examined and repatriated as soon as possible by the camp physicians or by military medical commissions appointed by the detaining power. 3. Injuries and diseases which existed before the war and which 
have not become worse, as well as war injuries which have not prevented subsequent military service, shall not entitle to direct repatriation. 4. The provisions of this annex shall be interpreted and applied in a similar manner in all countries party to the conflict. The powers and authorities concerned shall grant to mixed medical commissions all the facilities necessary for the accomplishment of their task. 5. The examples quoted under Part 1 above represent only typical cases. Cases which do not correspond exactly to these provisions shall be judged in the spirit of the provisions of Article 110 of the present Convention and of the principles embodied in the present agreement. End of Annex 1 Annex 2. Regulations Concerning Mixed Medical Commissions. See Article 112. Article 1. The Mixed Medical Commissions provided for in Article 112 of the Convention shall be composed of three members, two of whom shall belong to a neutral country, the third being appointed by the detaining power. One of the neutral members shall take the chair. Article 2. The two neutral members shall be appointed by the International Committee of the Red Cross, acting in agreement with the protecting power at the request of the detaining power. They may be domiciled either in their country of origin, in any other neutral country, or in the territory of the detaining power. Article 3. The neutral members shall be approved by the parties to the conflict concerned who shall notify their approval to the International Committee of the Red Cross and to the protecting power. Upon such notification, the neutral members shall be considered as effectively appointed. Article 4. Deputy members shall also be appointed in sufficient number to replace the regular members in case of need. They shall be appointed at the same time as the regular members, or at least as soon as possible. Article 5. If for any reason the International Committee of the Red Cross cannot arrange for the appointment of the neutral members, this shall be done by the power protecting the interests of the prisoners of war to be examined. Article 6. So far as possible, one of the two neutral members shall be a surgeon and the other a physician. Article 7. The neutral members shall be entirely independent of the parties to the conflict, which shall grant them all facilities in the accomplishment of their duties. Article 8. By agreement with the detaining power, the International Committee of the Red Cross, when making the appointments provided for in Articles 2 and 4 of the present regulations, shall settle the terms of service of the nominees. Article 9. The Mixed Medical Commissions shall begin their work as soon as possible after the neutral members have been approved, and in any case within a period of three months from the date of such approval. Article 10. The Mixed Medical Commissions shall examine all the prisoners designated in Article 113 of the Convention. They shall propose repatriation, rejection, or reference to a later examination. Their decisions shall be made by a majority vote. Article 11. The decisions made by the mixed medical commissions in each specific case shall be communicated during the month following their visit to the detaining power, the protecting power, and the International Committee of the Red Cross. The mixed medical commissions shall also inform each prisoner of war examined of the decision made and shall issue to those whose repatriation has been proposed certificates similar to the model appended to the present convention. Article 12. The detaining power shall be required to carry out the decisions of the mixed medical commissions within three months of the time when it receives due notification of such decisions. Article 13. If there is no neutral physician in a country where the services of a mixed medical commission seem to be required, and if it is for any reason impossible to appoint neutral doctors who are resident in another country, 
the detaining power, acting in agreement with the protecting power, shall set up a medical commission which shall undertake the same duties as a mixed medical commission, subject to the provisions of Articles 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 8 of the present regulations. Article 14. Mixed medical commissions shall function permanently and shall visit each camp at intervals of not more than six months. End of Annex 2. Annex 3. Regulations Concerning Collective Relief. See Article 73. Article 1. Prisoners' representatives shall be allowed to distribute collective relief shipments for which they are responsible to all prisoners of war administered by their camp, including those who are in hospitals or in prisons or other penal establishments. Article 2. The distribution of collective relief shipments shall be effected in accordance with the instructions of the donors and with a plan drawn up by the prisoners' representatives. The issue of medical stores shall, however, be made for preference in agreement with the senior medical officers, and the latter may, in hospitals and infirmaries, waive the said instructions if the needs of their patients so demand. Within the limits thus defined, the distribution shall always be carried out equitably. Article 3. The said prisoners' representatives, or their assistants, shall be allowed to go to the points of arrival of relief supplies near the camps, so as to enable the prisoners' representatives, or their assistants, to verify the quality as well as the quantity of the goods received, and to make out detailed reports thereon for the donors. Article 4. Prisoners' representatives shall be given the facilities necessary for verifying whether the distribution of collective relief in all subdivisions and annexes of their camps has been carried out in accordance with their instructions. Article 5. Prisoners' representatives shall be allowed to fill up and cause to be filled up by the prisoners' representatives of labor detachments or by the senior medical officers of infirmaries and hospitals, forms or questionnaires intended for the donors relating to collective relief supplies, distribution, requirements, quantities, etc. Such forms and questionnaires, duly completed, shall be forwarded to the donors without delay. Article 6. In order to secure the regular issue of collective relief to the prisoners of war in their camp and to meet any needs that may arise from the arrival of new contingents of prisoners, prisoners' representatives shall be allowed to build up and maintain adequate reserve stocks of collective relief. For this purpose, they shall have suitable warehouses at their disposal. Each warehouse shall be provided with two locks, the prisoner's representative holding the keys of one lock and the camp commander the keys of the other. Article 7. When collective consignments of clothing are available, each prisoner of war shall retain in his possession at least one complete set of clothes. If a prisoner has more than one set of clothes, the prisoner's representative shall be permitted to withdraw excess clothing from those with the largest number of sets, or particular articles in excess of one, if this is necessary in order to supply prisoners who are less well provided. He shall not, however, withdraw second sets of underclothing, socks, or footwear, unless this is the only means of providing for prisoners of war with none. Article 8. The high contracting parties and the detaining powers in particular shall authorize, as far as possible and subject to the regulations governing the supply of the population, all purchases of goods made in their territories for the distribution of collective relief to prisoners of war. They shall similarly facilitate the transfer of funds and other financial measures of a technical or administrative nature taken for the purpose of making such purchases. Article 9. 
the foregoing provisions shall not constitute an obstacle to the right of the prisoners of war to receive collective relief before their arrival in a camp or in the course of transfer nor to the possibility of representatives of the protecting power the international committee of the red cross or any other body giving assistance to prisoners which may be responsible for the forwarding of such supplies ensuring the distribution thereof to the addressees by any other means that they may deem useful end of annex three annex five model regulations concerning payments sent by prisoners to their own country see article sixty three one the notification referred to in the third paragraph of article sixty three will show a number as specified in article seventeen rank surname and first names of the prisoner of war who is the payer b the name and address of the payee in the country of origin c the amount to be so paid in the currency of the country in which he is detained two the notification will be signed by the prisoner of war or his witnessed mark made upon it if he cannot write and shall be countersigned by the prisoner's representative three the camp commander will add to this notification a certificate that the prisoner of war concerned has a credit balance of not less than the amount registered as payable four the notification may be made up in lists each sheet of such lists witnessed by the prisoner's representative and certified by the camp commander end of annex five end of section nineteen Section 20 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introductory Notes, Geneva Convention 4. Fourth Geneva Convention, Civilians. The Fourth Convention forms an important contribution to written international law in the humanitarian domain. Strictly speaking, this convention introduces nothing new in a field where the doctrine is sufficiently well established. It adds no specifically new ideas to international law on the subject, but aims at ensuring that even in the midst of hostilities, the dignity of the human person, universally acknowledged in principle, shall be respected. The original humanitarian legislation represented by the First Geneva Convention of 1864 provided only for combatants, as at that time it was considered evident that civilians would remain outside hostilities. The regulations concerning the laws and customs of war on land, annexed to the Fourth Hague Convention of 1907, made no provision for civilians, apart from spies, except where there was occupation of territory by enemy armed forces, they merely set forth a small number of elementary rules in pursuance of the principle that the occupant shall take all measures in his power to restore and as far as possible ensure public order and safety while respecting unless absolutely prevented the laws in force in the country article forty three thus family honor and rights the lives of persons and private property as well as religious convictions and practice must be respected article forty six pillage is formally forbidden article forty seven no general penalty pecuniary or otherwise shall be inflicted upon the population on account of the acts of individuals for which they cannot be regarded as jointly and severally responsible article fifty such were the main and essential provisions, tersely expressed, governing the occupation of territory. The development of arms and the increased radius of action given to armed forces by modern inventions have made it apparent that, notwithstanding the ruling theory, civilians were certainly in the war, and exposed to the same dangers as the combatants, and sometimes worse. The Tenth International Red Cross Conference, 1921, 
the first after the World War, set forth certain general principles on the proposal of the International Committee in regard to deported, evacuated, or refugee civilians. These prohibited deportation en masse, or without preliminary trial, and the taking of hostages. They enjoined liberty of movement, and the right to correspond, and to receive relief. In 1923, the 11th International Conference called for a convention to supplement the Hague Regulations. The 12th Conference devised regulations for the protection of civilians on the territory of an enemy state. These recognized their right to leave the territory, unless the safety of the state was involved, and provided for speedier inquiries, mixed medical commissions for the examination of men unfit for service, transmission to the International Committee of lists of retained civilians, the grant to civilians of the same privileges as to prisoners of war, inspection of places of internment, and agreements between belligerents for the benefit of civilians. The 1929 Diplomatic Conference, which revised the first convention and drew up the convention for the treatment of prisoners of war, unanimously recommended that careful study should be made with a view to the conclusion of an international convention on the conditions and protection of civilians of enemy nationality in the territory of a belligerent or in belligerent-occupied territory. The International Committee wholeheartedly entered into the task thus defined, setting up a legal commission which prepared a draft convention in forty articles. This draft, generally known as the Tokyo Draft, was approved by the 15th International Red Cross Conference, Tokyo, 1934. It was intended for submission to the diplomatic conference planned for 1940, but postponed on account of the war. The International Committee was, at best, able to obtain an undertaking from the belligerent states, that the essential provisions of the Prisoners of War Convention would be extended to interned civilians who were in enemy territory at the outbreak of hostilities, as was in fact prescribed in the Tokyo Draft. The events which followed were to show the disastrous consequences of the failure to provide, in addition to the few principles embodied in the Hague Regulations, an international convention for the protection of civilians in wartime, particularly of those in occupied territories. This tragic period was one of deportations, mass extermination, taking and killing of hostages, and pillage. Immediately hostilities ceased, therefore, the International Committee, in keeping with its humanitarian duty, informed all governments and Red Cross societies of its intention to resume its efforts to set up an international convention for the protection of civilians. This statement met with universal approval. The Geneva Diplomatic Conference was not called to revise the Fourth Hague Convention. The Civilian Convention of August 12, 1949, therefore in no way invalidates the regulations concerning the laws and customs of war on land, it is not a substitute for that agreement which remains in force. As happily expressed by the conference, the convention shall be supplementary to sections 2 and 3 of the said regulations. See Fourth Convention, Article 154. The new convention contains 159 articles and two annexes. According to the text of a draft preamble submitted by the French and Finnish delegations, but not adopted, as the conference decided to follow the precedent of the other Geneva Conventions, which contain no preamble. It is inspired by the eternal principles of that law which is the foundation and safeguard of civilization, and is designed to ensure the respect of human personality and dignity by putting beyond reach of attack those rights and liberties which are the essence of its existence. It prohibits in particular a violence to life and person, in particular torture, mutilations, or cruel treatment, b. the taking of hostages, c. deportations, d. outrages upon personal dignity, in particular humiliating or degrading treatment, or adverse treatment founded on differences of race, color, nationality, religion, beliefs, sex, birth, or social status, e 
the passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court affording all the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples in the present edition a table is appended showing the division into parts sections and chapters and reproducing the marginal notes to each article reference to this table will afford a complete outline of the subjects dealt with and the position they occupy in the convention amongst the general provisions article four gives the following definition of the persons who will have the benefit of this convention persons protected by the convention are those who at a given moment and in any manner whatsoever find themselves in case of a conflict or occupation in the hands of a party to the conflict or occupying power of which they are not nationals nationals of a state which is not bound by the convention are not protected by it nationals of a neutral state who find themselves in the territory of a belligerent state and nationals of a co-belligerent state shall not be regarded as protected persons while the state of which they are nationals has normal diplomatic representation in the state in whose hands they are the last two clauses were added by the conference to the draft which was found too narrow on this particular point part two articles thirteen to twenty six concerns the general protection of populations against certain consequences of war it goes beyond the limits set up by article four and covers the population as a whole that is not only protected persons but also those who cannot avail themselves of this protection and in particular those who are nationals of the party to the conflict or of the occupying power by whom they are held there is thus provision for hospital and safety zones and localities and neutralized zones articles fourteen and fifteen for the protection of civilian hospitals article eighteen for measures on behalf of children article twenty four and for the exchange of family news article twenty five in all cases these measures are quite general in scope giving neither the grounds nor indeed any practical opportunity for discrimination part three articles twenty seven to one forty one defines the status and treatment of protected persons and the manner of the application of the convention following the precedent of the tokyo draft it distinguishes between foreign nationals on the territory of a party to the conflict and the population of occupied territories it is divided into five sections section one contains provisions common to the above two categories of persons dealing with the responsibilities of the state and of its agents article twenty nine application to protecting powers and relief organizations article thirty prohibition of corporal punishments article thirty two of collective penalties terrorism pillage and reprisals article thirty three and of the taking of hostages article thirty four section two relates to aliens in the territory of a party to the conflict and deals with their right to leave the territory article thirty five protection in case of internment article forty one and refugees article forty four section three contains the prescriptions for occupied territories on such subjects as inviolability of rights article forty seven deportations transfers and evacuations article forty nine children article fifty labor article fifty one food article fifty five hygiene and public health article fifty six spiritual assistance article fifty eight relief articles fifty nine to sixty three penal legislation articles sixty four to seventy five and treatment of detainees article seventy six section four deals with internment it is divided into twelve chapters the contents of which are in general analogous to the provisions adopted for prisoners of war chapter one general provisions chapter two places of internment chapter three food and clothing chapter four hygiene and medical attention chapter five religious intellectual and physical activities chapter six personal property and financial resources 
Chapter 7, Administration and Discipline. Chapter 8, Relations with the Exterior. Chapter 9, Penal and Disciplinary Sanctions. Chapter 10, Transfers of Internees. Chapter 11, Deaths. Chapter 12, Release, Repatriation, and Accommodation in Neutral Countries. Section 5 is devoted to Information Bureau and the Central Agency, the functioning of which is to follow that of the Central Prisoners of War Agency. Part 4, Articles 142 to 159, concerns the execution of the Convention. Section 1, General Provisions, contains, amongst others, the provision on the repression of breaches of the Convention, already mentioned. Finally, the 1949 Diplomatic Conference passed eleven resolutions which refer to the Geneva Conventions but do not form part of them. They will also be found in the present edition. End of Section 20 Recording by Maria Casper Section 21 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Convention Header, Part 1, General Provisions Geneva Convention, relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war, of 12th August 1949. The undersigned plenipotentiaries of the governments represented at the diplomatic conference held at Geneva from April 21st to August 12th, 1949, for the purpose of establishing a convention for the protection of civilian persons in time of war, have agreed as follows. Part 1. General Provisions. Article 1. Respect for the Convention. The high contracting parties undertake to respect and to ensure respect for the present convention in all circumstances. Article 2. Application of the Convention. In addition to the provisions which shall be implemented in peacetime, the present convention shall apply to all cases of declared war or of any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. The Convention shall also apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party, even if said occupation meets with no armed resistance. Although one of the powers in a conflict may not be a party to the present Convention, the powers who are parties thereto shall remain bound by it in their mutual relations, they shall furthermore be bound by the Convention, in relation to the said power, if the latter accepts and applies the provisions thereof. Article 3. Conflicts not of an international character. In the case of armed conflict not of an international character, occurring in the territory of one of the high contracting parties, each party to the conflict shall be bound to apply as a minimum the following provisions. 1. Persons taking no active part in the hostilities, including members of the armed forces who have laid down their arms, and those placed hors de combat by sickness, wounds, detention, or any other cause, shall in all circumstances be treated humanely, without any adverse distinction founded on race, color, religion, or faith, sex, birth, or wealth, or any other similar criteria. To this end, the following acts are and shall remain prohibited at any time and in any place whatsoever with respect to the above-mentioned persons. a. Violence to life and person, in particular murder of all kinds, mutilation, cruel treatment, and torture. b. Taking of hostages. c. Outrages upon personal dignity, in particular humiliating and degrading treatment, d. the passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court, affording all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples. 2. The wounded and sick shall be collected and cared for, 
an impartial humanitarian body, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, may offer its services to the parties to the conflict. The parties to the conflict should further endeavor to bring into force, by means of special agreements, all or part of the other provisions of the present Convention. The application of the preceding provisions shall not affect the legal status of the parties to the conflict. Article 4. Definition of Protected Persons Persons protected by the Convention are those who, at a given moment and in any manner whatsoever, find themselves, in case of a conflict or occupation, in the hands of persons a party to the conflict or occupying power of which they are not nationals. Nationals of a state which is not bound by the Convention are not protected by it. Nationals of a neutral state who find themselves in the territory of a belligerent state and nationals of a co-belligerent state shall not be regarded as protected persons while the state of which they are nationals has normal diplomatic representation in the state in whose hands they are. The provisions of Part Two are, however, wider in application, as defined in Article 13. Persons protected by the Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field of August 12, 1949, or by the Geneva Convention for the Amelioration of the Condition of Wounded, Sick, and Shipwrecked Members of Armed Forces at Sea of August 12, 1949, or the Geneva Convention Relative to the Treatment of Prisoners of War of August 12, 1949, shall not be considered as protected persons within the meaning of the present Convention. Article 5. Derogations. Where, in the territory of a party to the conflict, the latter is satisfied that an individual protected person is definitely suspected of or engaged in activities hostile to the security of the state, such individual person shall not be entitled to claim such rights and privileges under the present Convention as would, if exercised in favor of such individual person, be prejudicial to the security of such state. Where in occupied territory an individual protected person is detained as a spy or saboteur, or as a person under definite suspicion of activity hostile to the security of the occupying power, such person shall, in those cases where absolute military security so requires, be regarded as having forfeited rights of communication under the present Convention. In each case, such persons shall nevertheless be treated with humanity, and, in case of trial, shall not be deprived of the rights of a fair and regular trial prescribed by the present Convention. They shall also be granted the full rights and privileges of a protected person under the present Convention, at the earliest date consistent with the security of the state or occupying power, as the case may be. Article 6. Beginning and End of Application The present Convention shall apply from the outset of any conflict or occupation mentioned in Article 2. In the territory of the parties to the conflict, the application of the present Convention shall cease on the general close of military operations. In the case of occupied territory, the application of the present Convention shall cease one year after the general close of military operations. However, the occupying power shall be bound for the duration of the occupation to the extent that such power exercises the functions of government in such territory by the provisions of the following articles of the present Convention, 1 to 12, 27, 29 to 34, 47, 49, 51, 52, 53, 59, 61 to 77, and 143. Protected persons whose release, repatriation, or re-establishment may take place after such dates shall meanwhile continue to benefit by the present Convention. Article 7. Special Agreements. 
In addition to the agreements expressly provided for in Articles 11, 14, 15, 17, 36, 108, 109, 132, 133, and 149, the high contracting parties may conclude other special agreements for all matters concerning which they may deem it suitable to make a separate provision. No special agreement shall adversely affect the situation of protected persons as defined by the present convention, nor to restrict the rights which it confers upon them. Protected persons shall continue to have the benefit of such agreements as long as the convention is applicable to them, except where express provisions to the contrary are contained in the aforesaid or subsequent agreements, and where more favorable measures have been taken with regard to them by one or other of the parties to the conflict. Article 8. Non-Renunciation of Rights Protected persons may in no circumstances renounce, in part or in entirety, the rights secured to them by the present convention, and by the special agreements referred to in the foregoing article, if such there be. Article 9. Protecting Powers The present convention shall be applied with the cooperation and under the scrutiny of the protecting powers, whose duty it is to safeguard the interests of the parties to the conflict. For this purpose, the protecting powers may appoint, apart from their diplomatic or consular staff, delegates from amongst their own nationals or the nationals of other neutral powers. The said delegates shall be subject to the approval of the power with which they are to carry out their duties. The parties to the conflict shall facilitate, to the greatest extent possible, the task of the representatives or delegates of the protecting powers. The representatives or delegates of the protecting powers shall not in any case exceed their mission under the present convention. They shall, in particular, take account of the imperative necessities of security of the state wherein they carry out their duties. Article 10. Activities of the International Committee of the Red Cross. The provisions of the present convention constitute no obstacle to the humanitarian activities which the International Committee of the Red Cross or any other impartial humanitarian organization may, subject to the consent of the parties to the conflict concerned, undertake for the protection of civilian persons and for their relief. Article 11. Substitutes for Protecting Powers. The high contracting parties may at any time agree to entrust to an international organization which offers all guarantees of impartiality and efficacy the duties incumbent on the protecting powers by virtue of the present convention. When persons protected by the present convention do not benefit or cease to benefit, no matter for what reason, by the activities of a protecting power or of an organization provided for in the first paragraph above, the detaining power shall request a neutral state or such an organization to undertake the functions performed under the present convention by a protecting power designated by the parties to a conflict. If protection cannot be arranged accordingly, the detaining power shall request or shall accept, subject to the provisions of this article, the offer of the services of a humanitarian organization, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, to assume the humanitarian functions performed by protecting powers under the present convention. Any neutral power or any organization invited by the power concerned, or offering itself for these purposes, shall be required to act with a sense of responsibility towards the party to the conflict on which persons protected by the present convention depend, and shall be required to furnish sufficient assurances that it is in a position to undertake the appropriate functions and to discharge them impartially. No derogation from the preceding provisions shall be made by special agreement between powers one of which is restricted, even temporarily, in its freedom to negotiate with the other power or its allies by reason of military events, more particularly where the whole or a substantial part of the territory of said power is occupied. 
Whenever in the present convention mention is made of a protecting power, such mention applies to substitute organizations in the sense of the present article. The provisions of this article shall extend and be adapted to cases of nationals of a neutral state who are in occupied territory or who find themselves in the territory of a belligerent state in which the state of which they are nationals has not normal diplomatic representation. Article 12. Conciliation Procedure. In cases where they deem it advisable in the interest of protected persons, particularly in cases of disagreement between the parties to the conflict as to the application or interpretation of the provisions of the present convention, the protecting powers shall lend their good offices with a view to settling the disagreement. For this purpose, each of the protecting powers may, either at the invitation of one party or on its own initiative, propose to the parties to the conflict a meeting of their representatives, and in particular of the authorities responsible for protected persons, possibly on neutral territory suitably chosen. The parties to the conflict shall be bound to give effect to the proposals made to them for this purpose. The protecting powers may, if necessary, propose, for approval by the parties to the conflict, a person belonging to a neutral power, or delegated by the International Committee of the Red Cross, who shall be invited to take part in such a meeting. End of Section 21 Recording by Maria Casper Section 22 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 2. General Protection of Populations Against Certain Consequences of War. Article 13. Field of Application of Part 2. The provisions of Part Two cover the whole of the populations of the countries in conflict, without any adverse distinction based in particular on race, nationality, religion, or political opinion, and are intended to alleviate the sufferings caused by war. Article 14. Hospital and Safety Zones and Localities. In time of peace, the high contracting parties and after the outbreak of hostilities, the parties thereto, may establish in their own territory, and, if the need arises in occupied areas, hospital and safety zones and localities, so organized as to protect from the effects of war wounded, sick, and aged persons, children under fifteen, expectant mothers, and mothers of children under seven. Upon the outbreak and during the course of hostilities, the parties concerned may conclude agreements on mutual recognition of the zones and localities they have created. They may for this purpose implement the provisions of the draft agreement annexed to the present convention, with such amendments as they may consider necessary. The protecting powers and the International Committee of the Red Cross are invited to lend their good offices in order to facilitate the institution and recognition of these hospital and safety zones and localities. Article 15. Neutralized Zones. Any party to the conflict may, either direct or through a neutral state or some humanitarian organization, propose to the adverse party to establish in the regions where the fighting is taking place neutralized zones intended to shelter from the effects of war the following persons, without distinction. a. Wounded and sick combatants or non-combatants. b. Civilian persons who take no part in hostilities, and who, while they reside in these zones, perform no work of a military character. When the parties concerned have agreed upon the geographical position, administration, food supply and supervision of the proposed neutralized zone, a written agreement shall be concluded and signed by the representatives of the parties to the conflict.
the agreement shall fix the beginning and the duration of the neutralization of this zone. Article 16. Wounded and Sick. 1. General Protection. The wounded and sick, as well as the infirm and expectant mothers, shall be the object of particular protection and respect. As far as military considerations allow, each party to the conflict shall facilitate the steps taken to search for the killed and wounded, to assist the shipwrecked and other persons exposed to grave danger, and to protect them against pillage and ill-treatment. Article 17. 2. Evacuation. The parties to the conflict shall endeavor to conclude local agreements for the removal of besieged or encircled areas, of wounded, sick, infirm, and aged persons, children, and maternity cases, and for the passage of ministers of all religions, medical personnel, and medical equipment on their way to such areas. Article 18. 3. Protection of Hospitals. Civilian hospitals organized to give care to the wounded and sick, the infirm and maternity cases, may in no circumstances be the object of attack, but shall at all times be respected and protected by the parties to the conflict. States which are parties to a conflict shall provide all civilian hospitals with certificates showing that they are civilian hospitals, and that the buildings which they occupy are not used for any purpose which would deprive these hospitals of protection in accordance with Article 19. Civilian hospitals shall be marked by means of the emblem provided for in Article 38 of the Geneva Convention for the Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded and Sick in Armed Forces in the Field of August 12, 1949, but only if so authorized by the State. The parties to the conflict shall, in so far as military considerations permit, take the necessary steps to make the distinctive emblems indicating civilian hospitals clearly visible to the enemy, land, air, and naval forces in order to obviate the possibility of any hostile action. In view of the dangers to which hospitals may be exposed by being close to military objectives, it is recommended that such hospitals be situated as far as possible from such objectives. Article 19. 4. Discontinuance of Protection of Hospitals The protection to which civilian hospitals are entitled shall not cease unless they are used to commit, outside their humanitarian duties, acts harmful to the enemy, Protection may, however, cease only after due warning has been given, naming in all appropriate cases a reasonable time limit, and after such warning has remained unheeded. The fact that sick or wounded members of the armed forces are nursed in these hospitals, or the presence of small arms and ammunition taken from such combatants and not yet handed over to the proper service, shall not be considered to be acts harmful to the enemy. Article 20. 5. Hospital Staff. Persons regularly and solely engaged in the operation and administration of civilian hospitals, including the personnel engaged in the search for, removal and transporting of, and caring for wounded and sick civilians, the infirm and maternity cases, shall be respected and protected. In occupied territory and in zones of military operations, the above personnel shall be recognizable by means of an identity card certifying their status, bearing the photograph of the holder and embossed with the stamp of the responsible authority, and also by means of a stamped water-resistant armlet which they shall wear on the left arm while carrying out their duties. This armlet shall be issued by the State and shall bear the emblem provided for in Article 38 of the Geneva Convention for the Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded and Sick in Armed Forces in the Field of August 12, 1949. Other personnel who are engaged in the operation and administration of civilian hospitals shall be entitled to respect and protection and to wear the armlet as provided in and under the conditions prescribed in this article while they are employed on such duties, 
the identity card shall state the duties on which they are employed. The management of each hospital shall at all times hold at the disposal of the competent national or occupying authorities an up-to-date list of such personnel. Article 21. 6. Land and Sea Transport. Convoys of vehicles or hospital trains on land or specially provided vessels on the sea conveying wounded and sick civilians, the infirm and maternity cases, shall be respected and protected in the same manner as the hospitals provided for in Article 18, and shall be marked with the consent of the State by the display of the distinctive emblem provided for in Article 38 of the Geneva Convention for the Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded and Sick in Armed Forces in the Field of August 12, 1949. Article 22. 7. Air Transport. Aircraft exclusively employed for the removal of wounded and sick civilians, the infirm and maternity cases, or for the transport of medical personnel and equipment, shall not be attacked, but shall be respected while flying at heights, times, and en routes specifically agreed upon between all the parties to the conflict concerned. They may be marked with the distinctive emblem provided for in Article 38 of the Geneva Convention for the Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded and Sick in Armed Forces in the Field of August 12, 1949. Unless agreed otherwise, flights over enemy or enemy-occupied territory are prohibited. Such aircraft shall obey every summons to land. In the event of a landing thus imposed, the aircraft with its occupants may continue its flight after examination, if any. Article 23. Consignments of Medical Supplies, Food, and Clothing Each high contracting party shall allow the free passage of all consignments of medical and hospital stores, and objects necessary for religious worship intended only for civilians of another high contracting party, even if the latter is its adversary, it shall likewise permit the free passage of all consignments of essential foodstuffs, clothing and tonics intended for children under fifteen, expectant mothers, and maternity cases. The obligation of a high contracting party to allow the free passage of the consignments indicated in the preceding paragraph is subject to the condition that this party is satisfied that there are no serious reasons for fearing a. That the consignments may be diverted from their destination, b. That the control may not be effective, or c. That a definite advantage may accrue to the military efforts or economy of the enemy through the substitution of the above-mentioned consignments for goods which would otherwise be provided or produced by the enemy, or through the release of such material, services, or facilities as would otherwise be required for the production of such goods. The power which allows the passage of the consignments indicated in the first paragraph of this article may make such permission conditional on the distribution to the persons benefited thereby being made under the local supervision of the protecting powers. Such consignments shall be forwarded as rapidly as possible and the power which permits their free passage shall have the right to prescribe the technical arrangements under which such passage is allowed. Article 24. Measures Relating to Child Welfare The parties to the conflict shall take the necessary measures to ensure that children under 15 who are orphaned or separated from their families as a result of the war are not left to their own resources, and that their maintenance, the exercise of their religion, and their education are facilitated in all circumstances. Their education shall, as far as possible, be entrusted to persons of a similar cultural tradition. The parties to the conflict shall facilitate the reception of such children in a neutral country for the duration of the conflict, with the consent of the protecting power, if any, and under due safeguards for the observance of the principles stated in the first paragraph. 
they shall furthermore endeavor to arrange for all children under twelve to be identified by the wearing of identity discs or by some other means. Article 25. Family News. All persons in the territory of a party to the conflict, or in a territory occupied by it, shall be enabled to give news of a strictly personal nature to members of their families, wherever they may be, and to receive news from them. This correspondence shall be forwarded speedily and without undue delay. If, as a result of circumstances, it becomes difficult or impossible to exchange family correspondence by the ordinary post, the parties to the conflict concerned shall apply to a neutral intermediary, such as the central agency provided for in Article 140, and shall decide in consultation with it how to ensure the fulfillment of their obligation under the best possible conditions, in particular with the cooperation of the National Red Cross, Red Crescent, Red Lion and Sun Societies. If the parties to the conflict deem it necessary to restrict family correspondence, such restriction shall be confined to the compulsory use of standard forms containing twenty-five freely chosen words, and to the limitation of the number of these forms dispatched to one each month. Article 26. Dispersed Families. Each party to the conflict shall facilitate inquiries made by members of families dispersed owing to the war, with the object of renewing contact with one another, and of meeting if possible. It shall encourage, in particular, the work of organizations engaged in this task, provided they are acceptable to it and conform to its security regulations. End of section 22. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 23 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 3. STATUS AND TREATMENT OF PROTECTED PERSONS, SECTIONS 1 AND 2 PART 3. STATUS AND TREATMENT OF PROTECTED PERSONS SECTION 1. PROVISIONS COMMON TO THE TERRITORIES OF THE PARTIES TO THE CONFLICT AND TO OCCUPIED TERRITORIES ARTICLE 27. TREATMENT. 1. GENERAL OBSERVATIONS Protected persons are entitled in all circumstances to respect for their persons, their honor, their family rights, their religious convictions and practices, and their manners and customs. They shall at all times be humanely treated, and shall be protected especially against all acts of violence or threats thereof, and against insults and public curiosity. Women shall be especially protected against any attack on their honor, in particular against rape, enforced prostitution, or any form of indecent assault. Without prejudice to the provisions relating to their state of health, age, and sex, all persons shall be treated with the same consideration by the party to the conflict in whose power they are, without any adverse distinction based in particular on race, religion, or political opinion. However, the parties to the conflict may take such measures of control and security in regard to protected persons as may be necessary as a result of the war. Article 28. 2. Danger Zones. The presence of a protected person may not be used to render certain points or areas immune from military operations. Article 29. 3. Responsibilities. The party to the conflict, in whose hands protected persons may be, is responsible for the treatment accorded to them by its agents, irrespective of any individual responsibility which may be incurred. Article 30. Application to Protecting Powers and Relief Organizations. Protected persons shall have every facility for making application to the protecting powers, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the National Red Cross, Red Crescent, Red Lion and Sun Society of the country where they may be, as well as to any organization that might assist them. 
these several organizations shall be granted all facilities for that purpose by the authorities within the bounds set by the military or security considerations apart from the visits of the delegates of the protecting powers and of the international committee of the red cross provided for in article one forty three the detaining or occupying powers shall facilitate as much as possible visits to protected persons by the representatives of other organizations whose object is to give spiritual aid or material relief to such persons article thirty one prohibition of coercion no physical or moral coercion shall be exercised against protected persons in particular to obtain information from them or from third parties article thirty two prohibition of corporal punishment torture etc the high contracting parties specifically agree that each of them is prohibited from taking any measure of such a character as to cause the physical suffering or extermination of protected persons in their hands this prohibition applies not only to murder torture corporal punishment mutilation and medical or scientific experiments not necessitated by the medical treatment of a protected person but also to any other measures of brutality whether applied by civilian or military agents article thirty three individual responsibility collective penalties pillage reprisals no protected person may be punished for an offence that he or she has not personally committed collective penalties and likewise all measures of intimidation or of terrorism are prohibited pillage is prohibited reprisals against protected persons and their property are prohibited article thirty four hostages the taking of hostages is prohibited section two aliens in the territory of a party to the conflict article thirty five right to leave the territory all protected persons who may desire to leave the territory at the outset of or during a conflict shall be entitled to do so unless their departure is contrary to the national interests of the state the applications of such persons to leave shall be decided in accordance with regularly established procedures and the decision shall be taken as rapidly as possible those persons permitted to leave may provide themselves with the necessary funds for the journey and may take with them a reasonable amount of their effects and articles of personal use if any such person is refused permission to leave the territory he shall be entitled to have such refusal reconsidered as soon as possible by an appropriate court or administrative board designated by the detaining power for that purpose upon request representatives of the protecting power shall unless reasons of security prevent it or the persons concerned object be furnished with the reasons for the refusal of any request for permission to leave the territory and be given as expeditiously as possible the names of all persons who have been denied permission to leave article thirty six method of repatriation departures permitted under the foregoing article shall be carried out in satisfactory conditions as regards safety hygiene sanitation and food all costs in connection therewith from the point of exit in the territory of the detaining power shall be borne by the country of destination or in the case of accommodation in a neutral country by the power whose nationals are benefited the practical details of such movements may if necessary be settled by special agreements between the powers concerned the foregoing shall not prejudice any such special arrangements as may be concluded between parties to the conflict concerning the exchange and repatriation of their nationals in enemy hands article thirty seven persons in confinement protected persons who are confined pending proceedings or serving a sentence involving loss of liberty shall during their confinement be humanely treated as soon as they are released they may ask to leave the territory in conformity with the foregoing articles article thirty eight 
Non-Repatriated Persons 1. General Observations With the exception of special measures authorized by the present Convention, in particular by Articles 27 and 41 thereof, the situation of protected persons shall continue to be regulated, in principle, by the provisions concerning aliens in time of peace. In any case, the following rights shall be granted to them. 1. They shall be enabled to receive the individual or collective relief that may be sent to them. 2. They shall, if their state of health so requires, receive medical attention and hospital treatment, to the same extent as the nationals of the state concerned. 3. They shall be allowed to practice their religion and to receive spiritual assistance from ministers of their faith. 4. If they reside in an area particularly exposed to the dangers of war, they shall be authorized to move from that area, to the same extent as the nationals of the state concerned. 5. Children under 15 years, pregnant women, and mothers of children under 7 years shall benefit by any preferential treatment to the same extent as the nationals of the state concerned. Article 39. 2. Means of Existence. Protected persons who, as a result of the war, have lost their gainful employment, shall be granted the opportunity to find paid employment. That opportunity shall, subject to security considerations and to the provisions of Article 40, be equal to that enjoyed by the nationals of the power in whose territory they are. Where a party to the conflict applies to a protected person methods of control which result in his being unable to support himself, and especially if such a person is prevented for reasons of security, from finding paid employment on reasonable conditions, the said party shall ensure his support and that of his dependents. Protected persons may in any case receive allowances from their home country, the protecting power, or the relief societies referred to in Article 30. Article 40. 3. Employment. Protected persons may be compelled to work only to the same extent as nationals of the party to the conflict in whose territory they are. If protected persons are of the enemy nationality, they may only be compelled to do work which is normally necessary to ensure the feeding, sheltering, clothing, transport, and health of human beings, and which is not directly related to the conduct of military operations. In the cases mentioned in the two preceding paragraphs, protected persons who are compelled to work shall have the benefit of the same working conditions and the same safeguards as national workers, in particular as regards wages, hours of labor, clothing and equipment, previous training and compensation for occupational accidents and diseases. If the above provisions are infringed, Protected persons shall be allowed to exercise their right of complaint in accordance with Article 30. Article 41. 4. Assigned Residence. Internment. Should the power in whose hands protected persons may be consider the measures of control mentioned in the present Convention to be inadequate, it may not have recourse to any other measure of control more severe than that of an assigned residence or internment in accordance with the provisions of Articles 42 and 43. In applying the provisions of Article 39, second paragraph, to the cases of persons required to leave their usual place of residence by virtue of a decision placing them in assigned residence elsewhere, the detaining power shall be guided as closely as possible by the standards of welfare set forth in Part 3, Section 4 of this Convention. Article 42. 5. Grounds for internment or assigned residence, voluntary internment. The internment or placing in assigned residence of protected persons may be ordered only if the security of the detaining power makes it absolutely necessary. If any person, acting through the representatives of the protecting power, voluntarily demands internment, 
and if his situation renders this step necessary, he shall be interned by the power in whose hands he may be. Article 43. 6. Procedure. Any protected person who has been interned or placed in assigned residence shall be entitled to have such action reconsidered as soon as possible by an appropriate court or administrative board designated by the detaining power for that purpose. If the internment or placing in assigned residence is maintained, the court or administrative board shall periodically, at least twice yearly, give consideration to his or her case, with a view to the favorable amendment of the initial decision if circumstances permit. Unless the protected persons concerned object, the detaining power shall, as rapidly as possible, give the protecting power the names of any protected persons who have been interned or subjected to assigned residence, or who have been released from internment or assigned residence. The decisions of the courts or boards mentioned in the first paragraph of the present article shall also, subject to the same conditions, be notified as rapidly as possible to the protecting power. Article 44. 7. Refugees. In applying the measures of control mentioned in the present convention, the detaining power shall not treat as enemy aliens exclusively on the basis of their nationality de jure of an enemy state, refugees who do not, in fact, enjoy the protection of any government. Article 45. 8. Transfer to another power. Protected persons shall not be transferred to a power which is not a party to this convention. This provision shall in no way constitute an obstacle to the repatriation of protected persons or to their return to their country of residence after the cessation of hostilities. Protected persons may be transferred by the detaining power only to a power which is a party to the present convention, and after the detaining power has satisfied itself of the willingness and ability of such transferee power to apply the present convention. If protected persons are transferred under such circumstances, responsibility for the application of the present convention rests on the power accepting them while they are in its custody. Nevertheless, if that power fails to carry out the provisions of the present convention in any important respect, the power by which the protected persons were transferred shall, upon being so notified by the protecting power, take effective measures to correct the situation, or shall request the return of the protected persons. Such a request must be complied with. In no circumstances shall a protected person be transferred to a country where he or she may have reason to fear persecution for his or her political opinions or religious beliefs. The provisions of this article do not constitute an obstacle to the extradition in pursuance of extradition treaties concluded before the outbreak of hostilities of protected persons accused of offenses against ordinary criminal law. Article 46. Cancellation of Restrictive Measures Insofar as they have not been previously withdrawn, restrictive measures taken regarding protected persons shall be cancelled as soon as possible after the close of hostilities. Restrictive measures affecting their property shall be cancelled in accordance with the law of the detaining power as soon as possible after the close of hostilities. End of section 23. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 24 of Geneva Conventions, August 1949. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 3. Status and Treatment of Protected Persons. Section 3. Occupied Territories. Article 47. Inviolability of Rights. Protected persons who are in occupied territory shall not be deprived in any case or in any manner whatsoever of the benefits of the present convention 
by any change introduced as the result of the occupation of a territory into the institutions or government of the said territory nor by any agreement concluded between the authorities of the occupied territories and the occupying power nor by any annexation by the latter of the whole or part of the occupied territory article forty eight special cases of repatriation protected persons who are not nationals of the power whose territory is occupied may avail themselves of the right to leave the territory subject to the provisions of article thirty five and decisions thereon shall be taken according to the procedure which the occupying power shall establish in accordance with said article article forty nine deportations transfers evacuations individual or mass forcible transfers as well as deportations of protected persons from occupied territory to the territory of the occupying power or to that of any other country occupied or not are prohibited regardless of their motive nevertheless the occupying power may undertake total or partial evacuation of a given area if the security of the population or imperative military reasons so demand such evacuations may not involve the displacement of protected persons outside the bounds of the occupied territory except when for material reasons it is impossible to avoid such displacement persons thus evacuated shall be transferred back to their homes as soon as hostilities in the area in question have ceased the occupying power undertaking such transfers or evacuations shall ensure to the greatest practicable extent that proper accommodation is provided to receive the protected persons that the removals are effected in satisfactory conditions of hygiene health safety and nutrition and that members of the same family are not separated the protecting power shall be informed of any transfers and evacuations as soon as they have taken place the occupying power shall not detain protected persons in an area particularly exposed to the dangers of war unless the security of the population or imperative military reasons so demand the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies article fifty children the occupying power shall with the cooperation of the national and local authorities facilitate the proper working of all institutions devoted to the care and education of children the occupying power shall take all necessary steps to facilitate the identification of children and the registration of their parentage it may not in any case change their personal status nor enlist them in formations or organizations subordinate to it should the local institutions be inadequate for the purpose the occupying power shall make arrangements for the maintenance and education if possible by persons of their own nationality language and religion of children who are orphaned or separated from their parents as a result of the war and who cannot adequately be cared for by a near relative or friend a special section of the bureau set up in accordance with article one thirty six shall be responsible for taking all necessary steps to identify children whose identity is in doubt particulars of their parents or other near relatives should always be recorded if available the occupying power shall not hinder the application of any preferential measures in regard to food medical care and protection against the effects of war which may have been adopted prior to the occupation in favor of children under fifteen years expectant mothers and mothers of children under seven years article fifty one enlistment labor the occupying power may not compel protected persons to serve in its armed or auxiliary forces no pressure or propaganda which aims at securing voluntary enlistment is permitted the occupying power may not compel protected persons to work unless they are over eighteen years of age and then only on work which is necessary either for the needs of the army of occupation or for the public utility services 
or for the feeding, sheltering, clothing, transportation, or health of the population of the occupied country. Protected persons may not be compelled to undertake any work which would involve them in the obligation of taking part in military operations. The occupying power may not compel protected persons to employ forcible means to ensure the security of the installations where they are performing their compulsory labor. The work shall be carried out only in the occupied territory where the persons whose services have been requisitioned are. Every such person shall, so far as possible, be kept in his usual place of employment. Workers shall be paid a fair wage, and the work shall be proportionate to their physical and intellectual capacities. The legislation in force in the occupied country concerning working conditions and safeguards, as regards in particular such matters as wages, hours of work, equipment, preliminary training, and compensation for occupational accidents and diseases, shall be applicable to the protected persons assigned to the work referred to in this article. In no case shall requisition of labor lead to a mobilization of workers in an organization of a military or semi-military character. Article 52. Protection of Workers. No contract, agreement, or regulation shall impair the right of any worker, whether voluntary or not, and wherever he may be, to apply to the representatives of the protecting power in order to request the said power's intervention. All measures aiming at creating unemployment or at restricting the opportunities offered to workers in an occupied territory in order to induce them to work for the occupying power are prohibited. Article 53. Prohibited Destruction. Any destruction by the occupying power of real or personal property belonging individually or collectively to private persons, or to the state, or to other public authorities, or to social and cooperative organizations is prohibited, except where such destruction is rendered absolutely necessary by military operations. Article 54. Judges and Public Officials. The occupying power may not alter the status of public officials or judges in the occupied territories, nor in any way apply sanctions or take any measures of coercion or discrimination against them, should they abstain from fulfilling their functions for reasons of conscience. This prohibition does not prejudice the application of the second paragraph of Article 51, it does not affect the right of the occupying power to remove public officials from their posts. Article 55. Food and Medical Supplies for the Population To the extent of the means available to it, the occupying power has the duty of ensuring the food and medical supplies of the population. It should, in particular, bring in the necessary foodstuffs, medical stores, and other articles if the resources of the occupied territory are inadequate. The occupying power may not requisition foodstuffs, articles, or medical supplies available in the occupied territory, except for use by the occupation forces and administration personnel, and then only if the requirements of the civilian population have been taken into account. Subject to the provisions of other international conventions, the occupying power shall make arrangements to ensure that fair value is paid for any requisitioned goods. The protecting power shall at any time be at liberty to verify the state of the food and medical supplies in occupied territories, except where temporary restrictions are made necessary by imperative military requirements. Article 56. Hygiene and Public Health. To the fullest extent of the means available to it, the occupying power has the duty of ensuring and maintaining, with the cooperation of national and local authorities, the medical and hospital establishments and services, public health and hygiene in the occupied territory, with particular reference to the adoption and application of the prophylactic and preventive measures necessary to combat the spread of contagious diseases and epidemics. Medical personnel of all categories shall be allowed to carry out their duties. 
if new hospitals are set up in occupied territory, and if the competent organs of the occupied state are not operating there, the occupying authorities shall, if necessary, grant them the recognition provided for in Article 18. In similar circumstances, the occupying authorities shall also grant recognition to hospital personnel and transport vehicles under the provisions of Articles 20 and 21. In adopting measures of health and hygiene and in their implementation, the occupying power shall take into consideration the moral and ethical susceptibilities of the population of the occupied territory. Article 57. Requisition of Hospitals. The occupying power may requisition civilian hospitals only temporarily and only in cases of urgent necessity for the care of military wounded and sick, and then on condition that suitable arrangements are made in due time for the care and treatment of the patients and for the needs of the civilian population for hospital accommodation. The material and stores of civilian hospitals cannot be requisitioned so long as they are necessary for the needs of the civilian population. Article 58. Spiritual Assistance. The occupying power shall permit ministers of religion to give spiritual assistance to the members of their religious communities. The occupying power shall also accept consignments of books and articles required for religious needs, and shall facilitate their distribution in occupied territory. Article 59. Relief. 1. Collective Relief. If the whole or part of the population of an occupied territory is inadequately supplied, the occupying power shall agree to relief schemes on behalf of the said population, and shall facilitate them by all the means at its disposal. Such schemes, which may be undertaken either by states or by impartial humanitarian organizations, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, shall consist in particular of the provision of consignments of foodstuffs, medical supplies, and clothing. All contracting parties shall permit the free passage of these consignments and shall guarantee their protection. A power granting free passage to consignments on their way to territory occupied by an adverse party to the conflict shall, however, have the right to search the consignments to regulate their passage according to prescribed times and routes, and to be reasonably satisfied through the protecting power that these consignments are to be used for the relief of the needy population, and are not to be used for the benefit of the occupying power. Article 60. 2. Responsibilities of the Occupying Power. Relief consignments shall in no way relieve the occupying power of any of its responsibilities under Articles 55, 56, and 59. The occupying power shall in no way whatsoever divert relief consignments from the purpose for which they are intended, except in cases of urgent necessity, in the interests of the population of the occupied territory, and with the consent of the protecting power. Article 61. 3. Distribution. The distribution of the relief consignments referred to in the foregoing articles shall be carried out with the cooperation and under the supervision of the protecting power. This duty may also be delegated, by agreement between the occupying power and the protecting power, to a neutral power, to the International Committee of the Red Cross, or to any other impartial humanitarian body. Such consignments shall be exempt in occupied territory from all charges, taxes, or customs duties, unless these are necessary in the interests of the economy of the territory. The occupying power shall facilitate the rapid distribution of these consignments. All contracting parties shall endeavor to permit the transit and transport, free of charge, of such relief consignments on their way to occupied territories. Article 62. 4. Individual Relief. Subject to imperative reasons of security, protected persons in occupied territories shall be permitted to receive the individual relief consignments sent to them. Article 63. 
National Red Cross, and other relief societies. Subject to temporary and exceptional measures imposed for urgent reasons of security by the occupying power, a. Recognized National Red Cross, Red Crescent, Red Lion and Sun societies shall be able to pursue their activities in accordance with Red Cross principles, as defined by the International Red Cross Conferences. Other relief societies shall be permitted to continue their humanitarian activities under similar conditions. b. The occupying power may not require any changes in the personnel or structure of these societies which would prejudice the aforesaid activities. The same principles shall apply to the activities and personnel of special organizations of a non-military character which already exist or which may be established for the purpose of ensuring the living conditions of the civilian population by the maintenance of the essential public utility services, by the distribution of relief, and by the organization of rescues. Article 64. Penal Legislation. 1. General Observations. The penal laws of the occupied territory shall remain in force, with the exception that they may be repealed or suspended by the occupying power, in cases where they constitute a threat to its security or an obstacle to the application of the present convention. Subject to the latter consideration, and to the necessity for ensuring the effective administration of justice, the tribunals of the occupied territory shall continue to function in respect of all offenses covered by the said laws. The occupying power may, however, subject the population of the occupied territory to provisions which are essential to enable the occupying power to fulfill its obligations under the present convention, to maintain the orderly government of the territory, and to ensure the security of the occupying power, of the members and property of the occupying forces or administration, and likewise of the establishments and lines of communication used by them. Article 65. 2. Publication. The penal provisions enacted by the occupying power shall not come into force before they have been published and brought to the knowledge of the inhabitants in their own language. The effect of these penal provisions shall not be retroactive. Article 66. 3. Competent Courts. In case of a breach of the penal provisions promulgated by it, by virtue of the second paragraph of Article 64, the occupying power may hand over the accused to its properly constituted non-political military courts on condition that said courts sit in the occupied country. Courts of appeal shall preferably sit in the occupied country. Article 67. 4. Applicable Provisions. The courts shall apply only those provisions of law which were applicable prior to the offense, and which are in accordance with general principles of law, in particular the principle that the penalty shall be proportionate to the offense. They shall take into consideration the fact that the accused is not a national of the occupying power. Article 68. 5. Penalties. Death Penalty. Protected persons who commit an offense which is solely intended to harm the occupying power, but which does not constitute an attempt on the life or limb of members of the occupying forces or administration, nor a grave collective danger, nor seriously damage the property of the occupying forces or administration or the installations used by them, shall be liable to internment or simple imprisonment, provided the duration of such internment or imprisonment is proportionate to the offense committed. Furthermore, internment or imprisonment shall for such offenses be the only measure adopted for depriving protected persons of liberty. The courts provided for under Article 66 of the present Convention may at their discretion convert a sentence of imprisonment to one of internment for the same period. The penal provisions promulgated by the occupying power in accordance with Articles 64 and 65 may impose the death penalty on a protected person 
only in cases where that person is guilty of espionage, of serious acts of sabotage against the military installations of the occupying power, or of intentional offenses which have caused the death of one or more persons, provided that such offenses were punishable by death under the law of the occupied territory in force before the occupation began. The death penalty may not be pronounced against a protected person unless the attention of the court has been particularly called to the fact that since the accused is not a national of the occupying power, he is not bound to it by any duty of allegiance. In any case, the death penalty may not be pronounced against a protected person who was under 18 years of age at the time of the offense. Article 69. 6. Deduction from sentence of period spent under arrest. In all cases, the duration of the period during which a protected person accused of an offense is under arrest awaiting trial or punishment shall be deducted from any period of imprisonment awarded. Article 70. 7. Offenses committed before occupation. Protected persons shall not be arrested, prosecuted, or convicted by the occupying power for acts committed or for opinions expressed before the occupation or during a temporary interruption thereof, with the exception of breaches of the laws and customs of war. Nationals of the occupying power, who before the outbreak of hostilities have sought refuge in the territory of the occupied state, shall not be arrested, prosecuted, convicted, or deported from the occupied territory, except for offenses committed after the outbreak of hostilities, or for offenses under common law committed before the outbreak of hostilities, which, according to the law of the occupied state, would have justified extradition in time of peace. Article 71. Penal Procedure. 1. General Observations. No sentence shall be pronounced by the competent courts of the occupying power except after a regular trial. Accused persons who are prosecuted by the occupying power shall be promptly informed in writing, in a language which they understand, of the particulars of the charges preferred against them, and shall be brought to trial as rapidly as possible. The protecting power shall be informed of all proceedings instituted by the occupying power against protected persons in respect of charges involving the death penalty or imprisonment for two years or more. It shall be enabled at any time to obtain information regarding the state of such proceedings. Furthermore, the protecting power shall be entitled, on request, to be furnished with all the particulars of these and of any other proceedings instituted by the occupying power against protected persons. The notification to the protecting power, as provided for in the second paragraph above, shall be sent immediately, and shall in any case reach the protecting power three weeks before the date of the first hearing, unless at the opening of the trial evidence is submitted that the provisions of this article are fully complied with, the trial shall not proceed. The notification shall include the following particulars. A. Description of the accused. B. Place of residence or detention. C. Specification of the charge or charges, with mention of the penal provisions under which it is brought. D. Designation of the court which will hear the case. E. Place and date of the first hearing. Article 72. 2. Right of Defense. Accused persons shall have the right to present evidence necessary to their defense, and may, in particular, call witnesses. They shall have the right to be assisted by a qualified advocate or counsel of their own choice who shall be able to visit them freely and shall enjoy the necessary facilities for preparing their defense. Failing a choice by the accused, the protecting power may provide him with an advocate or counsel. When an accused person has to meet a serious charge and the protecting power is not functioning, the occupying power, subject to the consent of the accused, shall provide an advocate or counsel. 
accused persons shall unless they freely waive such assistance be aided by an interpreter both during preliminary investigation and during the hearing in court they shall have the right at any time to object to the interpreter and to ask for his replacement article seventy three three right of appeal a convicted person shall have the right of appeal provided for by the laws applied by the court he shall be fully informed of his right to appeal or petition and of the time limit within which he may do so the penal procedure provided in the present section shall apply as far as it is applicable to appeals where the laws applied by the court make no provision for appeals the convicted person shall have the right to petition against the finding and sentence to the competent authority of the occupying power article seventy four four assistance by the protecting power representatives of the protecting power shall have the right to attend the trial of any protected person unless the hearing has as an exceptional measure to be held in camera in the interests of the security of the occupying power which shall then notify the protecting power a notification in respect of the date and place of trial shall be sent to the protecting power any judgment involving a sentence of death or imprisonment for two years or more shall be communicated with the relevant grounds as rapidly as possible to the protecting power the notification shall contain a reference to the notification made under article seventy one and in the case of sentences of imprisonment the name of the place where the sentence is to be served a record of judgments other than those referred to above shall be kept by the court and shall be open to inspection by the representatives of the protecting power any period allowed for appeal in the case of sentences involving the death penalty or imprisonment of two years or more shall not run until notification of judgment has been received by the protecting power article seventy five five death sentence in no case shall persons condemned to death be deprived of the right of petition for pardon or reprieve no death sentence shall be carried out before the expiration of a period of at least six months from the date of receipt by the protecting power of the notification of final judgment confirming such death sentence or of an order denying pardon or reprieve the six months period of suspension of the death sentence herein prescribed may be reduced in individual cases in circumstances of grave emergency involving an organized threat to the security of the occupying power or its forces provided always that the protecting power is notified of such a reduction and is given reasonable time and opportunity to make representations to the competent occupying authorities in respect of such death sentences article seventy six treatment of detainees protected persons accused of offenses shall be detained in the occupied country and if convicted they shall serve their sentences therein they shall if possible be separated from other detainees and shall enjoy conditions of food and hygiene which will be sufficient to keep them in good health and which will be at least equal to those obtaining in prisons in the occupied country they shall receive the medical attention required by their state of health they shall also have the right to receive any spiritual assistance which they may require women shall be confined in separate quarters and shall be under the direct supervision of women proper regard shall be paid to the special treatment due to minors protected persons who are detained shall have the right to be visited by delegates of the protecting power and of the international committee of the red cross in accordance with the provisions of article one forty three such persons shall have the right to receive at least one relief parcel monthly article seventy seven handing over of detainees at the close of occupation protected persons who have been accused of offences or convicted by the courts in occupied territory shall be handed over at the close of occupation with the relevant records to the authorities of the liberated territory article seventy eight security measures 
internment and assigned residence, right of appeal. If the occupying power considers it necessary for imperative reasons of security to take safety measures concerning protected persons, it may at the most subject them to assigned residence or to internment. Decisions regarding such assigned residence or internment shall be made according to a regular procedure prescribed by the occupying power in accordance with the provisions of the present convention. This procedure shall include the right of appeal for the parties concerned. Appeals shall be decided with the least possible delay. In the event of the decision being upheld, it shall be subject to periodical review, if possible every six months, by a competent body set up by said power. Protected persons made subject to assigned residence, and thus required to leave their homes, shall enjoy the full benefit of Article 39 of the present Convention. End of Section 24 Recording by Maria Casper